Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'd like to make a statement to the chamber. Senators, by letter dated the 7th of May 2021, Senators Gallagher and Patrick have raised a matter of privilege alleging interference with the Economics Reference Committee inquiry into Australia's sovereign naval shipbuilding capability. The letter outlines numerous occasions on which the Department of Defence, the Secretary of Defence and the former Minister for Defence have declined or refused to provide documents to the committee in response to committee requests and Senate orders. Senators Gallagher and Patrick contend that, and I quote, the committee's ability to progress the inquiry has been severely and deliberately impeded by the department. The letter raises three grounds on which the conduct complained of may amount to an improper interference with the functions of the Senate and should be investigated as a possible contempt. They are improper interference with the free exercise by the committee of its authority or functions, contrary to Privi Pri Privilege Resolution 6, subparagraph 1, disobedience of a lawful order of the Senate, contrary to Resolution 6, subparagraph 8, and, re and refusal or failure to provide documents in accordance with an order of the Senate, contrary to Resolution 6, subparagraph 13. Where a matter of privilege is raised, my role is to consider whether a motion to refer the matter to the Privileges Committee should have precedence in debate. In doing so, I am constrained from considering the merits of the matter. Instead, I am bound to have regard only to the two criteria in Privilege Resolution 4. The first of these criteria seeks to reserve the Senate's contempt powers for matters involving substantial obstruction to Senate and committee processes or to the performance of Senators' duties as Senators. It is clear that the conduct of the kind claimed in the letter could substantially obstruct the References Committee in its inquiry and frustrate the orders of the Senate requiring the production of the documents to the committee. In that sense, the criterion is met. Whether that conduct as outlined warrants investigation as a possible contempt is not a question for me, but for the Senate. One matter for senators to note in making that assessment is that in disputes about the production of documents, the Senate has generally referred, preferred political or procedural remedies, such as censure motions or debating explanations for non-compliance, rather than seeking to enforce its orders through its contempt jurisdiction. Nevertheless, Hodges' Australian Senate practice makes it clear that, and I quote, the principal remedy which the Senate may seek against an executive refusal to provide information or documents in response to a requirement of the Senate or a committee is to use its power to impose a penalty of imprisonment or a fine for contempt in accordance with the Parliamentary Privileges Act. The passage goes on to note, however, practic and I quote again, practical difficulties involved in the use of the contempt power particularly the probable inability of the Senate to punish a minister who is a member of the House of Representatives and the unfairness of imposing a penalty on a public servant who acts on the directions of a minister. I specifically highlight this latter issue and raise this caution about the treatment of public servants because Senators Gallagher and Patrick seek to steer any possible contempt investigation to consider the role of the Secretary of the Department. The second criterion, regard for the existence of any other remedy, recognises that the Senate is generally reluctant to deal with contempt, with conduct as a contempt, where another, more appropriate avenue for redress is available. Only the Senate can remedy interference in the proceedings of its committees or conduct frustrating its own orders. So in my view, this criterion is also met. 
whether that remedy should take the form of a Privileges Committee inquiry or some other form, if any, is a matter for the Senate itself. I table the correspondence and call Senator Patrick to give a notice of motion in respect of the matter. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, uh, I'm going to reserve my right to, to, move the, uh, to uh, lodge the motion. I do, wish to, uh, do seek leave to make a, a short statement of no more than three minutes. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I thank the Senate and I thank, uh, the, uh, I thank you, Mr President. I'll just go very briefly to the circumstances. In September 2019, the Senate referred an inquiry to the Economics Committee, an inquiry into Australia's sovereign naval shipbuilding capability. In February 2020, uh, the Committee requested assistance from Defence, looking for documents uh, describing what Naval Group, BAE, Austal and Lurson were offering to Australian industry in relation to their bids uh, for uh, work in the Naval Shipbuilding Program. Uh, the committee wanted, wants to compare what was promised by the various different entities uh, and what was actually contracted by Defence. Uh, the committee has agreed to accept those documents in confidence. Uh, the, the Department of Defence refused to provide uh, the documents outright. <coughs> Excuse me. In May last year, the, uh, the Senate agreed to an order for production for those documents. The minister um, uh, sought a, a PII, a public interest immunity claim, but the Senate refused that, that claim. Now, I'll go to, very quickly to the issue raised by the president in relation to the Secretary of Defence. Um, uh, a, an order for production, for production of documents has the same standing as a subpoena from a court, and maybe the Privileges Committee needs to consider whether or not it is appropriate, uh, uh, whether or not it would be appropriate for a minister to refuse a, an official to grant a, uh, to respond to a subpoena from a court. And I refer to the High Court case of um, Peary and McFarlane uh, in 1925 where Chief Justice Knox made it very clear that the law of the Commonwealth requires soldiers and presumably officials to obey not any command but any lawful command. Uh, the Senate has the final say on this and I, uh, with indulgence, I'll, I'll just read a short uh, statement from, uh, from Erskine May. <clears throat> the crown of these realms is hereditary, being subject, however, to special limitations by Parliament and the King or Queen has ever enjoyed various prerogatives by prescription, custom and law, which, ass which assigns to the sovereign the chief place in parliament and the sole executive power. But as a collective, parliament is the supreme leg legislature. The, the right and succession and the prerogatives of the Crown itself are subject to limitations and change by consent on authority of the, so of the sovereign and the three estates of the realm in parliament assembled. To the changes that have been effected at different times in the legal succession to the Crown, it is needless to, to refer, as the Revolution of 1688 is a sufficient example. The power of the Parliament over the Crown is distinctly affirmed by statute law and recognised as an important principle of the Constitution. Uh, that is given effect through section 49 of our Constitution. Uh, the, the, the Senate is supreme in this, in this matter. It's an important matter. We need to be able to get on with our work. Thank you. I'll call the clerk to call on business. Government business order of the day number one, appropriation bills numbers three and four of 2020 to 21, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Deputy President. I rise to speak on appropriations bills three and four, bills which fund some of the business of government. Now, this isn't about last night's budget. We're in fact talking about bills uh, that are from last year's budget. Uh, so I want to address particularly one element of that, which is the JobKeeper scheme. JobKeeper was meant to be a wage subsidy, and the government was, of course, initially very reluctant to introduce such a scheme. And it wasn't until queues formed around the block of Centrelink offices around the country as the nation went into lockdown that the government finally ceded to calls from unions, from employers, from the Greens, from Labor uh, to get serious about saving jobs. Within a week, JobKeeper was announced, but it was flawed. The major flaw was that there were no conditions placed on its payment to companies that were, in fact, profitable. 
even if their turnover had reduced such that they were still eligible for the scheme. And neither were any conditions placed on its payment to companies that went on to pay bonuses to executives. The parliament did flag those issues at the time, but the government didn't heed the concerns raised. Uh, in effect, it took advantage of the Team Australia moment and the goodwill of Parliament in wanting to help protect millions of Australian jobs. And the government allowed big business to make a profit off the back of a publicly funded wage subsidy. Once again, they delivered for their big corporate mates and mining billionaires. Costings undertaken by the Parliamentary Budget Office show that 65 of Australia's largest companies, which were profitable during the pandemic, received $1.2 billion in JobKeeper while they recorded profits. Indeed, of the companies receiving JobKeeper, at least 25 of them paid executive bonuses worth a combined total of $24.3 million, and 60 companies recorded profits over $8.6 billion in the past 18 months. Big businesses uh, such as Harvey Norman have refused to repay a single dollar of the $20 million in JobKeeper payments that they received, despite doubling their profits during the pandemic and paying executive bonuses. The founder of Harvey Norman, Mr Jerry Harvey, said that the JobKeeper payments that they received were, quote, a tiny amount of money, end quote. This is astonishing when you consider that during the pandemic the number of people on income support increased by 100 per cent to over 1.6 million Australians, who I'm sure would not consider millions of dollars to be a tiny amount of money. JobKeeper became profit maker and bonus payer. Australia's biggest stimulus package turned into one of Australia's biggest corporate rorts billions of dollars of public money that was meant to ensure the wages of people whose jobs were at risk has instead been used to boost the profits of some of the biggest corporations and boost the wages of their executives. This is obscene, but it can be fixed. The second reading amendment on sheet uh, 1279, standing in Senator McKim's name, which I now move, calls on the government to require companies with an annual turnover of more than 50 million that received JobKeeper and also made a profit or paid executive bonuses repay the JobKeeper payments that they received up to the amount uh, of the profits they made and the executive bonuses that they paid. So don't profiteer off JobKeeper. Um, for those big companies and those executive bonuses. It's pretty simple, really. Um, those companies got more than they needed, and they should return it. If anyone might be wringing their hands about the effect this might have on corporate Australia, perhaps those on the government side uh, of the chamber, just uh, two days ago the ASX 200 reached a record new high, eclipsing where it was before the pandemic hit. So corporate Australia is doing just fine. And frankly, they're doing even better after last night's budget, where we saw in the coming financial year there will be $62 billion of public money in handouts to big corporates and mining billionaires. So the very least that they could do is repay those amounts of JobKeeper that they didn't need, that they turned into corporate profits and then paid out as executive bonuses. So these companies can well afford to return that which they should never have been given in the first place. Now, I want to contrast this with the approach that the Australian Tax Office is taking in trying to recover JobKeeper payments from migrant workers. There was an article up on the ABC yesterday that explained the situation of Hassan uh, Jaber, who was living in Australia on a temporary protection visa while the pandemic hit. He was driving an Uber to make ends meet. He was asked to pay back almost $30,000 that he'd received in JobKeeper payments. Now, he'd gone to his tax agent, he'd sought advice on whether he was eligible to receive JobKeeper. They had phoned the tax office and spent reportedly 35 minutes on the phone to the ATO, who advised him, look, submit the application and if you're eligible, we'll pay you. If you're not, we won't. He then received payment and so naturally assumed that he was entitled to receive that payment. And yet, uh, nine months later, he got a bill for $27,900 to be repaid by him. Now, 
Of course, at the time, the Greens were moving to make sure that uh, JobKeeper was, made, uh, was provided to so many more cohorts of people than this government ended up providing it to. There were so many people left out of JobKeeper as it was—short-term casuals, migrant workers, those on um, uh, temporary protection visas and other visas. So, um, by some miracle, this fellow um, was, uh, was ended up receiving the payment thanks to the error of the tax office. And then nine months later, the tax office uh, sought to recoup that money for him. Can you imagine the shock in a pandemic where you have no other support, getting a letter saying, oops, we paid you 30 grand that you weren't entitled to, now pay it back. Now, the poor man sought um, advice again from his, uh, from his tax person. They lodged several objections and ultimately, ultimately he did get justice and the ATO recognised that, in fact, it was their mistake. Um, and so they would just have to, to suck it up. But it's very interesting to contrast the approach of um, agencies going after individuals for receiving JobKeeper when what we see is massive profiteering by big corporates um, and payment of executive bonuses uh, in, a, in a pandemic where so many other people were tightening their belts. And the government's like, no, nah, we, we can't be bothered getting them to pay their money back. We're not even going to bother to ask them. And of course, none of those people have volunteered to give it back either. So that's exactly why we're moving this amendment today. We would like this chamber to compel those enormous companies that earn over 50 million, who paid out executive bonuses um, and who made profits in a pandemic when they didn't need that JobKeeper support, pay back the amount that they didn't need, pay back the amount that's equivalent to those profits and those executive bonuses paid. It is only fair. It'll be very interesting to see how this chamber votes on that amendment, because it really goes to the heart of the role of government, and it goes to whether or not um, this government will continue to treat taxpayer dollars as corporate largesse, as they did in last night's budget when they dished out $62 billion in just the coming financial year in handouts for big corporates and mining billionaires, um, and I might add an increase in the fossil fuel subsidies yet more new money to prop up fossil fuels in a climate emergency. I mean, this budget is just completely blind to the climate crisis that we're in. It pays out for the government's corporate donor mates, um, and it's propping up unsustainable industries that are wrecking the economy, damaging nature and, and uh, threatening the future of our community. So how the uh, government in particular votes on this particular amendment will be very interesting for all to see. Big corporates uh, who are making huge profits should not have been given JobKeeper in the first place. There should have been those parameters placed on the fact that if you were making massive profits and paying executive bonuses, you didn't need taxpayer support. Um, they should be required to pay it back, not people who um, drive for Uber to try to make ends meet. The, the contrast couldn't be more distinct. <clears throat> and I note that if we were to get the money paid back by those uh, billionaires and big corporations in JobKeeper that they received, even though it turns out they didn't need it, it would be about a billion dollars, which is about the same amount as was cut from universities last night. So, so much for JobKeeper. Of course, universities weren't eligible to get the support that they deserved. They were already copying a big walloping from not having as many international students contributing to their coffers. And then they weren't eligible for JobKeeper. They have lost so many jobs already. If billionaires like Jerry Harvey were required to pay back the unethical uh, amounts that they received through JobKeeper when they didn't need it, well, we could actually keep some jobs in the tertiary sector. There's a nice synergy there in those figures. Just one suggestion. So many other good things could be done with that billion-odd dollars that could be recouped from big corporates and mining billionaires that didn't need the help then, and they sure don't need the help now. They didn't need the help last night when they got an extra $62 billion in handouts. This government delivers once again for its big corporate political donor mates. It's an insult that those that already have more than enough uh, means are getting yet more help from this government, when we saw nothing for social housing in the budget last night, when we saw a 10 per cent cut to university funding. And still, uh, wages will be declining in real terms. And this government, despite crowing about job creation, glosses over the fact that uh, if you, you can be considered to be in employment if you've got one hour of work. So it's all smoke and mirrors again with this government in a pre-election budget 
last night where they're clearly trying to uh, buy support, buy back the trust of the Australian people, but frankly, I think they've lost it. And I cannot wait for the day that they lose government, and I'm sure so many other Australians feel the same. Um, corporate Australia got largesse from the taxpayer-funded uh, 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 schemes like JobKeeper. It helped keep a lot of people in work. That's why we supported it. But where companies use that taxpayer money to subsidise their own profits and to subsidise executive bonuses, what a waste of public money. When this government made it so hard for people who needed support to get it and made so many people ineligible for JobKeeper, it is unconscionable that they allowed uh, big companies to rip them off, to rip off the Australian taxpayer by getting support that they did not need. The least they could do would be to get them to pay it back, and that's why our amendment on sheet 1279 requires exactly that. Those big companies should not have profiteered off the taxpayer in the first place. We are now in a position to fix that. We could use that money to actually keep jobs in sectors that have had funding cuts last night, like the tertiary sector. The university sector has already lost so many jobs. Um, it could do with some more support. It could do with vastly more support, but this could be a first uh, down payment. So we urge the government and the opposition to look favourably on this amendment and to require those big corporates to pay back the money that they didn't need. We are so glad that JobKeeper worked to keep so many people in jobs. That's why we voted for it. But it was misused by those enormous corporations who then paid themselves record profits, record executive bonuses. It makes the Australian public sick. We can fix this, and that's exactly what the government should do today in voting on our amendment. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Madam um, Deputy President. Well, yesterday may have been budget day, but I must say it felt more like Groundhog Day because this particular show, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government, is now in its eighth year. And sadly, the acts are getting a little tired. The lines are starting to wear pretty thin. We may have had a revolving door of treasurers and prime ministers, but the song sheet hasn't changed. Talk, 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 promise, 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 showing announcement over there, here, few dollars over there, commitments made, promises dealt up, but where is the delivery? Where are the lasting legacies of achievements left behind for all of the glitz and glamour? After eight years, is there anything concrete to show after the curtain comes down? Sadly, in this space, this government has a pretty consistent track record. It's a well-worn path they've trodden the past eight years, over-promise and under-deliver. They like to make big, flashy, showy announcements, but when it comes to the follow-through, they're nowhere to be seen. In fact, they like announcing things so much they just don't do it just once. They just don't announce, uh, make an announcement or a commitment just once. No, they do it. They do it once. They do it twice. They do it again and again, over and over. Same announcement of the same commitment for the same project year in, year out, again and again. But do they actually deliver on their commitments? No. With each reheated re-announcement, the project timelines get pushed further out the dollars further into the out years. So far out, in fact, it's basically a permanent commitment to the never-never. The reality is, when it comes to infrastructure announcements in particular, this government and this Prime Minister simply can't be believed. Because no matter the allocation of funds provided in these and other bills, no matter what the Treasury briefs out in the newspaper drops, we know they will fail on delivery. And that truth is available for everyone to see in black and white in the budget papers and my EFO. What we can see from those documents is that the Morrison government averages an infrastructure underspend of $1.2 billion a year. In fact, the last financial year they underspent their promises by $1.7 billion. So forgive me for showing some scepticism when the government decided to drop their roads 
funding commitments to Tasmania's local papers at the start of the week. The headline looked good. It sounded like the government was doing something, but scratch the surface ever so slightly and you find the truth. Another pre-budget infrastructure non-announcement by the Morrison Liberal government, followed following a now familiar pattern after eight years of this government, promised big, failed to deliver. In fact, in a remarkably brazen attempt to pretend they were actually delivering for Tasmania, the Morrison Liberal government have reheated and re-announced commitments to roads in Tasmania that they made in their first term in office. Their first term. They They've certainly got some gumption because they actually attempt to pass off their failure to deliver after eight years in office as a brand new promise, backed in with new money. But it's all a mirage, a fraud in fact, a fraud perpetrated on the people of my home state by a Prime Minister best known for his marketing spin. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we ever get from Mr Morrison. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we ever hear from, Mr. from the Prime Minister. But what has he actually delivered for Tasmania? Have we seen the progress on the Bridgewater Bridge? What about the much vaunted, much hyped new bridge across the Tamar? Remember that? The Derwent River, River Ferry Service, the Hobart Under Mall, uh, Underground Bus Mall, the fix for the Cooey Crawl, the much promised, greatly needed fix for notorious sections of the Bass Highway from Marawa to Smifton to Wynyard and all the way to Launceston. What's happening to the trans transit corridor through Hobart's northern suburbs? Has a single cent been spent from the Urban Congestion Fund to tackle Hobart's worsening gridlock? No. Where is the extra lane on the southern outlet? They finally dug a hole at the Hobart Airport roundabout, a project that was supposed to be finished by now. They, haven't they stuffed that up? What a bungle. And speaking of bungles, they ripped money out of Tasmania's rail freight funding to pay for the Burnie Port shiploader. And even then, they didn't fund it properly. Now, they now have had to tip more in because they stuffed it up the first time. Yet, astonishingly, they have once again tried to pass that stuff, off, stuff up off as a new commitment for Burnie. Extraordinary. Well, people on Tasmania's northwest coast will believe it when they see it, because all we ever get from this government, from this Prime Minister, is talk, talk, talk. That's all we hear. The Cradle Mountain Master Plan. They make a promise, then it's delayed, another stuff up. They can't even pretend to, to make a much needed commitment towards the Arthur Highway or the Tasman Highway from Surreal to Scottsdale. For some reason, the Tasman Peninsula and the east coast of Tasmania have fallen off the map in the eyes of the Morrison Liberal government. Yes, Mr Morrison and his government like to talk a big infrastructure game, but when you look at the detail, their promises are nothing more than old announcements reheated like a dodgy chicken burger that's been sitting in the Bay Marie. There is no reason to think announcements made last night or briefed out in days gone by will be any different to the countless others that have fallen by the wayside. What Tasmanians need is real infrastructure delivery that boosts productivity, reduces congestion and improves safety across our road network. That isn't what we're getting from the Morrison government, but it would be delivered by Labor. Labor is pleased the economy is recovering from COVID, but we need to ask how good could Australia's recovery be? The economic situation we find ourselves in is a once-in-a-generation opportunity for Australians, and we don't want to miss a single opportunity. That's why we can't afford more of the repeated failures of this government. Australians need government to seize the day, make bold decisions and then deliver on them. That's why an Albanese Labor government would deliver national reconstruction that squarely focuses on jobs. Not just any jobs, good, secure jobs. Jobs that our working families can rely on, underpinned with fair paying conditions, supported by better and cheaper childcare that working families can depend on. An Al Albanese Labor government would make commitments that we actually deliver on. We'd announce and then we follow through a concept that seems quite alien to the Morrison Liberal government, because we want Australia to be, be a country that makes things and supports local jobs, including in manufacturing. Under an Albanese Labor government, nobody will be held back, nobody left behind. Under an 
an Albanese Labor government budget day will be a day where Australians can finally look to their government to deliver on their promises. Not like this government, not like the, this government and their, their budgets, just all talk, talk, talk and no delivery. Thank you. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise um, to make a contribution to this discussion on approaches. Uh, appropriation bills, I should use the pre uh, correct terminology, um, bills three and four. As expected, last night's budget included some money for our dom domestic vaccine rollout, including money for the workforce, administration, monitoring and reporting, distribution, logistics, storage and communications. While this is welcome, we are far from uh, the appropriate approach when we deal with both vaccines vaccines and quarantining here in this country, but also in our global contribution. The government has missed a significant opportunity to right its wrongs and the wrongs of many other or a number of other nations around uh, the world. We should be showing our neighbours we are here to help and that we are supportive during this pandemic. Last year, the government committed to dedicated funding for the COVAX facility. COVAX is an important agreement that aims to dis uh, distribute vaccines to those who need it most. It represents a landmark agreement between nations where governments from every continent have chosen to work together to ensure vaccines are available to the most vulnerable everywhere. At least that's the theory. Yet this year, the government has refused to commit any additional funds to COVAX in the budget. Australia's lack of additional funding for COVAX was a serious missed opportunity and sends the wrong message to those in desperate need of vaccines. Across the world, we are seeing big pharma and wealthy nations engage in what has been termed vaccine apartheid. While one in four citizens of rich countries have received a vaccine, just one in 500 in the poorer nations around this globe have so. We've already, uh, we've already seen Big Pharma pay out $26 billion, let me say that again, $26 billion in dividends and stock buybacks to their shareholders. This would have, have been enough to vaccinate 1.3 billion people. It's extremely important that we ensure that the lower GDP countries around the world are vaccinated, not only because that is the right thing to do, but also, and I'll keep repeating this and repeating it, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. This is an investment in people because we should be doing that. But it is, if you want to look, for, look at it from the selfish point of view, it's also making sure that Australians are protected. Because it is absolutely essential that everybody is vaccinated. Because if, if we just go down the vaccine apartheid approach, where the more well to do and wealthier nations can all get vaccinated, those in the lower GDP countries who aren't vaccinated, that, actually, that will actually foster the development of further strains, further uh, strains in the virus. And what does that mean? It means the vaccines have to catch up, and, though, and we are potentially not protected by some of those variants that actually then generate, perpetuating the need to keep our borders closed and the pandemic. So from any way you look at it, it's the right thing to do. We are extremely disappointed to see that there's been zero commitments by the government to support a TRIPS waiver. Since last year, over 100 lower and middle income nations have been calling on the World Health Organisation WHO, to waive intellectual property rights on COVID vaccines and products. Last week, we saw President Biden show leadership by announcing the United States' support for the TRIPS waiver. The Morrison government should be following suit and should be contributing to the global discussion 
and supporting the waiver of intellectual property rights and COVID vaccines to ensure that we enable an equal distribution of the vaccines. We've also, of course, seen the flawed domestic uh, vaccine rollout. We have seen nothing allocated by this government, and this government refuses, the federal government refuses to acknowledge that it has a key role in quarantine in this country. It continues to push it off to the states and territories. And besides the investment in Howard Springs, which I've got to say, of course, is welcome to expand that investment, but we can't just rely on that facility. We need facilities in other states, and it is a federal responsibility. Reach out the hand, work with the state and territories, and ensure that we have quarantine facilities, because we are going to need quarantine facilities in this country for the foreseeable future. It is absolutely essential that we have top quality quarantine facilities that actually meet the best standards that we finally, finally truly address the issue of aerosol uh, contamination and spread. Because although now some of the words are being mouthed, the actions aren't being taken. We still haven't got the guidelines fixed. We still don't have a national standard to deal with ventilation. And we know that we don't have all of the state and territories making sure that their uh, hotel quarantine facilities are up to date. We still have state and territories, my own being one of them, where positive cases, COVID positive cases, are actually in the same facility and same hotel as those that are fortunately negative. These are the sorts of things we need to sort out in this country. Where is the Commonwealth, the federal government's leadership? Nowhere. We need to get serious about ensuring we have these facilities so we can bring the tens of thousands of Australians that are still overseas, and in particular, of course, those that are at high risk and I refer to the current situation going on in India, which I did uh, briefly talk uh, to in the Senate yesterday. This is not the appropriate way to be supporting Australians overseas. We need to make sure that we are putting on enough flights to enable those, particularly in India, the 9,500 950 of whom are vulnerable, of which at the moment the government has only committed to bring 450 home because there's only three committed flights, with the possibility of another three, which may then ensure that at some stage by June we get all of those vulnerable people home, the 950. But what about the rest of those Australians and permanent residents that are currently facing the dire situation in India. We're also, of course, seeing the government not being transparent about vaccine doses and the deals that it's uh, signing. And although the health department complains that we've had them, I think it's recently four times in as many weeks in front of the COVID committee, well, one of the reasons that we have to have them there is because they don't fully answer the questions. They don't fully answer the questions on notice. They hide behind cabinet in confidence. And because we keep seeing problems with the vaccine rollout, for example, on Friday we, we had to have a hearing to address the issue around India. And that's only when the government recognised when there was a question asked that there's seven, uh, 173 unaccompanied minors in India. So my question to the government is, when would you have paid attention to that if it wasn't for the COVID committee asking those questions? So yes, as far as this member of the committee is concerned, we will keep asking departments, particularly the health department, to come and answer questions so that Australians get answers to the botched rollout of the vaccines. We still haven't had a satisfactory answer about why we haven't signed an agreement with Moderna, for example. 
So now that Australians are having to wait so that they can get the, for, uh, the Pfizer jab or the Pfizer, more Pfizer doses to become available, because although there's been a further deal signed for more doses, we're not getting them till towards the end of the year. Hence, you know, hope that we'll be able to get Australians all vaccinated by the end of this year. Government says they have provisions for the purchase of additional vaccine doses, including NRMA vaccines, but there are zero details about how much funding has been set aside or, in fact, when this might happen. I'm so sick of the oblique approach to vaccines which we are facing. It is essential that the public know what is going on. It is essential that there is transparency and accountability on this issue. We're not seeing a serious commitment by the government to a publicly owned mRNA facility in this country. mRNA vaccines and other drugs from mRNA are the way of the future. So not only would an investment in manufacturing facilities, publicly owned manufacturing facilities, so that we are not at the whim of Big Pharma, and that's important as well. Publicly owned facilities are an investment not only currently in this pandemic but into the future, because they are going to be the leading edge of drug development into the future. The market can't guarantee us access to this revolutionary technology. We need a publicly owned facility. There is research being leading edge research being done on mRNA vaccines and technologies around this country. Yes, it's happening globally, but we have some leaders here in this country as well. What is the government doing about negotiations? with biotech to ensure that we have a publicly owned facility here that is leading edge and able to do its own research and manufacture those vaccines here. I hope the government doesn't make the same mistakes and looks towards creating and rethinks its will work with private sector. Yes, work with private sector, but make sure we have a publicly owned facility so Australians and the government has control of the manufacture and the decision making on those vaccines and the drugs going forward. We need long term thinking here. We are, we are in this for the long haul. We've already heard that we don't, the builders aren't probably going to be open until next year, and that's what the experts sometime next year. And that's what the experts have been saying all along. Because this isn't over. We are, going, we are already seeing more variants. We are going to have to the vaccines are all going to have to develop to address those variants as we go into the future. The pandemic and its effects are not going away anytime soon. The Treasurer has acknowledged that. We need to be doing better about how we are responding in terms of vaccines, in terms of manufacturing here, in terms of openness and transparency, and accepting the science of this pandemic. And that's what I'm concerned, one of the things I'm concerned about is we aren't. And aerosol transmission is a perfect example of that. We have still got varying standards around the country. We are still not best practice in some places. Government has made various announcements about what they're going to do. For example, testing from third country. Uh, for passengers coming to Australia through third countries. That still isn't happening. When is it going to happen? If that's not happen happening, the sorts of things they're putting in place once they start the repatriation flights from India, can they guarantee us that they have that sus now so that those flights do start on time and do have the best possible practice in place? Because if they haven't started elsewhere, they need to guarantee that they are going to be doing it for those Indian flights so that people can come home when this stupid ban ends, which should be ended now, 
those Australians and the people coming home from India need to be assured that those things are all in place so they are safe and that people in Australia are safe. We have a long way to go through this pandemic and the government needs to fully acknowledge that and get these things right. Senator Macdonald. I rise to speak on appropriation bill number three and four. I cannot begin to tell you how proud I am to be a part of a government who continues to, to deliver for regional, rural and remote Australia, because we know that it is in these parts of the country where we grow food and fibre, where we mine the resources that build schools and hospitals and roads and inner city places, uh, and most importantly is such an amazing place to raise your family whether it's the sense of community uh, or whether it's just living under the brilliant stars of the southern sky. So the, the investment in uh, regional, rural and remote Australia is critical to the well-being of this nation more broadly. So among a number of other things, the appropriation bill uh, numbers three and four contribute to the Morrison-McCormack government's heavy investment into rural and regional Australia. But I'd just like to touch on a few of the things that I am most excited about and that has made the most significant change to our communities. The first one is the Building Better Regions Fund, uh, an additional round of new funding of $200 million. Now, this, uh, the round five, $100 million was allocated to tourism-related infrastructure while maintaining an additional $100 million for broader community infrastructure and investment, bringing the total commitment to this program to $1 billion from 2017-18 to 2023-24. And the BBRF supports regional and remote communities by funding investment-ready infrastructure projects that create jobs, that drive economic growth. It funds new or expanded events, strategic regional plans or leadership and capability strengthening activities that provide economic and social benefits to these regions. Local governments and incorporated not-for-profit organisations are eligible to apply. Um, I'll give you one example of the kind of tourism projects that are uh, or the tourism assets that we have in Queensland, being the uh, Qantas Founders Museum and uh, Stockman's Hall of Fame in Longreach, uh, and in Winton, the Age of Dinosaurs Museum. They are just two examples of communities that have built world's best practice, world's best assets. And if you haven't been to Longreach or Winton to see those uh, incredible uh, exhibits, uh, then you would, uh, would uh, have missed out on something, and I urge you to get out there, hire a car, uh, book a plane, uh, whatever way you can get there, get there. Uh, the next is a regional recoveries partnership, $100 million of new funding over two years from 2020 to 2021. The partnerships will coordinate investment with other levels of government to support recovery and growth in 10 regions, that's the Snowy Mountains, the Hunter, Newcastle and Parks region in New South Wales, Cairns and Tropical North Queensland, Gladstone and Mackay, Isaac, Whitsunday regions in Queensland, Gippsland region in Victoria, Kangaroo Island in South Australia, Southwest region of Western Australia and all of Tasmania. The partnerships seek to back in existing regional plans by develop, developing targeted initiatives with contributions from all levels of government to deliver jobs, economic recovery and economic diversification. The Stronger Communities programs, $22.7 million of new funding in round six, and the SCP provides funding of up to $150,000 in each of the 151 federal electorates. Members of the House of Representatives will continue to use their roles to identify key locally driven projects with available funding of between $2,500 and $20,000 for eligible projects. And in recognition of the ongoing impacts of the COVID pandemic on communities, applications submitted in round six by all incorporated not-for-profit organisations and or incorporated trustees applying on behalf of a trust will be exempt 
from the normal 50 per cent co-funding requirement and will be able to apply for funding of up to 100 per cent of their eligible project costs. Now, this is extraordinarily significant because we are talking about communities where the councils uh, are required to provide uh, key infrastructure um, and, and have often a very small ratepayer base to develop that from. So the removal of this 50 per cent co-contribution uh, at this time is an incredible um, acknowledgement of their challenges. In Queensland, uh, I, I understand differently to other states, Queensland Shire Councils have to provide uh, things like sewerage. Now, this is not a requirement for, uh, in other states, and it means that very remote communities, small communities where there might be as few as 350 ratepayers, but in vast areas, the councils are required to maintain uh, roads, uh, sewerage and other amenities, uh, pools, for example, that make such a difference to the lifestyle and livability of these uh, remote and regional towns. Guaranteeing Medicare, the Rural Health multi Multidisciplinary Training Program infrastructure. $50.3 million in additional funding. Now, the existing network of 16 university departments of rural health, which are funded under the RHMT program, will be expanded. Uh, these uh, networks provide training to students across a range of health disciplines, um, at nursing and allied health, and offer innovative learning opportunities in settings including aged care, disabilities, rehabilitation services, childcare, schools, community facilities, as well as Aboriginal community controlled health services. This package provides for capital works as well as recurring funding. The capital works programs invest funding through purchases of housing for student accommodation and building works to add teaching facilities to aged care services. And of course, last night we heard the Treasurer talk about additional commitments to supporting aged care uh, across the nation. So a really important, uh, important announcement because we know that in regional communities, if there is not an aged care facility, uh, that, that families end up moving away from those towns. So aged care uh, is an important part for rural communities. Um, I could go on all day about the incredible announcements under so many of these packages, the mobile black spot program, uh, building strong, resilient leaders, recovery for regional tourism. Uh, these are all incredibly important uh, projects that go, as I said, towards the government's agenda of investing in the regions, of investing in rural and regional communities, uh, and, and most importantly, from my point of view, being a senator based in Townsville, uh, in the North Australian agenda. And there has been a number of commitments that continue to build uh, on the government's commitment to North Australia, and I know that those commitments will be paid back to the Australian people, the Australian taxpayers, in spades, in terms of uh, irrigation uh, and agricultural projects, in terms of mining projects that are facilitated by things like copper string, uh, the transmission line that provides a connection for uh, renewable projects as well as existing uh, um, power infrastructure that allows us to be connected in a reliable way uh, and reduces electricity costs, one of the things that really cripple business uh, in northern Australia. Uh, in addition to those kind of projects, the government has made financial commitments to local roads and community infrastructure. And local governments in Queensland benefited from the additional $202.4 million from January uh, of this year, 2021. Uh, these are uh, critical projects, as I've already touched on, because local government, the most important, dare I say it, the most important level of government in this nation, the one that is closest to communities, who understand the real challenges of living in rural, regional and remote parts of Australia. Uh, but I guess the one that is really the most exciting uh, for those of us who live uh, particularly in the far north, is the commitment to water projects. So within Queensland itself, the Australian government has committed more than $516 million to 28 water infrastructure projects in Queensland through the $3.5 billion National Water Infrastructure Development Fund. 
Uh, the investments include $176 million to build the $352 million Rookwood Weir project, $42 million to build the $84 million Emu Swamp Dam, $11.6 million to modernise the $28 million Mariba Dimbula water supply scheme that provides more than 8,000 megalitres in new water for irrigators, creates more than 260 jobs, boosts the value of production annually by $20 million. Uh, and just on that region, um, the incredible uh, agricultural uh, blossoming that's happened since the construction of the dam in that region uh, now measures around half a billion dollars of produce each year. Uh, and if you haven't been to Mariba, can I encourage that you get there, uh, whether it be the deli that, um, uh, that uh, showcases regional produce. Um, it is a, a wonderful community and highlights a diverse, a diverse range of, um, of peoples for, that came to this country uh, during the development of that region. Uh, $790,000 towards $1.58 million Warwick recycled water project that supports drought resilience by supplying recycled water for primary producers. Now, importantly, in the north, there has also been $30 million to support the, the construction of the Big Rocks Weir. This is only a relatively small water project. It's 10,000 megalitres, but it will change that community of Charters Towers because it not only provides security for town water supply, but it also provides additional irrigation uh, water for the uh, irrigators in that region. Now, sadly, despite the community being a, uh, have been supporting this project for at least 30 years, despite the council being a proponent, despite the urgent need for uh, commitment to uh, water security for that town, uh, unfortunately, the Queensland government is now called it in. Uh, to uh, the Coordinator General, and we will continue to pay, play politics with a, a water project that is uh, so small in the scheme of things, it's so important to town security for water supply, that uh, it really beggars belief that we should be still kicking this project around. There's $180 million to support the construction of the Huendon Irrigation Scheme, including $10 million being provided for the completion of a detailed business case for the project. And in addition, there's been $75 million to support the Queensland government, the Queensland government who is the responsible one to build these water projects under the constitution. For any of those senators who don't understand the separation of power for water resource plans and water allocations, which are the state's responsibility. Uh, to deliver, the federal government has delivered 22 feasibility studies, including $24 million for the Hell's Gate Dam project, including the Big Rocks Weir that I've already spoken about, $10 million each for the Urana Dam and the Lakeland Irrigation Area business case projects. Now, these projects are critical. Critical because in the north part of Australia, we receive metres metres of rain each year, uh, rain that is uh, not captured, not managed, and which would allow us to develop the sort of crops in agricultural precincts where Australia is known as leading the world. Uh, the trial crops that have been run uh, by the CSIRO and the departments in new cropping varieties, uh, including existing crops like cotton, which is now uses uh, less and less water less and less um, pesticides and fertilisers. They, it is recognised now as uh, a, a, a fibre that is fully traceable and is the product that we should be wearing as a completely renewable uh, product. And in North Queensland, uh, we have the opportunity to grow vast amounts of this product, both in dry land and areas like Etta Plains around Julia Creek, uh, or further north, up around Mount Garnet, uh, and in that region. And uh, um, in Georgetown recently, at the terrific forum organised by the Etheridge Shire Council and uh, Mayor Barry Hughes, there was a great discussion of CSIRO's work, also funded by the federal government, that had demonstrated the suitable availability of suitable water, suitable land, uh, and with the availability of water, of rain, uh, of sunshine, 
and of course the demand for our products that are world's best, recognised as world's best. Uh, this is an opportunity for Queensland and North Queensland uh, to be developing uh, because we know that in these parts of Australia, in regional, rural and re remote, we grow the food and fibre, we dig out the resources, but most importantly we have innovative, exciting communities that are a great place to raise a family and to live. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Thanks very much, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Delighted to get a cheer from the uh, other side. I think it was obviously directed towards towards me, and I probably start to get used to it after a while. Um, I was really struck. Um, I, I, I should I should uh, thank uh, uh, the, the last speaker for her uh, contribution. It's only the modern National Party really that that really comes in here. Uh, after spending years apologising for uh, projects that are announced, enormous buckets of money that are announced for dams that are never built, I spend years apologising for this hoax that's perpetrated on regional communities, uh, and then come in here at every budget breathlessly announcing more promises for more water infrastructure promises that will never be kept. $560 million is the announcement. Does anybody on earth really believe that the Morrison government, having made another announcement about another series of dam infrastructure projects, will actually ever build one? Um, now, the, the performance, I don't want to spend too much time on the Treasurer's performance last night, but it was one of the most lacklustre performances. You would think that a government that was announcing this much spending would really have their heart in it. Um, now, I can see that the Treasurer and the Prime Minister have no difficulty executing this enormous political backflip. After having spent more than a decade telling the Australian community that debt and deficit were a crisis, as bold as brass, they're in the joint next door saying there's no problem. We're a trillion dollars in debt with nothing to show for it, no reform, no infrastructure, no fixes to the big issues that face the Australian community. Uh, but here they are. And it does go to Gough Whitlam's maximum that politics for the Tories is like the art of rowing. You look in one direction, but you go in the other. Now, that's okay for the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. It's not okay for the coalition backbench. You can hear every time you turn a corner, there is a group of coalition backbenchers who are finding this subterfuge, this deception, this hypocrisy very difficult to swallow indeed. So it was an absolute snooze fest last night. The only thing that kept me awake during the Treasurer's performance was the hypocrisy. And it made me reflect upon last year's budget, a budget that was similarly aimless. The good elements of the budget were, of course, the government committing to the proposals that Labor had made through the course of the year, particularly around JobKeeper and JobSeeker increases that were Labor proposals. I remember vividly the former leader in here scoffing at Labor proposals for wage subsidies to keep workers connected with their employer. Three weeks later, they were doing it. What was the centrepiece, though, of the October budget? Jobmaker. Jobmaker. Does anybody re remember in the Treasurer's contribution last night uh, spruiking the achievements of the centrepiece of the 2020? 2021 budget, JobMaker? Well, I don't think they will. The Treasurer and the Prime Minister promised Australians 450,000 new jobs would be the product of that scheme. It, you would think, at, at the back end of a recession, a commitment to produce 450,000 jobs, more jobs than was required out of the Working Nations scheme at the back end of the recession in the 1990s, a grand promise that should have filled 
regional communities full of hope for the jobs that were to come. What was delivered out of that promise? Well, in March, 609 jobs. By the time we get to this week, just around about 1,100 jobs out of 450,000 jobs. 0.02 per cent. 450,000 job promise, 0.02 per cent delivery. It's become the maximum that will define this miserable government. All promise, no delivery. All about the announcements and the marketing and the spin, never about the delivery for Australian households and Australian families. And where is it? Where is the JobMaker program in this year's budget? It's not up the front. It's in page 292 of the regional ministerial budget statement, literally four pages towards the end. Oh, that is political cowardice, uh, and it will define this government. Of course, the budget is just a political budget. It's absolutely not designed to fix the structural problems that the Australian community faces. After eight long years of chaos and self-interest, complacency and bungling and failure, what we have from this government is a political budget that's designed to paper over the cracks of eight years of failure. It's a shameless attempt at a political fix. It's not the genuine reform that we need. And what do we see this week? It's a very welcome development that sections of the Australian economy have bounced back faster than any economist or any commentator predicted. It's good to see, uh, while we do see some shopping strips where shops are closed, some sectors of the economy that need the government's support that aren't getting it, it is welcome to see in aggregate terms uh, some improvement. But what you see from the Morrison government is taking credit for the achievement of others. It's as if welcome news has got anything to do with what this government's done, with any reform that the government's conducted, with any attempt to address the underlying structural issues. No, what you have, where there have been achievements, they have been achievements of the Australian people. Where there has been good work on the pandemic, good work on public health, it has been the work of the state governments, much of it undermined much of it criticised, much of it politicised by uh, those opposite, none more so than by the Prime Minister, in who his callous disregard for the public interest poured scorn on the efforts of premiers to try and get control of the quarantine failures of the government. Is there anything in this budget about quarantine? Nope. Still, the government pushes away responsibility for quarantine and border control. You know, bystanders usually don't get in the way, but somehow this government manages to be both bystander and get in the road and subsequently take credit for whenever it is that things go well. Beyond the hype and the headlines, there is very little in this budget for ordinary Australians. Australians on modest incomes will get a modest tax cut but they will get a tax hike uh, after the election. Uh, there is nothing in this budget for, for families who have been held back by the Morrison government's failure to have a strategy on wages. In fact, baked into the heart of this budget is an assumption that real wages will continue to be held back. And that means for many households, real wages and household incomes will go backwards. While house prices rise and rents rise, wages for most Australians will continue to fall. And there is no strategy in this budget to deal with housing affordability and housing availability. There is no strategy to deal with falling wages uh, and to deal with wage growth. Uh, and that is the problem that is at the heart of this budget. It is all about the politics and not what's going to have an impact uh, on the lives of ordinary Australians. There's no plan 
on wage growth. The previous leader in here, Mr. now Mr Cormann, former Senator Cormann, said that uh, falling wages, a break on wages growth, was a design feature of this government's approach to wages. Well, there is no strategy in this budget to fix that problem. And you can see it when you look at the government's halfway house approaches to aged care and childcare. You would think that the impact of a Royal Commission interim report that was entitled Neglect would cause those opposite to reflect on the impact of the budget cuts that they delivered in aged care in 2014 that crippled the capacity of the aged care to deliver decent care to elderly Australians. You know, these people have worked for decades in the Australian economy. They have held the country up. They have contributed, and we owe it to them, to make sure that they have their final years in care and comfort and dignity. And you would think that a report entitled Neglect could even wake up the miserable hearts of those opposite and cause them a little bit of reflection. What do we see? A halfway house on aged care. Nothing, nothing in terms of the uh, wages for aged care workers. You can do all that you want. You can fund all that you want to fund for training for aged care workers, but until you lift the wages of aged care workers, until you improve their position in the labour market, you will never see the volume of Australians that we need to see working in aged care. You can fund all of the packages that you want to fund, but you won't see the workers arrive, skilled workers committed to the care of elderly Australians. You won't see people go to those jobs while they've been paid 20 bucks an hour. And that's true of childcare too. At last year, these characters poured scorn on Anthony Albanese's commitment to deliver universal childcare. We said correctly that a commitment to providing childcare, universal childcare, was an important commitment for labour force participation, particularly for women. Although childcare, of course, is not just about women, it is about young men and it's about the welfare of children as well. And we said it was a productivity initiative, and this government poured scorn on both the proposal and those two claims. And what do you see yesterday? Mr. Frydenberg out there talking about productivity and labour force participation, but with a scheme that will help less than 25 per cent of the families that the Albanese Labor proposal would help. Nothing in terms of meaningful tax reform. No energy policy. No improvement. Energy prices gone up almost every year of the term of this aimless government. 21 different energy policy frameworks. No security for investment in cheap energy for the grid. Affordable housing, no plan for housing and homelessness. There is an explosion in regional New South Wales, particularly in big towns, Dubbo, Tamworth, Nowra, Albury, Wagga, of people sleeping rough, of families in the Hunter Valley with young kids sleeping in tents because they have been forced out because the cost of rental housing continues to rise while household incomes continue to fall. Uh, housing, pur purchasing housing out of reach for most ordinary Australians. And, and what is there in the budget? Well, nothing really except a sound grab, a cruel hoax that says we're going to fund 10,000 places for single parents who can get a housing deposit of 2 per cent. Well, I don't believe you. I don't believe that this government will ever deliver on that meagre, tiny promise, uh, it is a cruel hoax, but it doesn't touch the sides of the housing affordability problem that is out there. What do we see in infrastructure? Big announcements, but actually really 
big cuts, $3.3 billion cut to infrastructure spending in the fine print of the budget papers. But why is that? Why is there such a big gap between what the government says it will do and what it does do? People are learning. There is no relationship between what the Prime Minister says and what actually happens. No relationship between what the Prime Minister announces and whether in the real world anything actually happens. And that's what's going to define this budget as much as it defines this government. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Look, the masters of marketing spin. They'd have you believe that the federal budget is a story about the Australian economy making a comeback. The Treasurer would have you believe that spending $100 billion and by plunging the Australian economy into a record trillion dollars of debt, that this, year's, this is the year of economic and clearly an economic mismanagement by successive Liberal governments are behind us. But if you read the fine print of the Morrison government's budget, if you read the T's and the C's, what you see is that the real wages for Australian workers are forecasted to decline in 2021, in 2022 and 2023, and in 2024. That means the money that Australian workers take home for this year and the next three years accounting for inflation will go down. The middle class in this country will st start to shrink. Our incomes shrink along with that. And it's not a new phenomenon for the Morrison government, because for five consecutive years before the COVID-19 pandemic, Australians suffered through record low wage growth. Australians have suffered through years under this government's stagnant wages, and now they'll have to suffer through years of wage cuts. Now, what sort of economic recovery is that? The Morrison's government's only plan for years of stagnating and declining wages is to rack up record debts. And even then, when the Morrison government is serving up to Australian workers, to the Australian middle class, is a wage cut. Do not believe the Prime Minister's spin that this wage cut for Australian workers is a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because the Prime Minister has, for years going back to his time as Treasurer, been delivering record low wages growth for Australians. Well, we know why this is, when we know why this is happening, we also know how to fix it. But the Morrison government is too ideologically blinded to do what must be done. Years and years of stagnant, declining wages are the direct outcome of years and years of attacks on unions, years and years of attacks on workers' rights to come together and collectively bargain for their wages, years and years of attacks on the ability for unions to inspect books and expose wage theft and super theft, years and years of inaction on the rampant exploitation of migrant workers, and of course years and years of inaction on the exploitation of gig workers and casual workers and sham contracting and labour hire workers. At least some of these people are getting paid as low as $6 an hour to undercut what used to be good, fair paying and often unionised jobs, middle class jobs. And of course, this government has no plan to deal with those very inherent problems that we have for hard working Australians. For eight years, Liberal governments have done nothing about these issues. And now, on the 11th hour, with a trillion dollars of debt, the Morrison government is hoping it can indiscriminately throw money around and fix it. Mr. Acting Deputy President, the budget forecast says it all. After years and years of stagnant declining wages, the Morrison government has spent $100 billion to only deliver more years and more years of declining wages. Now, you don't have to take my word for it, what the government's strategy and plan and ideology is. The former Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann, said himself that low wage growth is, and I quote, a deliberate design feature of our economic architecture. Low wages are the Morrison government's plan for this economy. 
They have been for years, and Minister Cormann said it himself, and we know now that they will be for years to come. The problem the Morrison government is now running into is what and when Australian workers are not being, why they're not being paid fairly. When Australian workers do not have money in their pockets, when the Australian middle class is shrinking, it means that Australians middle class do not have the spare money to spend. When the Australian middle class has no money to spend, then the no money there is no money there to stimulate the economy. And this is a story in the situa sorry situation that the Morrison government now finds itself in. It can spend $100 billion of taxpayers' money and the economy remains a disaster. So what do the Australian middle class get in return for another four years of stagnant and declining wages? They get a one-off tax cut to see the Morrison government through an election and then a tax hike on top of their wage cut. The only real tax cut in this budget that isn't just a piece of cynical pre-election marketing is a tax cut to the super wealthy. Unlike the Australian middle class, the super wealthy get a permanent tax cut. That makes it clear who the Morrison government is really looking out for. Of course, you know, moving to aged care, you believe that if you believe the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, aged care is so supposedly a big winner in this budget. Well, let's look at the fine print and see what the real story is. The budget is supposed to be a response to the aged care Royal Commission. But if you had to rate their response, it would be a pitiful three, two out of ten at the most. Why do I say that? Well, I say that for a very clear reason, because the Royal Commission recommended very clearly to provide the care the older Australians need and deserve. A sector needs to have additional funding of $10 billion a year and a massive overhaul of workforce paying conditions. And of course, we've seen workers even I've seen speaking to aged care workers this morning and hearing the devastating pressures that are on their employment, on work that is directly procured and paid for by this government, but no strategy or plan for that workforce that goes beyond um, minimal numbers. Because let's just make this point. I think one of, the, one of the workers made this very clearly to me only a matter of an hour ago. With the numbers that have been talked about, the deficient numbers for training, when you come into an industry that only pays $20 odd dollars, $21, then those people just don't stay. So in actual fact, we're paying for training that's going to be a waste of money because we're actually not going to be able to have the people we train stay within those jobs. The people, when they come and see the sorts of pressures that are in that industry, regardless of their love, care and desire to be in a caring industry, that the economic impact on them trying to raise a family, have a middle class life, is impacted by this government's direct ideological strategy of suppressing wages. And no better example than, of course, in aged care. And of course, we've heard the government only announce $3.5 billion a year, which is only a third of what is needed and only a third of what the Royal Commission into Aged Care said was needed. And to this, there is no meaningful commitment to the paying conditions of the carers who literally are in the care in this sector. The heart of the aged care sector is not the buildings and it's not the operating companies. And, and a no care worker, it is a no care worker without the workers. There was once in a generation opportunity to lift up the workers who did the most difficult, stressful, intimate and essential work of looking after older Australians. And this government once again has failed. And so let's look at you know, what does this budget have to offer the Australian critical aviation and tourism industries? Essentially nothing. Buried in those budget assumptions is the government's catalysmic vaccine rollout failure. That failure means that international borders are assumed to be shut until mid-2022. The Prime Minister had one job. He outsourced quarantine to the states and he abandoned aged care to the ravages of the pandemic, so he literally had one job. That job was to get the vaccine rollout right, and he failed. Now we see the horrific consequences for pilots, flight attendants, engineers, baggage handlers, ground crew, catering staff and security guards at our airports around the country, and many more. 
not to mention the thousands of tourism businesses that rely on international visitor, visitors which will struggle to keep their doors open and their workers employed for a few months at alone until mid-2022. Of course, what's particularly disturbing is the government's own report says mid-2022. They made an expectation in October this year that the aviation industry would be back up there and flying. There's no new announcement for new funding until that period. But let's just look at this, this whole uh, strategy about supposedly where um, international tourism will start to come back. Well, key industry bodies saying it will not be until 2023. So we've got skilled workers that have been lost out of this industry because they've been made redundant from companies that have received hundreds and billions of dollars from this government, taxpayers' dollars, with no obligation to keep those workers connected. Look at, look at Qantas right in the middle of the pandemic, turning around and laying off 2,500 workers that could have been received JobKeeper, and not a peep from this government. In actual fact, there was a peep. There was a yelling abuse to those workers from the opposite side about those workers that were outsourced to 2,500 saying they were just too, they were too middle class, that their wages could raise a family and that the companies that won those contracts were getting paid less and those middle class jobs are gone. Well, saying the middle class is greedy is outrageous by this government, and particularly after spending billions of hard payers, uh, taxpayers' hard-earned money uh, not to these companies that have so dismally failed along with this government. Uh, this industry. And of course, we're a country that relies heavily on aviation. What we needed was a rescue package for the aviation sector with a focus on secure jobs and skill retention. Instead, we are facing a skills Armageddon in this lifeblood Australian industry. We're seeing the contempt that the coalition has for good, for good Australian jobs. They're apparently happy to abandon, abandon this industry, these workers and their families. When the industry finally reopens, the current and the power for this industry to re reopen will be greatly diminished. You can't have an industry that lays off hundreds of pilots. You can't have an industry that lays off engineers for aircraft. You can't have an industry that turns around and has the amount of hours and days required to train people to do screening on the screening um, system at our airports, our national security importance. You, those people just don't come out of thin air. They need to be trained, they need to be skilled. So this will be a situation where you know, they'll be trying to turn on the aviation industry, they'll be trying to turn the electricity back on, turning the power on, and of course there'll be no electrons coming through because the reality is those people will be out of the industry as they've been made redundant and this government has failed to have a plan on how the aviation industry gets back into the air. Now, there's so many examples of this, country, this government abandoning uh, industry and workers and their families. Now, we saw that with Donata, those Donata workers that were so dismally abandoned by this government, many thousands of workers in that food delivery sector of the, of the industry. Now, quite clearly, if we're, going to have, if we're going to talk about powering up skills of our workers, then we have to turn around and deal with the massive skill shortage we face as we face a huge exodus from the aviation and tourism industry, with many workers already bleeding out to retail and logistics jobs, even some of those to rideshare jobs. Of course, rideshare jobs that have no minimum standards that this government says is too complicated to give. It seems to be okay for other countries to work out how working people in those sectors have minimum standards. And that's you know, New York, Seattle, California, UK, various countries through Europe, parts of Asia. But no, it's too complicated to work out how we can actually turn around and give decent jobs to Australians. But what happens with this patchwork, particularly in the tourism industry, when these skilled workers go, we, we do not have the power to turn around and make that difference when we can switch on without electricity coming through. What we've seen is a series of patch, patchwork jobs on aviation, and now this government have very little show for the $4.5 billion in assistance over the past year. Devastation for the industry, no future plan, 
and we spent $4.5 billion. Despite putting billions into the coffers of the airlines, we have seen losses of 10,000 jobs and more in outsourcing. You've had a plan to decimate this government, to decimate the airline and tourism industry and drain the skills from Australia. You couldn't do much better than this government, if that's what your intention was. This government's done a great job of it. And there's nothing in this budget that will fix that challenge. This budget delivers a wage cut for Australians. This budget fails to deliver for the sectors Liberal governments have repeatedly abandoned over the last eight years, such as aged care and aviation. And clearly, this budget fails to deliver any sort of economic recovery. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, this afternoon, I'd like to speak to Government Appropriation Bill No. 4, uh, 20, 2021. Uh, this appropriation bill relates to the allocation of $12.4 million uh, to be allocated to the Office of the Special Investigator to uh, investigate uh, potential criminal matters identified in the Inspector General's uh, Brereton's report uh, in relation to uh, war crimes uh, committed by Special Operations Task Force Group in Afghanistan uh, between uh, 2005 and 2016. Uh, these matters, which will be investigated by the Office of the Special uh, Investigator, um, are of the most serious nature. They go to uh, the alleged commitment of war crimes uh, by our special forces in Afghanistan during our nation's longest conflict, uh, and one that is drawing to a close. Uh, we have uh, seen uh, through the work of uh, Justice Brereton uh, many terrible, terrible crimes come to light. Uh, we have also seen uh, within that report a contention made which from the beginning uh, we in the Greens have uh, suggested very clearly uh, is untenable. Uh, the contention that uh, knowledge of these crimes and responsibility uh, for them uh, is limited uh, to ranks uh, below that of officer. Now, when the Brereton report was uh, published into the world, the Greens were very quick uh, in calling attention uh, to what seemed to be the uh, ridiculous idea that such activities, as outlined within the reports, the war crimes, and that is what they are, uh, could have been committed uh, without the knowledge uh, of senior commanding officers. And in the subsequent months since the publication of the Brereton report, it has indeed come to pass that the cultural activities referenced in the Brereton report, particularly uh, the uh, illegal imbibement of alcohol uh, and the use of uh, uh, limbs of enemy combatants uh, as trophies and playthings were indeed something participated in uh, by officers uh, of our ADF. It is vitally important uh, that this investigation is properly funded, uh, that it is given the resources and, act and access uh, needed to undertake its work. What is at stake, at stake here is uh, nothing more or less than justice uh, for those uh, whose lives were ripped apart uh, by the actions of serving members of our ADF uh, participating uh, in a security action in Afghanistan that was undertaken under the pretense uh, of uh, protecting and supporting the people of Afghanistan. Now, let's be very clear. Uh, the war in Afghanistan uh, was a complete failure. We should have never, never participated in this military engagement. It was without strategic direction 
almost from the beginning. And it has seen countless loss of life and the diversion of resources which would have either been spent better here in Australia or as part of international efforts to address humanitarian issues. We are also, as a community, now forced to confront, through the revelations of the Brereton Report, the reality that individuals who have been elevated to a supreme position of moral leadership within our community may well have committed some of the most heinous war crimes, most heinous violations of the laws of war that have, committed, that have been committed not only in this nation but in the history of nations within recent times. We are forced to contend with the possibility that there will be a need to journey soon down to the Australian War Memorial, that space which has been elevated to the closest thing that we possess that might be considered a secular national shrine, that we may be forced to journey to that place and take down pictures of individuals currently honoured there post their conviction for the commitment of some of these crimes. It may soon fall to this parliament to make decisions about what actions we will take in holding politically responsible the defence ministers of the serving day. Because make no mistake, the Inspector General will have uh, the, uh, the Office of the Special Prosecutor will have the responsibility of pursuing individuals for the commitment of these crimes. But that is not where the responsibility must end. It must be held there. Individuals that pulled the trigger, individuals that lied, individuals that took actions that covered up, they must be held responsible. And so too must the senior levels of command, all the way up the top, and so too must Generals Burr and Generals Campbell, and so too must be the various defence ministers that served over that period of time. All must be held responsible for their part in these crimes. After a long period of existing in the shadows of these instances being spoken about, first as whispers, then as conversations, then as confidentially given statements. There must now be full transparency. There must be full accountability. These crimes must never, ever be enabled to be perpetrated again. The seriousness of them must never be excused because they have taken the lives of people, they have shattered families, they have stained our institutions. We must in this moment find the courage to look clearly into the mirror of Afghanistan and study the reflection, lest we re accidentally recommit ourselves to the same cycle of violence that led us to that conflict. There are some in this place that are welcoming, propagating, promoting very dangerous narratives. Speaking of the drums of war and in so doing beating them themselves, claiming false historical analyses, planning career moves, looking for their opportunity, their space to make a name for themselves 
as they whip up dangerous rhetoric. What Brereton gives us the opportunity to do, and it is an opportunity that we must grasp, is to look clearly at the reality of war, to look clearly at the crimes that have been committed, look clearly at the political mistakes that were made, to hold all accountable for their action and inaction, and ensure that these crimes are never ever committed again. Thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, uh, Senator Steele. John, Senator Carr. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now, the government's spin machine would have us uh, argue that this was a budget about the future recovery. In fact, if you look at the detail of the budget, what you in fact see that there's nothing to do with recovery. It's about uh, uh, the government preparing its election strategy. This is a budget that's really get about getting the government through the next election, not getting the country through the next 10 years. The budget reflects the political judgment of the government of trying to overcome a series of problems of its own creation and seeking to persuade the Australian public that it doesn't really need a long-term strategy. What it needs to do is re-elect a group of Liberal politicians. What we have is no strategy, no coherent plan about the investment in science, no investment in research, no investment in the industrial capabilities of the nation, no approach that would lead us to have any confidence about building Australia's industrial uh, capabilities to forge a stronger nation past uh, this uh, pandemic no understanding of what it actually takes to have the skills, to have the resources, to build the sovereign capabilities in manufacturing to secure the future of the nation. This is a budget of wasted opportunities. This is a budget that has no substantial investment in the future of higher education, no substantial investment in science and research, and only tweaks at the edges various little programs to say, oh, we've attended to this problem or we've attended to that problem. No attention whatsoever to matters around, for instance, the substantive questions about the 32 per cent drop in research and development uh, by our private sector companies, they see, which of course are reflected in the science tables, they, which since 2015-16, no, 20, the uh, 30 per cent reduction that the government itself uh, through its Department of Industry, acknowledges and the actual research and development expenditure by business. No attempt to actually deal with the substantive strategic approaches that its own reviews have highlighted, for instance that from the 2016 3Fs review about what could be done to develop a long-term strategic vision for the nation. Now, if we turn to the universities, what we see that this is a government that once again is silent silent when it comes to the issue of our public institutions such as the universities. The small handouts I acknowledge are there for the private higher education providers, the private higher education provider, but for the universities it's a $400 million reduction, a reduction which have seen the uh, loss of jobs over this uh, last uh, year or so, what, what 17,000 jobs have been lost from our universities, and uh, there's some revenue falls of in the order uh, of, uh, I think, uh, finding now nearly $2 billion. What we're seeing, of course, is the government forcing upon the universities uh, no plans in terms of future research funding. There was, in the least in the last uh, government uh, budget, uh, measures to have a temporary support for a $1 billion in terms of research funding. That, of course, is not continued in this budget. What we see, of course, is that this uh, glimmer of hope, some would say, about the measures such as the 0.5, the half a million dollars a year over two years for PhD completions and for industry placements. Well, you know what that amounts to? That amounts to 36 PhDs. 36 PhDs in a country of this size and of this uh, an economy of this. Uh, this, with the problems that we face. 36 PhDs. That's the sort of measure this government claims is its contribution to trying to understand how serious our problems are. And of course, when we deal with the issues of our science uh, program, we note that, for instance, that it's where the universities are being major contributors to our research effort. 
They undertake, of course, some 35 per cent of all the research in Australia, which makes them amongst the highest in the world in terms of the OECD figures. They perform some 43 per cent of all the applied research in this country. They do, in fact, provide more research support uh, than, than the private sector from industry. They provide some 90 per cent of all the discovery. That is the basic research in this country. Now, it's a pretty fundamental proposition. You cannot have commercialisation of research without uh, the development of basic new discoveries. There can't be. There can't be commercialisation without new discoveries. But this is a government that seems to have lost sight of that simple proposition, a simple proposition that anyone that has any real understanding of the way in which higher education works, how research policy works, how we would actually talk about understanding the relationship between the government of this country and such an important sector as our tertiary sector, our tertiary higher education sector, what it should be doing in the circumstances such as this. Now, you would have thought, with the amount of money this government is throwing around to secure its own political survival, that they might have been able to develop some understanding uh, in the time. But what have they done instead in terms of science, innovation? They put Mr Porter in charge, where we can hide him in plain sight to try to uh, deal with the difficulties the government's faced on that front, rather than develop the types of coherent programs that actually needed to secure the future of our industrial capabilities in this country. Now, I would have thought this was an opportunity that's gone begging, an opportunity where the government should have been able to address the fact that our universities are facing this revenue shortfall of some $2 billion that rises to a $3 billion. We should have been able to face the fact that 17,300 jobs have been lost, as the university said would be done. Uh, rather than uh, reducing the support for universities, one would have thought the government might have paid attention to what the cost is to the university system of such blatant neglect. Now, Professor Frank Larkins and Ian Marshman at the University of Melbourne, the Centre of Study of Higher Education, have reviewed the annual reports of Victorian universities, and they have tabled uh, that in the state parliament. Now, what they've indicated in the state of Victoria alone, 7,500 jobs have been lost in Victorian universities in the last year. That's a total of 14 per cent of their staff numbers. Their cuts have been heavily concentrated amongst casual staff and have staff on fixed-term contracts. Now, they're the staff that are actually in the lowest incomes. They're the staff with the least protections in employment. Now, three universities at RMIT, at La Trobe and at Victoria have cut staff in excess of the cost of revenue. Professor Larkins and Professor Marshman expect there will be more job losses, and how many more will depend on how long the borders remain closed. Now, we know the situation is very simple as this, that the fact that international education is worth enormous, uh, enormous value to this country. Uh, we see that in terms of the long-term investment to, to the universities, we have, as a parliament, Across the board, we have said to the universities, we're not going to be able to fund you to the extent that you need to. This has been on a bipartisan basis since the period of the, the late 80s. We've said you have to rely on internet, your own sources of income to make up the difference. And now the situation has arisen because of the pandemic that international students' have dry, have, have, uh, numbers have, dry, have blown up. So the universities are now faced with a situation not of their own making, but of the policy decisions that this parliament has made that they're now left in a very parlous position. And what do they get in terms of support from this government? Nothing. They get, in fact, reductions. They get hostility. They get abuse. And if it's not just in terms of their financial support, it's attacking them for what their international connections. Now, on the one hand, the universities have reductions in their funding, but on the other hand, other agencies, other government companies like ASPE, are able to uh, secure funding with no calms, no competitive tendering, no arrangements made for a proper assessment, no peer review of their research, no, uh, as I say, no competitive tenders or performance appraisals. 
They produce, of course, low-quality non-peer reviewed research, which, of course, is then used on the front pages of various Murdoch newspapers to run assaults upon academics, to run uh, McCarthyist smears. And the circumstances arises where ASPE now has some 35 per cent of its funding from the Department of Defence, 32 per cent from various other federal agencies, and then other fundings provided for various events that they undertake, all, of course, without any questions being asked. And of course, substantial sums of money from foreign governments, and allowed then to use that money to attack the universities because of their alleged associations with other governments. Uh, of course, this is a cap that's not turned off. But of course, this is when it comes to the public universities, we see a very, very different approach indeed. We, of course, we note the situation in other science agencies. Minimal support there, minimal support for ANSTO, some capital monies for the CSIRO, for the other science agencies. It is very much at the edges. But for the cultural institutions, there is, of course, money for just about every one of them, except the National Archives. Not a cent. Not an extra cent there. Despite the fact that the National Archives are now faced with a situation where they are clearly in breach of their statutory obligations because they're not able to fund their activities, where extraordinarily significant historic records are under threat, and what has the government done to, in response to it? Nothing. Why? How do they explain that? How can they even provide even an elementary explanation of their failure in that regard? What, there are no votes in the National Archives? Or is it just part of our history that we don't mind seeing wasted, demolished, removed? It is a very I think it is an extraordinary dereliction of duty. And given the amount of effort that's been put into the Tune Review, I find it an amazing proposition that the National Archives is not being able to be provided with any support, particularly in the context when every other cultural institution in the Commonwealth is able to, under Commonwealth responsibility, is able to secure support, but not nothing for the National Archives. So I say in general terms, this is a government that, frankly, is only interested in securing its future, not securing the future of the nation. This is a government that is seeking not to address these fundamental problems, like, as I say, the point that we are now have a percentage of our research and development as a, as a, in terms of our gross expenditure on R&D, our share of 1.8 per cent is roughly half of our major competitors, where we see a situation where the People's Republic of China are increasing their R&D to the point where they will be able to double their effort within 10 years, but we are languishing behind countries throughout this region because we have no coherent plan. We have no strategy to deal with what is the government says is its interest in building a national capability. We have no strategic plan to be able to develop the manufacturing capabilities of this nation. And surely we would have understood when we went into the, the, the pandemic where we couldn't even have enough face masks built in this, made in this country. We couldn't build the ventilators. We couldn't build the elementary and, and rather simple devices needed to secure the health of this nation. We can't now uh, see anything from this government to demonstrate that they've learned anything from that failure. And yet what we've got is our competitors around the world grasping the opportunities that of course they present themselves, and they are dealing with these problems in an entirely different way. Now, this is a government that is obsessed, of course, with the marketing, with electoral fortunes with ensuring that it is able to overcome political problems by throwing large sums of money at any particular matter. 
It has no plan, however, for the long-term future of the nation and has no real interest in institutions like our universities, the National Archives or many other agencies that actually we require to build that future and secure the capabilities that the nation desperately needs so that we can ensure the prosperity for the people of this country and can ensure that we do take our rightful place amongst those international competitors that are um, cle clearly moving ahead of us in leaps and bounds. Thank you, Senator Carr. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. And firstly, I'd like to thank all of those senators that have contributed to this debate. These additional estimates appropriation bills seek authority from the parliament for the additional expenditure of money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Passage of the bills will ensure continuity of government programs, commencement of new activities agreed by the government since the 2020-2021 budget and the Commonwealth's ability to meet its obligations for the 2020-2021 as they fall due. Details of the bills were considered in the additional estimates process and I commend the bills to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. I understand that there is a second reading amendment uh, moved by Senator Walters. Uh, is that the case? Uh, Senator Steele John? Yes, that is the case. Uh, it's a second reading amendment. I think it's in the name of, of Senator McKim it is in on behalf of the Senator Australian McKim. Greens. Um, do I need to move that now? Or, or? It's been moved, Senator Steele John. So I'll put the question that the second reading amendment. Uh, uh, moved by Senator McKim on behalf of the Australian Greens uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. No? The, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, the question now is that the second reading as amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Appropriation Bill number 3, 2020-2021. Appropriation Bill number 4, 2020-2021. Sorry, Minister, did you have something? Minister? Minister? Uh, I move that the Senate approves the advances provided under the annual appropriate. No. Uh, I move that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Clark. I am advised, uh, Senator Steele John, that under uh, 1154, uh, that the process has already been, they've been examined as part of the estimates process, and so that unless there are amendments circulated as part of the Committee of the Whole, then um, the process that we've undertaken is the appropriate process. Thank you. Uh, Clark. Appropriation Bill number 3, 2020-2021. Appropriation Bill number 4, 2020-2021. Government Business Order of the Day number 2, uh, consideration of a report on advances under the Annual Appropriation Acts. Minister. Thank you. I move that the Senate approves the advances provided under the Annual Appropriations Act for the year ended 30 June 2020. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Ah, I understand Senator McAllister. Sorry, Senator Patrick, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, I might seek advice from the clerk as to whether I can move um, the, or give notice in accordance with precedence at this time, or, is it, or have we moved into the next session of business? It's moved into it, but with the concurrence of the chamber, uh, we could deal with that. We, 
We're in the bill now, so Senator Patrick will deal with that later. Okay, so we're now dealing with uh, the Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I appreciate the opportunity to make a contribution to the Mutual Recognition Bill 2021. I want to start by stating Labor's strong opposition to the government's management of this piece of legislation. This chamber functions on norms and principles, and the rules and processes of this chamber are there not for our advantage, but to facilitate the business of the Australian people. That's not the approach today taken by the government. That's all been thrown out the window. This is a government that is willing to play games on a bill that is complicated, a bill that might impact on the lives of ordinary Australians, but is not being dealt with through the norms and principles that we ordinarily observe. Before each sitting week, a document titled Draft Legislation Program for the Senate is circulated to senators and staff and outlines the week ahead and it allows the parliament to adequately prepare for debate on bills that will be before this chamber. This week, that document, the Draft Legislation Program for the Senate, was circulated very late, very late indeed on Monday morning. Was this bill on it? Nowhere to be seen. In fact, the very first time, the very first time that opposition senators heard that it would be coming on for debate today was last night. This is a complicated bill. It is Labor's view that a bill of this kind ought to be referred to a Senate committee for examination. Not a long examination, but enough time to get into the detail. And that is what the Senate is here for. This is a House of Review. It's a place where we inspect, interrogate, we clarify aspects of legislation before we make them laws. And I think everyone in this place would acknowledge that the collaborative nature of that process often means, often means that real shortcomings are identified in that process and remedied before bills pass into law. Now, Labor took this position, a very straightforward position, to the responsible assistant minister, the member for Tangney, Ben Morton, and he gave us his word that this bill would be referred to a Senate committee for inquiry. So imagine our surprise today when the bill is listed for the debate to be pushed straight through. Apparently this minister's word means absolutely nothing. So we've been ambushed here today by the Morrison government, who've gone back on their commitment and tried to jam through a piece of legislation with no prior warning and against all of the norms and processes of this place. And what is all this for? Well, those opposite, apparently, apparently, and it is for them to explain this, consider the Mutual Recognition Bill 2021, and I quote, an urgent matter. Well, that will utterly confound all Australians. What does this government actually think is an urgent matter? Apparently not bushfire recovery. That's not urgent. The summer of 2019-20 was one of the worst bushfire seasons on record, and yet those opposite, the Liberal government, has not spent a single cent of their regional recovery partnerships fund to help communities rebuild after bushfires. Perhaps stopping cruise ships from entering Australia at the start of the pandemic. That may have been considered urgent. But no, the Ruby Princess was allowed to arrive duly in Sydney because the federal government failed to do their job. And the result was hundreds and hundreds of active COVID-19 cases spilling out into our community. It's not urgent, apparently, to bring stranded Australians home. 40,000 Australian citizens suffering around the world, many of them in India, because Scott Morrison has refused to implement a proper national quarantine program. And it's certainly not urgent to vaccinate Australia. Our vaccine rollout has been such a failure that we are left staring in envy at countries like Mongolia, El Salvador and Suriname, whose governments got right what our government has got so very, very wrong. So what on earth is so urgent about this bill? So urgent that the government didn't know that it was a priority on Monday or even yesterday morning or yesterday afternoon, but something that became very, very urgent last night something that was so urgent that they'd lie to the Labor Party, go back on their word and break the norms and processes of this place to jam it through. What is it that is so urgent? Well, they won't tell us. They won't tell me. They won't tell Labor. And they won't tell the Australian people. And that is the problem with this government. It's all a game to them. 
They don't keep their promises, they don't follow the rules, and they don't deliver. Scott Morrison is not on your side. Scott Morrison is all about himself. He doesn't really care about you or your family. He's not interested in what you want or need. He's not on your side. He is only in it for himself. And the Morrison government have pulled a very shonky manoeuvre here. They didn't warn the chamber this bill would be brought on this week. They lied to Labor when they agreed that this bill would be referred to an appropriate Senate committee so it could be investigated. If they can't run the Senate, what hope is there that they can run the country? If the Morrison government can't tell the truth on a bill like this, how can you trust a single word, a single word in their budget papers? If they can't tell you on Monday what they're doing on Wednesday, how can you have any confidence in their COVID vaccine rollout or their COVID recovery plan? The proof is in the pudding because we've seen what they deliver over eight long years. The truth is you know you can't. You can't trust them because eight long years of this tired, stale Liberal National Government have shown that they have nothing to contribute. They are nowhere and they stand for nothing. They are big on tricks. But you need to ask the question, why would they go to such lengths to lie and obscure what their agenda was this week? What is in this bill that requires hiding? What is in the fine print that they want to jam through the parliament before it can be discovered by senators on a legislation committee? What is in store for Australian workers? If it's Scott Morrison's idea, you know it can't be good. The Prime Minister has spent over a billion dollars on advertising. That is a billion dollars on self-promotion from an ad man prime minister who would celebrate the opening of an envelope if he could. He loves a big photo op, loves a big announcement. So why so quiet on these details? Why being rushed through? The reality is that this is a prime minister who is all about himself. He doesn't really care about you or your family or your livelihood. And when things go well, and admittedly that is harder and harder to catch him on such a day, He's the very first to take credit. But when things go wrong, he doesn't take charge or responsibility. Bushfires, straight to Hawaii. Don't hold a hose, mate. COVID-19, well, that's for the premiers to deal with. Vaccines, the EU's fault. If this bill is so wonderful, why is it being jammed through like this? What is in this bill that he doesn't want to advertise? If this was good news for the Australian people, We'd know about it. The management of this bill suggests otherwise. Scott Morrison is not interested in what you want or need. He's not on your side. He's only in it for himself. He would rather play games with the chamber than be upfront about whatever scheme is being cooked up here today. Part of our frustration stems from the fact that Labor does not want to dismiss this bill out of hand. Labor supports the principle, of course, of allowing workers to move around in the country in pursuit of work and have their qualifications recognised. We acknowledge that all states and territories have provided consent to the Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill, including Victoria, which has stated that this provides significant reform. And we also acknowledge the concerns of unions, including the ACTU, who have flagged that this bill may have unintended consequences and cause issues for workers because of a lack of national standards. That is why we want to send the bill to inquiry. Labor seeks to be cooperative on any measure that makes it easier for Australians to secure good jobs, including giving workers the opportunity to move around the country, maintain the ability to work in their chosen profession or trade. But we have to ensure that there are not unintended consequences that would negatively impact workers or the standard of work that they perform. And that's why we will be moving a second reading amendment in this place to refer the bill to the appropriate committee for inquiry as we were promised by the Morrison government. And if they won't let us investigate the nuts and bolts of this bill, then we will be forced to oppose it. And I repeat again in closing our strongest condemnation of the actions of the Morrison government here today. And I ask the crossbench to carefully consider our amendment and to support it so the Senate can do its job. Thank you. Uh, Senator McAllister, do you want to move that second reading amendment? Yes, I seek to move the amendment now, Madam Thank Deputy you. President. Senator Faruqi.
Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Mutual Recognition Amendments Bill 2021 on behalf of the Greens. And from the outset, I'd like to indicate that the Greens will support the referral to the inquiry so that the extensive issues with the legislation can be given due consideration, as Senator McAllister um, just there told us in very clear terms. And frankly, the government here has an opportunity to fix those extensive issues that have been highlighted by so many across the board uh, before the Senate actually considers this legislation again. Um, so, you know, if the government has kind of any, um, I guess, sense, then they would, they would really consider referring the bill to the inquiry. And I understand that that was an agreement that was already had, and somehow the government's reneged. Not a surprise to me at all. Um, but I do want to go to the crux of the bill as well and just highlight again to the government why this needs to go to an inquiry and why there needs to be more scrutiny um, than just a few hours' notice of this bill coming up. No one in the sector actually knew that this bill was going to come up today either. And as my colleague Adam Band reflected in his contribution to this bill in the other place, it takes a particular kind of arrogance and incompetence to take a really good idea and turn it into something that's a potential threat to people's safety. And that's what this bill is at the moment, and that's why it needs to be taken off the table, needs to be re-looked at. You need to go back to the table, rewrite this bill, and make it something that is useful and helpful to people, not a potential threat. But of course, regrettably, here we are. This is where we find ourselves. It's so typical of the Morrison government that they would strike upon a principle everyone supports, being able to take your qualifications and work in other states, and find a way to make it a deregulating race to the bottom that creates more risks than it does rewards. In voicing our opposition to this lazy, wrong-headed attempt at implementing mutual recognition, and in my capacity as education spokesperson for the Greens, I want to particularly highlight the risks that legislation in its current form poses to teachers around the country. In their analysis of the bill that the government rushed through the House of Representatives in March and is now rushing through the Senate today. Um, in their analysis, teachers and their union identified no fewer than seven critical issues with the automatic mutual recognition processes that the bill establishes. First, it creates a burdensome duplicate mutual recognition process. The appeal of automatic recognition is that it is just that, automatic. But the system the government has set up means that mandatory vulnerable persons and public protection checks will have to apply to teachers before they can rely on mutual recognition. Checks which are vital and form a part of the existing non-automatic mutual recognition arrangements. So what's being created here is, in the Australian Education Union's words, a parallel, costly, confusing and redundant regulatory burden on teachers and the education sector. Second, the automatic recognition process in this bill foists the burden of these checks onto the jurisdiction where a teacher is trying to work while forbidding them from raising fees related to that teacher's registration and not offering any new funding to support these checks. The practical consequence of this is state teaching regulators, instead of pursuing their important work of enforcing child safety and professional standards, will be obliged to divert resources into checks that they aren't funded to perform. Over time, this will only erode the core work of these agencies. Next, the AEU notes that where an automatic deemed registration is cancelled or suspended for any reason, including innocuous reasons such as teacher choosing to cancel their registration, the teacher regulator responsible for oversight of that ADR must notify all other state and territory regulators including regulators unrelated to where a teacher teaches or intends to teach. What does this mean for teachers and their state and territory regulators? It means that instead of a careful system that ensures vital information relevant 
to child protection and professional standards is shared between jurisdictions as appropriate, we will end up with regulators producing endless copious reports that occupy resources and provide little signal amongst the noise to the receiving regulators. Fourth, because an automatic deemed registration under the proposed scheme won't appear on searchable teachers' registration databases, the Liberals are creating a situation where individual principals and school administrators will have to manually investigate whether there are any conditions or red flags on a prospective hires registration in another jurisdiction. This is not something that we should be expecting individual schools to do. Naturally gives rise to the risk of it not being done with due diligence and is of course something that is more carefully considered that is a more carefully considered scheme could have dealt with. Fifth, teachers are concerned that the powers granted to the federal, state and territory ministers to decide whether or not teachers are subject to this scheme, and I quote, inappropriately expands the role of ministers in the governance of the education profession, bypassing the appropriate state and territory regulators and politicizing the regulatory function. Sixth, this bill creates a race to the bottom of professional standards between jurisdictions. We should have a national focus on lifting teaching standards and creating consistency of registration requirements like fees and professional development between jurisdictions. Instead, this bill leaves open the possibility of a worker who hasn't cut the mustard in one state going shopping for a state with lower standards that will let them register before moving straight back to the state with higher standards. Once again, it's clear the government hasn't appropriately thought through how this will work in practice. And finally, teachers rightly identified this as a missed opportunity for positive reform. We should be on a unity ticket in this place, calling for safe and efficient movement of teachers between states to address shortages and ensure we have the staff needed to support students and families wherever they may be. It's incredibly frustrating that instead of a targeted scheme to achieve those goals that have been voiced time and again by teachers and state registration bodies that the government has brought us here today and to this. In light of these concerns raised by, the, by Australia's teachers, I will be moving a Committee of the Whole Amendment to exclude them from the operation of the mutual recognition processes established by this bill. I hope the Chamber will support this sensible step for teachers if this bill actually does go ahead today, which I hope it doesn't, and that it is referred to the inquiry. I also hope that the government will take the opportunity to do the real work on improving existing mutual recognition arrangements before coming back here with suitable legislation. Unfortunately, it would be some small comfort if the problems with this bill I identified today were applicable only to teachers and excluding them would actually fix the bill. Regrettably, the same issues affect other professions who will be regulated by the bill. As the Greens raised in the other place, and as the ACTU and its member unions have made abundantly clear throughout the legislative process so far, the Greens will oppose the bill, but I do hope the government sees sense and refers this bill to an inquiry. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be able to stand up and talk to this mutual recognition amendment bill. It's quite interesting to hear what the, the Labor side have to say about it, Senator McAllister. And um, it's about tradies, it's about workers, it's about being, a, being able to go across the borders and to do work in times of national disasters or if they've got to move across for, say there's a, a housing boom in an area, so it gives them the ability. And the whole fact is, I can't understand why they're not supporting the workers of this nation. Is it because, let me know, is it because the unions are pushing you and telling you this has to, they're not really happy with it? Is it going to affect their membership? Is it going to have an impact on the unions? Is that the real reason behind all this, that you're putting up this objection and you say it's going to affect lives? My, my estimation of the bill, it is going to actually assist people to move freely, more freely across the borders to actually access work. And another thing you haven't said is that this has been passed by the National Cabinet. 
That is the state and the federal government. That is Labor in Queensland, Labor in Victoria. They have supported this. And you're saying, oh, we should, we should know more than what they know. We need to send this to an inquiry. inquiry. We need to know about the nuts and bolts of all this. All I ever hear in this place is about getting rid of the red tape. This is, this is about getting rid of the red tape. And you're putting up a barrier that you want to have an input into it? No. I'll tell the Labor Party it's all about the unions. You want to appease your unions. You're not worried about the workers out there that need to get on and get the job done. To instead of filling out forms, it's got nothing to do with their work ethic. They have the, the ability, they pass their, their courses, they are qualified workers to be able to do the jobs. And when we have national disasters in different states, they then have the ability to cross the borders. We are one nation and they can actually cross the borders and go and do their jobs. So the, um, the comments today, I just shake my head at Labor. I really do. It's all about appeasing your um, cohorts, the unions, to ensure that you're trying to do their job for them. It's not too often a bill comes before the Senate with bipartisan support from both Labor and the Liberal governments. But in this instance, the Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill has managed to unite both sides of politics. And the National Cabinet should be congratulated on finding some common ground on this bill. In my home state, we've seen a significant housing boom of the back, off the back of people fleeing COVID-prone states, not to mention the, national, the natural weather events that happen from time to time throughout Queensland and require considerable manpower to repair and rebuild. And it's for this very reason One Nation has taken a favourable stance on supporting Australia's tradies, who up until this point have faced a level of difficulty or red tape, as most people would commonly refer to it, venturing across state borders to work on a job sites. I strongly believe this bill will also assist rural and regional communities that are struggling to attract tradespeople to, compete, to complete jobs in those regions. Throughout the last 12 months, I've seen hailstorms rip through central and southeast Queensland, which have resulted in tens of thousands of insurance claims for new roofs and various other repair work. The truth is, there's so much work in these regions that we've required tradespeople, including plumbers, electricians and builders, to come across the border from the other states to get families back in their homes so they can return life to normal following these natural events. I'm pleased to note that the Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill does not seek to water down the state's laws and conditions. Tradespeople will be subject to disciplinary actions and compliance surrounding each of their trades, which prevents rogue operators. The amendments will also block tradies evading workplace health and safety, environmental protection and animal welfare conditions. The automatic mutual recognition of trade qualifications will benefit over 168,000 workers, which has the potential of increasing economic activity by up to $2.4 billion over the next 10 years. I'm only disappointed this bill does not and cannot amend the heavy vehicle national law that would otherwise reduce the regulatory burden on truck operators. Australian truckies should know that I did raise this issue with the government in the hope this bill could rectify the majority of problems our transport industry faces. But unfortunately, the bill will only apply to truck licences that transport explosives. We have a lot of work ahead of us in the transport space, but after speaking with Ben Morton, Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and others within government, they have assured me that they're happy to continue working with me in One Nation to reduce red tape in this area. So you see, this is going to actually help 168,000 workers, the potential of increasing 2.4 billion over the next 10 years into the economy, economic activity. Why would what Labor oppose that? I'll go back to my question again, what I asked. And if, and if Senator McAllister will tell me, how much input did the unions have into this to assure that you had to send it to an inquiry? Surely the facts speak for themselves 
There is no need to send to an inquiry. We just need to pass it and let, let common sense prevail and let the workers of Australia get on and do their jobs. Fear mongering again from the Labor Party, that's all it is. Fear mongering again. And the theatrics of the whole lot saying that this is going to have a, an impact on workers in Australia. No, it may have an impact on the unions, but not on the workers of Australia. So One Nation will gladly be supporting this bill and congratulations to the government working with the National Cabinet and Premiers of the State who know what is happening in their states. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President, and I thank all senators for contributing to the debate in relation to the Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill 2021. And in particular, can I acknowledge the, uh, the speech and the comments made by Senator Pauline Hanson? And in particular, Senator Hanson, as you said, uh, this bill is the culmination of efforts by National Cabinet, uh, the Council on Federal Financial Relations, and officials from the Commonwealth, states, and territories. You are indeed correct uh, that that is what the bill is a culmination of. And as a result of the efforts of the National Cabinet, the Council on Federal Financial Relations, and officials from the Commonwealth, states, and territories. Uh, last year, in fact, in December 2020, as you know, Senator Hanson, the Prime Minister, State Premiers and the Northern Territory Chief Minister signed an intergovernmental agreement to implement a uniform scheme for mutual recognition from the 1st of July 2021, and that is, of course, uh, this year. Uh, Madam Deputy President, automatic mutual recognition, or AMR, as it has been referred to, uh, will deliver an estimated $2.4 billion in economic activity over the next 10 years. The Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill 2021 will save licensed workers time and money uh, when they want to work in other states. It is important to address some of the comments that have been made by uh, both Senator McAllister on behalf of the opposition and Senator Faruqi on behalf of the Australian Greens. It is important we pass the bill today for the scheme to commence, as agreed, as I said, by the National Cabinet, by State, and, uh, state Premiers and the Northern Territory Chief Minister uh, on the 1st of July. Uh, and we need to do this to cut red tape, to keep the economy moving, but of course uh, to provide job opportunities uh, for the 168,000 workers who will benefit from automatic mutual recognition each year. Australians living in a cross-border region will benefit every day, uh, and communities will be better supported to respond and rebuild following natural disasters. Uh, the government, I do foreshadow, will move minor and technical amendments to the bill to ensure that the scheme will be implemented as intended. Uh, the government does not agree, and again, just to address the comments that have been made uh, by Senator McAllister on behalf of the opposition and Senator Faruqi on behalf of the Australian Greens, uh, the government does not agree uh, that a Senate inquiry uh, is necessary. Uh, that is because the bill that we have presented to the Australian Senate already reflects extensive public consultation uh, and the Commonwealth and state and territory governments have actually worked collaboratively, and I commend the Assistant Minister uh, Ben Morton on this, to develop and deliver this important reform from the 1st of July this year. Uh, these governments have committed to work together on implementation, uh, with the Morrison government announcing $11 million over three years in the 2021-2022 budget to support the implementation of these important reforms. Industry groups, unions, regulators, uh, they have all expressed broad support for the intent and the framework of automatic mutual recognition. And their feedback has indeed improved the bill to strengthen oversight by regulators and protect workers and the public. Automatic mutual recognition uh, will make it simpler, quicker and less expensive for business and registered workers to operate across Australia and help better use the skills of the Australian labour force. Uh, and again, can I just reconfirm for the Senate? As Senator Hanson said, this bill is the culmination of efforts by the National Cabinet, that is literally state uh, parliament, not all of the same political persuasion, the Council on Federal Financial Relations and officials from the Commonwealth, State and Territories. As a result of the work that has been done between those bodies, the Prime Minister, State Premiers of both political persuasions and the Northern Territory Chief Minister signed an intergovernmental uh, inter agreement to implement a uniform scheme 
for automatic mutual recognition from the 1st of July 2021. Uh, and with those comments, I do commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator. I think uh, Senator McAllister has moved a second reading amendment, so I think we will deal with that now. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator McAllister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No, Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. 
question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator McAllister be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 29. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative as the votes are equal. I will now put the second reading. The question is the bill will be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith tell off the ayes, Senator Ciccone tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 27. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Senators, before I move to the committee stage, I've just received a request from a senator, in this case a minister, to bring someone into the advisor's box who relies upon a service animal. Uh, I understand this has not happened before, but with the concurrence of the Senate, I plan to allow that. I call the clerk. For an act to amend the Mutual Recognition Act 1992 and for related purposes. I'm waiting, uh, Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just have a few questions for the Minister. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, Minister, um, what? Senator Faruqi, sorry, I was momentarily distracted. So just let me put the formalities. Um, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Uh, there being no objection, it is so ordered. And Senator Fruki, please continue. Um, thank you, Minister. What is being done, Minister? What is being done to address the concerns of electricians that this bill will undermine the work, health, and safety of electrical workers? Minister. Uh, Minister uh, Senator Faruqi, uh, at all times the relevant law of the state or in uh, the Northern Territory must be obeyed. If a state government has an issue with electricians uh, under the scheme, they are actually able to exempt them themselves. Senator Faruqi. So, as I said in my second reading speech, that the teachers are really concerned about the implications of this legislation which is being rushed through. And teachers have raised concerns about the different curriculums in each state. What is being done to ensure um, that teachers are aware of the various curriculum requirements of each state and are being supported to teach them when they are teaching in a state they are not registered in? Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, under mutual recognition, a teacher can, st can teach in another state. Uh, but again, Senator Faruqi, and I do know you, are, uh, you are, will be moving an amendment in relation to teachers, uh, my understanding is that, based on the feedback, uh, teachers were supportive uh, of this bill. But again, uh, you are able, as an individual state under the bill, to exempt a category uh, 
of, of industry. Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Uh, Minister, have you read the submission from the Australian Education Union? Minister. Uh, Senator Faruqi, uh, the bill received broad support. There will always be those uh, who, who don't necessarily support a bill, but as I said, the bill itself has received broad support. But in any event, to go to more specifically uh, the issue that you have put on the table, if a state believes uh, that teachers should be exempt, they are able to exempt them. Senator Faruqi. Um, AU submission. Uh, the teachers have raised concerns that this bill will effectively cut funding for state teacher registration bodies because they will have to divert funds to the burdensome parallel registration obligations under this bill. Has the government analysed the cost this bill will have on teacher registration boards? Minister. Uh, well, Senator Faruqi, if I again go to the comments that I made in my summing up speech, uh, this is a bill that has actually been agreed to by uh, National Cabinet. Uh, the Council on Federal Financial Relations and official, officials from the Commonwealth states and territory governments. So, as a result of that, that agreement, this bill has been brought forward. Senator, Senator Faruqi, wait for the call, please. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Chair. Um, that doesn't answer my question. Has the government analysed the cost this bill will have on teacher registration boards? Minister. Uh, Minister uh, Senator Faruqi, I am advised that the, government, the Commonwealth Government has not done that, as we do not have that level of detail uh, from the states. But again, what I would say is uh, the bill is the culmination of efforts by the National Cabinet, the Council of Federal Financial Relations and officials from the Commonwealth states and territories. And indeed, as a result of that work, this scheme has been agreed to and they have agreed that it is uh, implemented as of the 1st of July this year. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Chair. Minister, could you explain the effect of the government's amendments that were circulated just half an hour before this bill came on for debate? Minister. Uh, Senator Faruqi, I assume that you are referring to uh, the amendments that I uh, referred to in my summing up speech uh, when I said that the government is moving minor and technical amendments to the bill uh, that ensure that the scheme will be implemented as intended. Uh, we are simplifying the exemption provisions to provide greater certainty to workers, business and regulators and to ensure a smooth transition, removing the word particular from the criteria for a five-year exemption will clarify that conditions causing a significant risk do not have to be unique to the state declaring a uh, registration to be exempt. Uh, businesses will also have greater clarity during the transition period, with state ministers no longer required to renew a temporary exemption declaration six months into the rollout. Uh, the government is also proposing technical updates to definitions in the bill uh, to ensure consistency with state legislation relating to the Mutual uh, Recognition Act 1992 and uh, to allow time for the legislative processes uh, to be completed. Uh, the government is updating the commencement date to be a day fixed by proclamation. Uh, as I said to you, though, they are minor and technical amendments. Senator Faruqi. So, thanks, Chair. Minister, you're giving up on your own July 2021 deadline through these amendments, is what I understand. When does the government anticipate the states will implement this? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Faruqi. I am instructed uh, from the 1st of July this year. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Chair. Minister, what is being done to address the concerns of um, construction workers that this bill will not undermine their work, health and safety? And I understand that you said that um, you know, state laws apply, but 
their concern is that this bill actually undermines that. Minister. Uh, well, Senator Faruqi, and thank you for that acknowledgement of my previous answer in terms of uh, state safety laws will apply, and uh, should a particular state wish to exempt, in this case, say, construction workers, as you have put before the Senate, uh, they are able to do so. But I also do have some additional information uh, that I can provide to you. Uh, automatic mutual recognition builds on and improves the existing mutual recognition arrangements by maintaining existing protections in place nationally and in each jurisdiction, workers must hold a substantive registration in their home state. Workers must comply with the laws of the state they are working in and satisfy financial public protection requirements. Workers will face oversight and disciplinary action consistent with locally licensed workers, which could include financial penalties and license suspension or cancellation. Under automatic uh, mutual recognition, a second state can also require workers to first notify the regulator they intend to work in their particular state. Uh, this protection enables regulators to communicate expectations for interstate workers where needed. Where there remains a significant risk, state ministers, and I think we've already discussed this, uh, can exempt specific registrations for a renewable period of up to five years from automatic mutual recognition. This targeted approach ensures the economic benefits of automatic mutual recognition flow to workers, businesses and consumers, uh, but at the same time addressing significant risks uh, where they arise, and in this case you've put before the Senate uh, construction workers. Uh, automatic mutual recognition will also assist regulators to quickly share information with regulators in other jurisdictions, including where they actually take disciplinary action uh, against licensed workers. And just in terms of the funding that the Australian government uh, has announced, We've now announced $11 million over three years uh, in the recent budget to support the initial implementation uh, of the scheme. This includes $7.5 million in funding that has been provided through the Business Research and Innovation Initiative to find solutions to information sharing challenges uh, faced by the states and territories. This fills a gap in the current arrangements with regulators uh, so they'll be better able to target and manage their compliance and enforcement activities, focusing on high-risk occupations uh, and activities. Businesses and consumers will benefit as non-compliant workers will not be able to access automatic mutual recognition and therefore not be able to work in another state. And I, I hope that information assists you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, just coming back to teachers uh, for a couple more questions. Because automatic registration um, isn't listed on a typical register, this bill creates a situation where individual principals and school administrators will have to manually investigate whether there are any conditions or any red flags on a prospective hire's registration in another jurisdiction. Um, and I'm just wondering if that seems reasonable to you. Minister. Senator Faruqi, I'm instructed that local laws apply. So if there is, for example, a public teacher registration, another teacher would need to register on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in the hands of the Senate. Um, Minister. Uh, well, in the first instance, I would seek leave uh, just to table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to is, this bill. Thank you. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Minister. Thank you. And uh, I would also now move government amendments 1 to 11 on sheet TT120, and I'd seek leave uh, to move them together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, <coughs> Labor is disappointed these government amendments were only circulated uh, this morning. Uh, 
giving us uh, insufficient time to properly consider their, uh, their effect. As such, we have no choice but to oppose them. Thank you, Senator Farrell. So the question is that the amendments as moved by the minister, uh, 1 to 11, on sheet TT120 by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion. I am advised we've just had a revised uh, set of amendments circulated by the government, and I believe the minister is seeking to clarify. No. Forget what I just said. We have the amendments before us. So uh, the question is that um, government amendments one to eleven on sheet double T one twenty uh, by leave. Um, be agreed to, that those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. So again, I'm in the hands of the Senate. I'll, I'll put the I'll report out of committee if no one is seeking uh, the floor. Senator Faruqi. Um, Chair, I just wanted to move the Greens amendments. Yep. Uh, I seek leave to move Green's amendments one and two um, on sheet one two eight five. And are you seeking leave to move them together, Senator? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move them together. And I just remind the Senate um, these are the revised amendments. So, just a moment, Senator Farrell, is leave granted to move them together? Yes, it is. And I'll go to you, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, I indicate the opposition supports the amendments uh, moved by the Greens. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Faruqi? I just wanted to make a quick comment. Sure. Just to say again that it is pretty despicable, the rushed nature of this bill. There was absolutely no need to do that. But we have revised our amendments, given the very short period of time, to make sure that um, teachers, as well as workers who are engaged in building, maintenance, or construction industry activity or an electrical occupation activity are actually excluded uh, from the operation of the mutual recognition processes established in the bill. Um, this reflects workers and unions' concerns with their inclusion in this government slapdash scheme. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And the government will not be supporting the Greens amendment. Um, I am now noting the uh, updated amendment put before the Senate. This would actually completely, totally and utterly exclude these people. And as such, people working in these industries would not be able to avail themselves to the copious benefits that we have been through of automatic mutual recognition. It also fails to properly understand the fact that if any particular state does have any concern, they themselves are actually able to put in place an exemption. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the Greens amendments one and two on sheet one two eight five by leave uh, be those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I uh, believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the Australian Greens amendment, amendments one and two on sheet 1285 by leave be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just wait for the parties to get back to their seats before we put the bill as amended. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Uh, can we ring the bells for one minute? Yes? Yep, ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint order. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Hmm.
order. There being 33 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Report from the Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered the Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill 2021 and has agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the bill will be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Davey tell up the ayes. Senator Urquhart tell up the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 27. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. 
bill for an act to amend the Mutual Recognition Act 1992 and for related purposes. Senator Patrick. President, I give notice that on the next sitting day um, I shall move that the following matter be referred to the Standing Committee of Privileges for Inquiry and Report. Having regard to the matters raised by Senator Patrick in correspondence tabled by the President on 12 May 2021, a whether any conduct of the Secretary of Defence, the former Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, or any other person amounted to an improper interference with the Economics Reference Committee inquiry into Australia's sovereign naval shipbuilding capability, and b if so, whether co uh, any contempt was committed in respect of those matters. Senator Patrick, move to Senator Statements. Senator Fioravanti Wells. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Molan was to have spoken today on the centenary of Rotary in Australia. Given Jim's absence, I'm happy to undertake this task in his stead. I know that Rotary is an organisation that he and other colleagues value and would no doubt associate with my comments today. When Paul Harris started Rotary 115 years ago, I'm not sure he imagined that there would be a club in, every, in nearly every country and that Rotary would become the largest non-religious organisation in the world with over 1.2 million members in approximately 31,000 clubs in more than 166 countries. Just 15 years after the formation of Rotary in the US, clubs were formed in Australia and New Zealand, and so Rotary is now celebrating its centenary this year. In Australia and New Zealand, Rotary has over 32,000 members across 1,284 clubs. Rotarians are committed to the values and spirit of Rotary, values in action that transcend political and cultural boundaries and foster global understanding and respect. And what a year to be celebrating 100 years of uniting people from all continents and cultures who take action to deliver real long-term solutions to our world's most persistent issues. Making a positive difference to the life of one person is a good thing. Making a difference to hundreds or thousands, uh, a community, a country, is another thing altogether. And this is what Rotarians do. Rotary harnesses and develops a value-based, action oriented style of responsibility and leadership. They develop leaders who have the spirit of community at heart, those who are committed to supporting those who need support in their community. This year and beyond is all about sharing Rotary values, knowledge and expertise to make that world a better place. Rotary commands enormous respect from government, business, politicians and the broader community in what they do and how they do it. Rotary delivers more and adds great value to almost everything they do. They give of their time and of themselves as Rotarians, developed and nurtured over 100 years by living their values every day through their actions and support for communities. Rotary has built strong trust and confidence and worldwide recognition. Through this, Rotary has been invited to participate in global initiatives that has that have fostered peace, changed the world, helped communities and families, and fundamentally made a difference to the unique lives of millions of young children, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and much more. On Friday, 10 July uh, last year, the Governor-General, uh, His Excellency David Hurley, and Mrs Linda Hurley officially launched Rotary Centenary, Centenary Year in Australia at Government House in Canberra. During the one-hour event, the Governor-General and Mrs Hurley took part in the passing the baton ceremony. To celebrate 100 years of Rotary in Australia and New Zealand, Rotary is reflecting and celebrating the past, but more importantly looking into the future with many new projects that deliver real long-term solutions. Two major projects that were launched at the event were End Dracoma and Rotary Give Every Child a Future. Australia is the world's only developed country with trachoma, an infectious eye disease that can be prevented with good hygiene practices. Rotary wants a trachoma-free Australia by 2021, its 100th birthday. Rotary Give Every Child a Future will give life-saving vaccines to 100,000 children across the Pacific and ensure generations of children and women are protected against cervical cancer, rotavirus and pneumonia pneumococcal disease. We are all living through an unprecedented time of upheaval, uncertainty and fear, and this is the very global nature 
uh, of uh, COVID uh, that is driving global collaborations. Even during this period of global pandemic, Rot Rotary Australian and New Zealand have projects running throughout our wide geographic community in water literacy, education and health. Rotary is probably best known for its long-standing global collaboration to eradicate polio through the purchase of the polio vaccine and support of social mobilisation to perform immunisation campaigns. As the driving force for more than 30 years, Rotary has spearheaded the efforts to end polio worldwide. Alongside other partners in the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, they have achieved a 99 per cent reduction in polio cases. Rotary members have contributed $2.1 billion and countless volunteer hours to protect more than 3 billion children in 122 countries from this paralysing disease. Today, just two countries continue to report cases of wild polio virus, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Rotary remains committed to ending polio and will raise $50 million per year with every dollar to be matched with two additional dollars through a matching agreement with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. With the infrastructure Rotary helped create to end polio, they have built a lasting global health legacy that is now used to reach millions of children to, to treat and prevent other diseases. This established work on polio is the precursor to Rotary's current work on ending trachoma in Australia and providing life-saving vaccines across the Pacific. Rotary brings together a global network of volunteer leaders um, dedicated to tackling the world's most pressing humanitarian challenges. Its work improves lives at both local and international levels. As we look forward to Rotary's next century of service, I'm confident it will continue to deliver real long-term solutions to the world's most persistent issues. Each year, um, Rotary, uh, as I indicated, contribute millions of dollars and volunteer hours. Rotary promotes educational resources and initiates dialogue about envir environmental sustainability. Rotary has planted over 1.2 million trees and continues to do so to support and lead the movement of sustainability in our local communities. As we know, carbon dioxide is plant food. Plants and trees absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen. Therefore, planting trees and more trees is a very good idea. Rotary clubs across Australia are uniting in their desire to assist families whose lifestyle is at, is at risk, is at risk due to prolonged drought. Clubs are raising money for drought-affected farmers and farm communities to stay viable. Last month, along with my colleague Dr Fiona Martin, the member for Reed, I was delighted to attend a dinner to mark the investiture of the new Rotary Charter to the Rotary Club of Iron Cove. The Rotary Club of Dremoyne was chartered in 1952 and more recently expanded its footprint to include Leichhardt and Balmain. And to reflect this new club, uh, it, ad it adopted the new name of the Rotary Club of Iron Cove. Uh, and the new president, Oscar Jones, was presented with, his, uh, with the new charter by District Governor Warwick Richardson. At the same time, the club recognised the dedicated service given by so many of its long-time members. I would like to take the time in the remaining time uh, I have to look at some of Rotary's activities and some of my patron seats. One such club is the Rotary Club of Wetherill Park, located in the area of the federal seat of McMahon, where I've recently opened a satellite electorate office. Rotary Club of Wetherill Park, like many of the chapters of Rotary Australia, consists of dedicated community-minded local people with a passion for community service and volunteering. The club has recently staged a successful golf day and raised funds for the Autism Spectrum Wetherill Park organisation. Currently, it is looking into undertaking a project to raise money to upgrade facilities at the Brayside Hospital Fairfield. This will provide patients and visitors with a more pleasant experience at difficult times during their lives. Additionally, the Rotary Club of Holroyd, as part of the, uh, this year's Australia Day celebrations, acknowledged the work of frontline and emergency workers, individuals who during flood, fires and COVID gave, themse gave of themselves to their community. In a small yet meaningful gesture, um, the Holroyd Club delivered more than 
20,000 lamingtons to aged care facilities, hospitals, police stations and fire brigade. Rotary District 9675 encompasses much of southwestern Sydney and the Illawarra, where my electorate office is based. It contains amazing community-spirited people from different backgrounds willing to serve. And I'd like to take the opportunity to name just a few of those Rotary chapters and their volunteers. Campsie, Coromel, Dapdo, Granville, Holroyd, Illawarra Sunrise, Liverpool, Liverpool Greenway, Liverpool West, Kembla, West Wollongong, Wetherill Park, Wollongong. Australia has for the last 100 years been a better and richer place because of the contribution of Rotary and Rotarians and the contribution that they have made. It is a unique organisation with an exciting and inspiring future. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, yesterday, Coalition MPs voted to keep the member for Bowman in the parliamentary roles that he had promised to stand down from. Now, the fact that Mr Lamming has gone back on his commitment to stand down is yet a further indictment on him. But it says something about the character of the Morrison government that he was supported in his endeavours by so many of his colleagues. The stories about Mr Lamming's conduct that have been reported are disturbing. They show a pattern of behaviour that ordinary Australians would consider unacceptable and would find uncomfortable. And indeed, that is exactly the words that the women who have been subjected to his conduct have used. An academic who was contacted by him ostensibly about her work said, I began to feel very uncomfortable. She's not alone. A woman who sat next to him on a flight said, I was deeply uncomfortable. I felt like I was trapped next to someone who was just being completely inappropriate, irrespective of their job, being completely inappropriate. A woman who was on an official trip with him said, when we, went, uh, when, we, uh, when we met a new group or went to a new location, it was only the young women he asked for phone numbers, not the men. It was humiliating. I found it embarrassing and stressful to see it again and again and again and again. A teenager who was approached by him in a Taco Bell, said if it was any other person, I would have thought it was a bit weird for a middle-aged man to ask a 19-year-old to add them to Facebook. It wasn't a very comfortable situation. It just felt very forced, and I sort of had to engage with it. I felt very creeped out. Now, these stories came out after it was revealed that Mr Lamming had engaged in a campaign of inappropriate online behaviour against two of his constituents. And the Prime Minister claimed he found the comments Mr Lamming had made to the two women disgraceful. And at that time, he said that they were unacceptable to him. Well, the Prime Minister may have claimed that he found the comments unacceptable, but he can hardly claim that he found them surprising. The former chair of the local branch has said publicly that he tried to warn a senior member of the Queensland State Executive about Dr Lamming long before the pre-selection. Mr Edwards said, we took a two-page document in and we said we have a major problem with this bloke. He popped it in the safe and said, leave it with me. I never followed it up and we never heard anything more about it. And why was that? Well, Mr Edwards suggests, I guess because there was only a one-seat majority at the time and in Canberra they were worried about the repercussions. Well, that decision was years ago. And it's part of the reason that Mr Lamming is still in the parliament. The problem is that the political protection Mr Lamming continues to this day. When the parliament was last sitting and the public pressure was on, the media pressure was on, a spokesperson for the Prime Minister's office said, at the Prime Minister's request, the member for Bowman has issued an unreserved public apology. Well, since then, Mr Lamming has basically retracted most of that apology, and the parts that remain are very far from being unreserved. Mr Lemming used the first day in Parliament to claim he had been misrepresented. And the online behaviour that the Prime Minister said was disgraceful? Well, Mr Lemming now says it is, and I quote, work that I have done on Facebook and responding to the comments of others. Well, it's reported today that Mr Lemming has gone even further in an email to constituents. Unbelievably, unbelievably, he has again attacked the two, women, the two women that he apologised for harassing over Facebook and in his email apparently accuses them of trolling. Well, what about the photograph that he took of a young woman bending over at work? 
Well, according to Mr Lamming, that was an utterly, utterly, entirely appropriate workplace photo. It is sadly unsurprising that Mr Lamming has acted in this way. It is entirely consistent with years of conduct and suggests that his empathy training has not made an ounce of difference. But what we should be angry about, what we should be angry about is that there have been absolutely no consequences for him. If anything, he has been rewarded. Because after all of that, after all of that, yesterday coalition MPs in the other place voted to keep him as a chair of a parliamentary committee that he promised to stand down from. And Mr Morrison has put coalition MPs in a terrible position by asking this of them. Dr Katie Allen has said what Mr Lamming has been doing is completely outrageous. Meanwhile, her colleagues were asked by Mr Morrison yesterday to keep him as chair of the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training. Senator Henderson has said it's a matter for him as to whether he wants to leave the Liberal Party. I am uncomfortable. There's that word again. I am uncomfortable about him sitting in the party room. Well, that's where he is sitting. That's where he is sitting, and he is sitting there because Mr. Morrison has decided to support Mr. Lamming rather than the female members of his own party. It may be necessary for those decent female members, and perhaps for some of their male colleagues, to do more than make a few remarks in the media, because Mr Lamming is clearly waging a war to stay, and he apparently has very senior support. Faced with a choice between Dr Allen, Senator Henderson and Mr Lamming, it is very clear who Mr Morrison has chosen. They are not the only women that he's abandoned. I met one of the women who Mr Lamming was harassing on Facebook, Sheena Hewlett. And Ms Hewlett told me that she is scared that the harassment will continue. At the rally last weekend, Mr Lamming was apparently there, watching, watching a rally about his own conduct. And Ms Hewlett said, I'm scared about what he will do after this. Well, as I said today, it's reported that he's already acted. He's already attacked Ms Hewlett and another of his victims, Ms Russo, in an email to his constituents. And what has been the response from the PM? Absolute silence. Under pressure, under media pressure, happy to say this is disgraceful, this is unacceptable. Well, words are cheap, aren't they? Words are cheap. Because the Prime Minister's actual decisions, his actual instructions to members of the Liberal Party and the National Party shows what conduct he actually is willing to accept. This is what he thinks is appropriate. There are real-life consequences, real consequences to allowing this man to continue in his position of power and to continue to offer him political support and political cover. Mr Morrison, our Prime Minister, has a responsibility to protect women like Alex Rousseau and Sheena Hewlett from continued harassment. And this is a test for him. This is a real test. Because as long as Scott Morrison continues to accept Mr Lamming's vote, this government cannot be taken seriously when it comes to the treatment of women. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President. Virin Drasin Basale is a sailor who, in December last year, was in a ship packed with Australian coal, sitting waiting off the Chinese coast. He missed his five-year-old son at home. Every night I dream about him and I wake up crying in bed, he said. It's easy to talk about the geopolitics, but the reality is that the relationship between the Chinese and the Australian governments has an impact on millions of people. Here in Australia, people in China, and people who are trapped in the middle like Viren Drausen. There's Uyghur Australian, Mahaba Saleh, who was worried sick about her sister in Xinjiang, who is one of the thousands of Uyghurs who have been arrested by the Chinese government on trumped-up charges, and one of the millions who have been detained. There's Osman Chu, who was a very insightful witness before a Senate committee where he was attacked by, Eric, by Senator Abetz. In Osman Chu's words, Instead of being asked about complex issues facing multicultural communities or how Australia could benefit from a more diverse parliament, I was asked by Senator Erica Betts to unequivocally condemn the Chinese Communist Party. I may have Chinese heritage, but I'm Australian, 
I was born here and my family has been here for half a century. This is my home, the only home I've ever known. And there's Alistair Pur Purbrick from Tarbilk Winery in central Victoria, who lost a quarter of his business when Chinese authorities put tariffs of more than 200 per cent on his wine imports to China. There is no doubt that the Australia-Chinese relationship is complex and that it matters for people's lives. The Australian Greens believe that in its international relations, Australia should promote peace, democracy, ecological sustainability, equity and justice, and human rights. And this applies to our relationship with China as it does for every other country in the world. First and foremost, the Greens believe that we should take a human rights-centred approach to that relationship. Under Xi Jinping, oppression in China's authoritarian state is increasing. In Xinjiang, we've seen the horrific cultural genocide undertaken against the Uyghur people, with the detention of up to a million people, forced labour, reports of systemic rape and the widespread destruction or damaging of thousands of mosques. Tibetans have been persecuted for over 70 years by the Chinese government, which has imposed severe restrictions on religious freedom, speech, movement and assembly, and has detained and tortured Tibetan political prisoners. And in Hong Kong, the Chinese government has jailed opposition figures over protests in violation of international law. It's targeted newspapers that take a pro-democracy stance, and it's unleashed police brutality, including pepper spraying, tear gassing and beating protesters. A human rights-centred approach to China means that the Greens will continue to speak out strongly against these abuses and call on the Chinese government to uphold human rights across China for all people. We will continue to call for full, unfettered access for human rights observers, and we will continue to urge the Australian government to do likewise. We will continue to advocate for targeted sanctions against Chinese officials responsible for human rights abuses, as we do for other jurisdictions. And we urge the Australian government to fast-track the development of Magnitsky legislation to provide a framework for this to occur. Now I want to move on to the issue of our foreign policy. Australia needs an independent foreign policy, and that should include renegotiating the US alliance, hitching our wagon to the Trump administration reduced our credibility in the region and undermined our reputation as an honest broker. And a human rights-centred approach to our foreign relations also means rejecting military militarism. The Australian government should not seek to contain China through an increase in our military spending. And ministers, public servants and other warmongering mem members in this Senate and the other place ramping up their re rhetoric is counterproductive. It escalates tensions and it must be avoided. Our ultimate goal in the region should always be the attainment and the maintenance of peace. War is the worst possible outcome to resolve geopolitical tensions and end human rights abuses. Yet it seems like Peter Dutton is determined to throw his weight around 10 minutes into being Defence Minister, with the only result making an already tense relationship with China even worse. Peter Dutton's role is to keep Australians safe, but his aggressive posturing against China is instead putting us all at risk. An independent foreign policy would strengthen our ability to work bilaterally, multilaterally and through institutions to promote human rights. In particular, multilateral cooperation can strengthen Australia's approach on vital issues like targeted sanctions. And crucially, much of Australia's work on the international stage can be strengthened if we improve our domestic policies. While we continue to turn a blind eye to the ongoing injustices and racism suffered by our First Nations peoples and ignore calls for truth-telling and for treaties, while we jail innocent asylum seekers and refugees indefinitely, when we criminalise Australians seeking to return home, we are vulnerable to accusations of hypocrisy on the world stage. And the Australian government can talk about the rules-based order in as many white papers, policy statements and major speeches as it likes, but until we walk the talk, we are continually undermining our credibility. 
Strong multilater multilateral re relationship should mean that we can draw on trade relationships with other countries if China punishes us with trade embargoes. And in fact, it makes a lot of sense to reduce our unhealthy reliance on China and shift away from an extractive economy based around digging things up and sending them overseas. We could and we should be building an economy with a strong domestic manufacturing sector, powered by renewables like green hydrogen as well as knowledge-based industries. However, we should be open to continue working with China on areas of shared interest, particularly relating to strong action on climate change and environmental protection. We have spent a long time in this place debating measures to address foreign interference. The best way to counter undue influence in Australia's political system, whether that be from foreign governments or big corporations, is to get money out of politics. We also need a federal ICAC with teeth that can properly investigate allegations of impropriety and corruption by Australian elected officials. And our universities deserve funding to be able to function effectively on their own without relying on businesses or foreign governments. And we must support Australians of Chinese heritage here at home. We must never conflate the Chinese government with Chinese people or Chinese Australians. We must be loudly anti-racist and fight all attacks against Australians of Chinese heritage, include attacks that include from those within this chamber calling on Chinese Australians to pass loyalty tests. We must support those who are being persecuted by the Chinese government here in Australia who are fearful to speak out because of the impact that ma that may have on family and friends back in mainland China. Transparency and shining a spotlight on alleged and suspected foreign influence are the most effective and optimal ways of addressing these issues. We should note, however, that China isn't the only government that engages in political interference, and we should be criticising all attempts at foreign interference, not having selective debates on this issue. And in particular, we need leadership from government in fighting racism here in Australia. The increased focus on and criticism of China has stoked and fuelled anti-Chinese racism. And I particularly want to acknowledge the work of the Asian-Australian Alliance, per capita, and others in their anti-racism work. Asian Australians must be able to participate freely in all aspects of Australian society without fear of stigmatisation and abuse. As part of that, we call on the government to formally condemn anti-Asian hate crimes and to fund a national anti-racism strategy. A human rights-centred approach to policy is not easy. To genuinely adopt it requires complying with international human rights law in our domestic policies and embracing the change we need to respond to the climate crisis and adopting different strategies bilaterally and multilaterally. But we must do it if we are to live up to our potential as an active, engaged member of the international community, including in our relationship with China. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. A significant period of my professional life and now in Parliament has been dedicated to the cashless debit card program and working to improve the employment outcomes for disadvantaged people across Australia. Now, I've seen the difference that both the CDC and a job makes in the lives of individuals, their children, families and the strength of communities in which they live. I've seen what it's like for someone who gets their first fortnight's salary deposited into their bank account. And I've seen the change in their demeanour when they come home after a day of work and knowing that they're supporting their family and contributing to their community. And I've seen what happens when all of a sudden families can participate in all the wonderful things that the 21st century life provides. It changes them. It creates opportunities. And importantly, it's contagious. As a government, we can and should be backing the same outcomes for more families that are reliant on welfare. The, tash, the cashless debit card is a circuit breaker. It's not a destination, but it's working. For many, it's the critical first step in helping them get ready to enter employment. 
It's designed to rein in alcohol abuse, drug use and gambling, which take hold far too many individuals on welfare payments. It helps to get them back on track and positions them to take up training and a job. Now, If you listen to the loudest voices in this place and online, you'll see uh, what you'll see is hordes of academic and social media activists hell-bent on trying to undermine the ability of a trial site communities to determine their own futures. And based on the, loudest, the loudness of these voices, you would think that if you're a supporter of the cashless debit card, like, like I am, that you'd be run out of town when you go and visit one of these communities. But that couldn't be further from the truth. If you actually get out onto the ground and in these regions like I have and spend time with them and listen to them, what you see is a completely different story. And that's because they can see the change that it's making. Shop owners will tell you that they're seeing a noticeable increase in people pur purchasing groceries, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables, and items for school lunches. Locals will tell you that school attendance appears to be increasing and participation in kids' sport is going up. And the figures of how many transactions that have been blocked on items like alcohol, gambling and attempted cash withdrawals demonstrate just how much money, uh, which would usually be spent on these things, is flowing back into the community. For example, in goldfields alone, we're talking $2.5 million. That's an additional $2.5 million which would have been spent on blocked items that can be diverted to spending on bills and all the types of things that support the families and individuals on welfare. Now, it's important to note as well that this is just the value of the decline track transactions at merchants that would sell these products, not the full value of money which would have been diverted from changed behaviour. People who don't buy those products uh, because they already know that they can't. Now, these results are exciting because they are just the start. But to bolster the impact of the card on the wraparound services which support it, the Morrison government have announced a $30 million job-ready package for trial site communities, which I am very proud to be leading. My primary focus has always been and remains getting people into meaningful, long-term employment, especially in regional and remote Western Australia, where much of our economic growth comes from. And I'm unashamedly self-proclaimed uh, self proclaim myself as the Senator for Jobs. That's my big focus here. And I've seen the difference that a job makes in someone's life. And as I said, the cashless debit card is not a destination. It might be proving to be a more responsible delivery of a welfare payment, but it's not the destination that we want for people that aspire for greater things for their lives and for their families. Every person, no matter where they are in this great country of ours, should have the best possible opportunity to share in the fruits of our economic success. And this package, this $30 million package, will go some of the way to ensure that those who most need the support get the services that they need on the ground. The support that this program provides will be targeted, will be tailored as much as possible to each individual and communities in which they live. Every community has different challenges. They have different needs, different industries, jobs, training and skills demands. We know that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to this challenge. It requires a grassroots and granular approach, and I am confident that the work that we are now doing will pay dividends for these communities. Measures may take the form of additional wraparound services to assist participants to stabilise their lives, to uh, courses to improve skills such as financial planning as well as specific training opportunities to ensure that participants have the skills to capitalise on employment opportunities that exist within the community. We're engaging with employers, finding out from them what skill requirements they have. These are employers that are prepared and willing to provide these opportunities, but they must make sure that individuals have the skills so that they can be productive, so that they can go about their work with the skills that are necessary to complete their jobs and, importantly, to operate safely. And that's why training is so important. The rollout of this package will take uh, all of this into account and actually deliver what each site would want to see. We're listening to the people on the ground and working with them to plug the gaps that locals have too often fallen through. 
There are so many silos that are involved in all the different services and ranges of programs that people engage with. And what we know is that long-term unemployed people, they've actually mastered the art of slipping through the cracks. And there are too many gaps that exist between all the different services and all the different programs that are delivered. And what we need to do is make sure that there's a cohesive, connected system that enables someone to address their barriers to employment, trains them for jobs that actually exist, and connects them with employers so they can take up that meaningful employment. And these are the opportunities that we're creating. Now, I'm not sitting here in my Parliament House office coming up with great ideas and telling people what they need or should be doing, and nor is Minister Rustin. We're actually getting out and listening to people and working to deliver what they want to see and what they believe will work for their regions. Now, along with the cashless debit card, this approach, this approach is well received. What isn't, though, is the loud voices and keyboard warriors on social media and university campuses, those who actually haven't taken the time to engage with communities or generally understand where they're coming from, because if they did, they would see that these communities have tried everything. Many of the challenges that they face are not particularly new. And what we're doing in partnership with them is providing them with the tools that they need to make the change that they want to see in their regions, to empower them to empower them, their hometowns and where they and their families live and often have for many generations communities that they are intensely passionate about improving. And as a government, we have an obligation to taxpayers and those on welfare to ensure that Australia's social security safety net is delivered in a responsible way. The cashless debit card should never be a destination. Welfare should not be a lifelong sentence, and nor should it be the foundation for, so for social or societal issues to develop. So, Along with providing welfare payments, we should also be giving people the tools that they need to get off them. For some of these uh, regional and remote communities, the challenges which in some cases have been around for generations require a bit of out-of-the-box thinking and a new approach. So this further investment will help communities to bridge the gap between welfare and work, putting the measures in place that they believe will work for the, uh, on the ground for locals. It's targeted and it will represent what locals have been telling us that they need. So I thank the Prime Minister and Minister Rustin for giving me the, uh, putting in me the confidence to steer this program, and I commend the government for taking this approach. The future of these regions and the program is exciting. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I've no doubt that Senator O'Sullivan is very genuine in the comments that he makes, but the policy direction from this government on the cashless debit card is completely wrong. And it's a shame, it's an absolute shame that Senator O'Sullivan didn't have the privilege of attending the women's roundtable that I attended last week in the Kimberley, along with Senator Seawitt and Senator McAllister, because the kind of um, deficit model he's talking about, that deficit approach, was completely rejected by those women. And I would challenge him to contact order. the Kimberley Aboriginal order, women order. And, and ask them for a briefing, because what they put forward over the last three days that we attended was completely in opposite to where he's just uh, saying the government is going to go. So the three-day event that uh, Aboriginal women on their own put together because they want to uh, actually pursue a strengths-based approach—didn't hear that from the government today—was attended by over 100 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, 85 from the Kimberley, who gathered in Broome for this history-making roundtable meeting. Women from as far as Halls Creek, Kununurra, Fitzroy Co Crossing, Balgo, Beagle Bay, Derby, as well as groups from the NPY Women's Council in Alice Springs and Waminda Aboriginal Corporation in Nowra on the New South Wales coast were there. It was such an honour, and I'm sure that I speak for Senator Seawitt and Senator McAllister, to be invited to attend this event and observe the historical uh, moment where the Kimberley women decided that they needed their own council. I want to thank Janine Duro, a Nigata woman from Derby, Jodie 
Bell, a Pichella and Jagera woman from the southeast Queensland but has lived most of her life in WA. Mary O'Reary, a Nayunayu descendant living in the Beagle Bay community in Dampi at the Dampier Peninsula. Brenda Garston, a Jaru woman. Sissy Cor Birch, Jaru and Gidja woman. Kia Dow, a Gidja woman from Warnham. I thank the organisers, Beck Harnett, long-time worker with this uh, Straight Talk program, Vanessa Elliott, Jaru woman, Michelle Deschong, who draws her connection to the uh, Kuku Jalani nation, Cherie Sipisado, a Nigger and Bardi woman from the uh, West Kimberley region, Vicky O'Donnell, a Nigger and Mangala woman from Derby, Emily Carter, a Gunayandi Gidja woman, Nina Mills, a Jaru and Benara woman, Cheryl Carmody, Rayanne Pavan, Renee Kujula, Nayamanti Burton, who are directors of the NPY Women's Council. Clonone Wellington, Lisa Wellington, Christine Falzon and Hayley Longbottom and the, uh, the executive team from Waminda. Throughout the three days, we had the privilege of hearing from June Oscar, AO, Banana Woman from Fitzroy Crossing and, of course, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commission at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Commissioner Oscar presented on her groundbreaking report Weigu Tongi, which, uh, and I apologise for my pronunciation, which means women's voices. Uh, that report, released in October last year, was part of a three year initiative that saw Commissioner Oscar and her team travel the country, speaking with over 2,000 2, First Nations women and girls from 50 locations in urban, regional, and remote Australia. This was the most inclusive consultation process of its kind, hearing from senior elders and girls who ranged in age from 12 to 17 years of age, women in prison, pr prison lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transgender, queer or questioning, intersex, asexual, sister girl or brother boy. The report is an expansive whole-of-life report exploring issues through a well-overdue First, First Nations gender lens, ranging from justice to child protection to health to social and emotional well-being, service delivery, housing, disability, access to country and economic participation. It's presented from a strengths-based approach, which was the theme running through the three days for the whole of the roundtable. First Nations women know what needs to change in their communities and have the experience, the knowledge and the wisdom to make it happen. This was stage one. Stage two will be the implementation of the recommendations and responding to and exploring how that can be done. And of course, the Kimberley women are now seeking some funding from the state government in WA and indeed from uh, the federal government. And what they told us very clearly was they want their own table. They don't want a seat at the table. They want their own table and they want government to listen to them. They no longer want things done for them, which is what we heard from the last senator. They uh, know how um, and they described how mainstream systems and structures have marginalised their voices. Um, for generations and how these current systems take a punitive and interventionist response to issues associated with inequalities and conditions of poverty. And if we think that government policy uh, is benign and has no bearing, there was example after example given of how government policy directly discriminates and does damage to Aboriginal women, families and men. Uh, so we know that through government policy, and Cassius debit card is a good example, um, that issues of social harm, trauma, rates of child removal and incarceration are actually made worse. The resounding call from women and girls during the roundtable and Commissioner Oscar's uh, consultation process was the need to embed First Nations gender justice and equality 
across all policy domains from government to organisational levels. And that gender lens and that equality is very different when you hear those women speaking with their powerful voices about how they describe the gender lens and equality. This is the only way to combat and overcome the inequalities and intergenerational harm and trauma. Uh, it will only be achieved through real structural change and systemic reform on a large scale that's based on what First Nations women are saying. The disappointing part of this is I haven't heard the government talk about Commissioner Oscar's report at all. It's groundbreaking. Thirty years was the last time uh, anyone put a report together. It's been presented to government. I don't think there's been a response. I've had a look. I can't find one. So just like respect at work, we find a significant piece of work done by a First Nations woman with First Nations uh, women throughout this country. And what do we get from the government? Silence. No response. That's disgraceful. And yet we have now the government championing yet another new direction with the failed cashless debit card. So the government has had that report for six months. I'm, I would happily put on the record, if I'm wrong, that they've somehow responded, but I haven't seen that response. And of course, what we saw in last night's budget was no new funding for closing the gap. We had this Again, this great delivery from the Prime Minister and the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr Wyatt. Big, this is what we're going to do. We're going to change the landscape. Where's the follow-through? Silence in the budget. Not one cent. Not one cent. So if it hasn't been included in Australia's most important financial statement, what is the government's commitment to closing the gap? What is the government's commitment to listen when women come together in such numbers uh, to say clearly, this is how we want to be responded to? And it was really, um, again, another privilege for me uh, to sit and see those women present to the Aboriginal minister in WA, Stephen Dawson, in such a strong and powerful way. And uh, the minister certainly was given a very clear pathway for him to follow. And as the women said over and over again, we don't want a seat at, a ta at your table. You need to come to our table. And that's what we saw Minister Dawson do, come to their table, which last week was up in Broome. So one of the goals of the round table was to establish the Kimberley Aboriginal Women's Council, an incorporated representative body that will work on behalf of Aboriginal women across the Kimberley, and the women got there. So stage one is now done, but it will need funding. It will need the government to say we support this. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I remind the Senate and all Australians that 24 years ago, Pauline Hanson warned that Australia was heading to a place that we would not recognise as Australia. The media devoted much attention to the immigration aspects of her comments and completely missed the substance. Today we have arrived at the place Pauline warned us about. Australians are living with restrictions on association, restrictions on speech, restrictions on movement, restrictions on protest. We even have mandatory face coverings. Our federation has broken apart. We have seen border checkpoints between states. The phrase papers, please, which has defined tyrants throughout history, is now life for everyday Australians. Our police are, are arresting law-abiding citizens in their homes for the crime of, of organising a peaceful protest. Our police are forcefully arresting journalists for the crime of reporting that protest. Dictators have been overthrown for less. In the famous words traced to French, English and American philosophers Montaigne, Bacon and Thoreau, our leaders today had nothing to fear but fear itself, and they chose fear. The premiers and the prime minister have surrendered power to unelected bureaucrats with medical degrees who have shown themselves incapable of seeing the big picture, incapable of using the data. While social media are calling the COVID restrictions on businesses a war on capitalism, it's much, much more sinister. Corporate Australia have record sales. 
record profits and have paid themselves higher dividends and bonuses. The Liberal National Government sent JobKeeper to these same companies who used the money to pay themselves yet more dividends and bonuses. Now with this budget, the company tax clawback has been extended to 2023 to 2024. Companies making a loss in 2023-24 can claim that loss against tax paid in 2018-19. And the government will give a refund. The taxpayers will give a refund. Let me explain the concept of taxation to the Treasurer. The government is not supposed to take the tax paid by corporate Australia and give it back to them. This money was supposed to pay for the things that define Australia as a caring society. Medicare, pharmaceutical benefits scheme, childhood education and social security. The Treasurer cannot give corporate tax back and then borrow the money to pay for recurring expenditure. Yet that is exactly what this budget does. Debt, debt and more debt to pay for profligate spending, seemingly with no thought to the next generation that will be left to pay for it. This is a budget of which Labor would be proud. When I talk often about the Liberal Labor duopoly, even their budgets are now looking the same. As a result of coronavirus measures, the world's 400 richest people have increased their wealth by over $1 trillion. We do not need to add our taxpayer funding to their wealth accumulation. Much of this wealth is money that was once spent in local communities, in local hardware stores, in community supermarkets, gift stores and greengrocers. Now many of those have been forced to close. Online growth has gone to Amazon, whose owner is the world's richest man. The real outcome from coronavirus measures has been, has been the largest transference of wealth from small business to the elites in Australian history. We expect this sort of thing from the Liberal Party and their sellout sidekicks, the Nationals. But Labor has embraced the politics of fear and cronyism in Queensland, Western Australia and Victoria. Shame on you. Only one nation is committed to restoring a fair go for working Australians. As our motion today on the national curriculum and last sitting on degendered language shows, one nation will continue to defend Australia as a faith-based nation committed to family and community. One nation continues to champion the natural environment. We continue to fight for clean air to fight for clean water, to fight for clean food and to fight for clean medicines. We leave worshipping of the sky god of warming to labour, the Greens and sadly now in their final act of surrender, the Liberal National Party, with their policies contradicting science, common sense and nature. With this budget, the government is borrowing money to increase funding for a fake climate emergency. There's no climate emergency and a gutless pandering to the bedwetters on the left is not in the best interests of Australians. This budget has a black armband view of Australia's future. The projections for the contribution to gross domestic product from agriculture are based on the assumption that lower rainfall will return and agricultural output and exports will decline. According to the government's own research, a drought like this last one has happened 10 times in the last 1,000 years. It was not climate change 1,000 years ago, and it's not climate change now. Cold weather has now overtaken the Northern Hemisphere with widespread, widespread crop failures, reduced harvest and higher prices. This will not change over forward estimates. Natural climate cycles have given our farmers a wonderful opportunity to grow our agricultural sector and exports here in Australia. Foreign influence and ownership in Australia has reached crisis levels, and this budget has done nothing about that. Our ports in Darwin, Melbourne and Newcastle, and much of our power grid in our major cities are now in the hands of a hostile foreign power. Those owners have publicly professed their loyalty not to Australia but to the Chinese Communist Party. And this budget makes no provision for the cost of buying these contracts back. So one can assume then that the government does not intend to act to restore Australian sovereignty over our strategic assets. Our armed forces are incapable of waging war against any serious challenges. Our subs are in pieces. Only one sub is combat ready at this moment. One. The budget continues the new subs project, despite the cost rising to an estimated $200 billion and delivery pushing out past 2030. On the bright side, though, Australia is advancing our space capacity. Later this year, an Australian-designed and manufactured satellite will be launched into orbit from an Australian-designed and manufactured rocket. 
using an Australian launch facility. How amazing is that? This is proof that it is time to get the government out of people's lives and let free enterprise and Aussie ingenuity fix this mess. Starting with withdrawing from the United Nations and their sovereignty sapping, wealth sucking, industry killing conventions that make Australia less, not more. One Nation's alternative budget will recover the freedoms, opportunities and living standards that Australians once enjoyed. One Nation will cancel a submarine contract and purchase nuclear-powered submarines off the shelf to expedite delivery and recover our defensive capability. One Nation will terminate the Clean Energy Fund and the Department of Climate Change while honouring agreements already in place. Every year, Liberal Labor Nationals' climate and energy policies cost Australians an additional $13 billion above their electricity costs. The Liberal Energy Minister recently admits he is afraid for future electricity prices and terrified of losing reliability and stability, and rightly so, he should be. Thanks, though, to the Liberal Na Labor National's policies, starting with Prime Minister John Howard in 1996. One Nation will abolish all energy subsidies for fossil fuel, that's hydrocarbons, except the diesel fuel rebate, and renewables. All subsidies for renewables will end so that free enterprise can build reliable baseload power of whichever type they consider the most efficient. This will restore our productive capacity by breathing life into our devastated industries. One Nation will allow doctors to prescribe Australian medical cannabis to anyone with a medical need. One Nation calls for a national taxation summit to reach agreement on how our taxation system is failing everyday Australians and businesses and destroying our country, and to arrive at solutions based on proven principles. This budget increases the number of public servants by 5,000 over the next 12 months. One Nation will freeze employment numbers in the federal public service and reallocate staff away from virtue signalling and pork barrelling projects into productive pursuits that care for the people of Australia and serve the people of Australia. One Nation will reduce immigration such that our net population growth becomes zero. This will allow infrastructure like roads, hospitals, schools and housing to catch up with the avalanche of migrants that Labor Greens and Liberal Nationals have led into our country over the last 20 years. A net zero population policy will allow, actually allow around 80,000 migrants to still come in each year to replace the 80,000 roughly who leave each year. We would expect 10,000 of those 80,000 incoming to be refugees. This contrasts with a peak arrival rate under Labor, Liberal and Nationals of 275,000 new migrants annually pre-COVID, three and a half times our stable number. The reduction in demand will take the heat out of the housing market and allow everyday Australians some relief from the extreme inflation we are seeing in housing, education, aged care, childcare and medical expenses. One Nation has a vision and is preparing a plan that will turn Northern Australia into a growth engine for the whole country, offering a, a new future for Australians based on agriculture, mining, value adding. More importantly, based on community, getting back to Australian values and Senator economic Robert, fairness. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, today, the drums of democracy are beating loudly for our native forest industry. As this week, a full bench of the federal court upheld the appeal of Vic Forest against the action by friends of Leadbeater possums following the years of uncertainty Justice Mortimer's finding created for the industry. But, no, but although the drums are beating, they're yet to find the rhythm. We need to use the democratic processes available to us in chambers just like this through the Senate to give certainty to our native forest industry and to help them find that rhythm. That's exactly what a private senator's bill uh, in, before the Senate at the moment seeks to achieve, certainty for the native forest industry, to help them get back into business, to stay in business, uh, whilst upholding stringent environmental standards this re in renewable uh, timber industry harvesting provides in this country. We need to be very proud of this industry. We lead the world uh, in timber harvesting that is subject to the most stringent environmental standards. So we can all have confidence that we get the balance right, the triple bottom line uh, that we've been seeking to achieve for so long. To balance the socio-economic outcomes from native forestry has always been the intent of the interaction between regional forest agreements and the federal EPBC Act. And that is what the federal court ruling this week vindicated. 
that forestry operations that are subject uh, to a regional forestry agreement, which is an agreement uh, with state governments, are outside the remit of the EPBC Act, not because they're not subject to stringent environmental regulation, but because they are subject to strict environmental regulation that is written into the regional forestry agreement, that is the state government's uh, job to manage and ensure occurs, so that they are working cohesively in line with the EPBC Act. And this is a framework uh, that many, many timber regions in this country operate under for over two decades. This framework upholds the Commonwealth's strong environmental expectation and delivers for the environment whilst allowing for the sustainable harvesting of timber, creating thousands of jobs. But while green lawfare has been able to be played out, forestry operations have ground to a halt. And we've seen that from militant environmental organisations uh, making false claims and seeking to use the court system to stop the lawful operation of businesses in the timber harvesting industry and putting regional jobs, regional economies uh, at risk uh, for the sake of their ideology. It just doesn't mean we can't get the timber we need. It means there's no sustainable jobs. And these jobs are the ultimate in sustainability. There's no sustainability for the regional communities those jobs support. And they're not just made up of forest harvest workers. Uh, there's haulage drivers, there's the timber mill workers, there's high-tech advanced manufacturing jobs uh, in the timber industry, world-class, something that we should be celebrating. Uh, and I'm looking forward to heading down to visit Ash in Hayfield uh, in southern Victoria uh, next week. The cost is the livelihoods of hard-working people and their families, the demise of regional towns and the loss of investment confidence that the industry that produces the ultimate renewable product, timber. So I know those environmental extremists don't want to hear this, but for every single tree harvested in this country, one is planted, and yes, they take a long time to grow. And look at the product you get. Look at all around here in this uh, place we get to work. It is beautiful, beautiful Australian uh, hardwood. The implications are far-reaching from the ambiguity that Justice Mortimer's decision created. Bunnings stopped selling timber logged by Vic Forests claiming that the timber was illegally logged. Well, the decision by the federal court, unanimous this year, this, this week, sorry, uh, makes that an absolute furphy. Imagine if Bunnings was forced to close their warehouse on the back of a judge misinterpreting the tent of some bizarre consumer law legislation that slammed their doors shut uh, without any whimper. The outcry would be huge. No more Sunday snags for fundraising barbecues, no more support to local communities, this is parallel to the damage caused by the extremists who seek to undermine our forestry industry. And we're talking about tens of thousands of jobs being in jeopardy, people having to find work in industries other than forestry, skilled workers being lost. What the amendment to the EPBC Act seek, that's before the Senate seeks to do uh, is to actually make certain that the relationship between the EPBC Act and the regional forestry agreements that's operated without a whimper for two decades uh, remains is not caused uh, in, into any jeopardy by the decision by Justice Mortimer, who I might say uh, is a good fan, friend of uh, Bob Brown, no friend of the forestry industry, as my Tasmanian colleagues would understand. The delivery of certainty of resources, access and supply of industry, ecologically sustainable forest management, these are the things that are um, covered by the RFAs, and an expanded and permanent forest conservation estate that provides protection of Australia's unique forest biodiversity. So it's actually written into the Regional Forestry Agreement. But if you listen to these environmental extremists, you would think the forestry industry's only intent was to chop down every single tree in this country uh, and never replant another one. It is simply not true. Uh, the Department of Agriculture's own document states that RFAs implement the Australian and state government's commitment to ecologically sustainable forest management. Fact. Fact. We need to stand up for this important industry and be able to say, hand on heart, yes, you have a future protected from the waging of green lawfare against you. You have job security. Invest in the forest industry. Invest in your regional community. Invest 
in regional uh, advanced manufacturing. According to the ABC, Australia is in the midst of a timber shortage. The timber industry is even calling for an extension to the government's home builder scheme uh, because there is one of the primary barriers is the access to timber to actually build the houses to meet the demand. I was in Echuca on Friday. They want to expand. Everyone's rushing to the regions. We think it's fantastic. We can't wait to welcome you all out to where we love to live and you can raise a family and have a great career. But we want to have you in a house. Uh, we can't build those houses unless we have access to timber. How can anyone in this place think it's okay to shut down our forest industries? That would mean we'd actually have to import timber that has orangutan blood on its hand. It is very good and well for people to come into this place, play the high moral ground, not fact-based, only causing a situation where we import timber that we cannot be assured of its uh, sustainability and environmental credentials as we can that that is harvested within our own community. Let's just think. So I was really chuffed by what the economist uh, stated around timber. There's no other building material that has the environmental credentials as exciting and as overlooked as wood. The energy required to produce a laminated wooden beam is one sixth of that required for a steel one of comparable strength. Well, hello. Someone needs to tell the Greens. We've got a renewable resource. We can replant it. Less energy to produce. That means less coal burned. It means less emissions. And yet, we're cutting off our nose to spite our face once again. It's a great insulator. Uh, wooden buildings contribute to negative emissions. Well, someone better tell uh, the Greens Party. Softwood timber frame provides nearly 400 times as much insulation as a plain steel one of the same thickness and over a thousand times as much as one of aluminium uh, equivalent. Look around you in this place and everywhere where we work in this building. The timber is in this place used for the floorboards, the doors in our offices, our desks. It's not plantation softwood timber. It is beautiful Australian native hardwood. Native hardwood. It's tough. It's sustainable, it's renewable, and it's beautiful. And we need to be proud of this product. Uh, use it more rather than trying to shut it down and use some European introduced softwood pine as a substitute for our beautiful mountain ash, our red gums, etc. It's not just the National Party that's on this bandwagon. No, my, my good Mr. friend President. Michael O'Connor from the CFMEU is right behind my private senator's bill. And as the Labor Party senators make their way into the chamber, I would really, really encourage them to su support the, blue, the actual blue singlet workers, like my father, not white collar, blue collar, blue singlet workers in the Australian timber industry. And actually, I, I can only speak for my father, Senator Wong, um, and actually support the real workers in regional Australia, our forest industry. Senator Polly, on a point of uh, Senator Polly. This budget, uh, Mr. President, is truly an underwhelming document filled with all promises but no realistic chance of delivery. It's been called the budget of non-deliverables, and I think it's a budget synonymous with the movie Deliverance. It's an absolute horror show of empty promises. Does this government? really believe that Tasmanians are going to be so gullible so to believe that $322 million is going to be delivered in infrastructure spending in Tasmania no. over an eight-year period. Well, they won't, because they know that not even a quarter of that is going to be delivered before 2025. Now, it's a budget that is on the never-never. Big on promises, empty on delivery, just like the two previous morrison Frydenberg budgets. If you actually look at the detail of infrastructure spending in Tasmania, Tasmania can only expect to get $96.2 million over the forward estimates all the next four years. That means that Tasmania will only see $4 million of this infrastructure spend in 2021-22. I can't believe that they realistically think we're that gullible. 
They will follow this up with $17.2 million in 22-23, $20.3 million in 23-24. And as I said, if these people are still in government, if they are, by 2024-25, there's an extra $55.7 million. So that, as we know, is tricky accounting and strip-feeding taxpayers' money into much-needed infrastructure in Tasmania. This is a budget of smoke and mirrors, nothing more from the spin doctor himself. Those opposite want to hold on to taxpayers' money instead of spending it. And yet this is after Mr Morrison has said on many occasions it's the people's money. Order. If that Senator really Polly, is the case— being 2 p.m., we will move to questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. And I refer to page 37 of Budget Paper No. 1. Can the minister confirm that despite spending almost $100 billion and racking up a record $100 trillion in debt, the wage price index and consumer price index forecast on that page show a cut to real wages? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank, uh, thank Senator Wong for her question. And indeed, it's a budget where it's been clear for some time in relation to the information provided by the Reserve Bank, Treasury, their analysis about what it would take to see pressure in relation to real wages growth. They've updated. They've updated. They've updated. Well, a, a Labor government would give you many things, but it certainly wouldn't give you certainly wouldn't give you more jobs. Certainly wouldn't give you more jobs across Australia. Order. Certainly wouldn't give you a stronger economy. Order. Certainly, certainly would give you, though, probably higher Senator, taxes. Sorry, order. I was just responding to the interjection, order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong on a point of just order. Responding. Point I, of order. I, I must point take Senator order. Wong on the point of order. Senator, Ber Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. I asked a very specific question about a table in the budget papers, which, which demonstrates that despite racking up a trillion dollars in debt, real wages go backwards. And I've asked the minister to confirm that. Um, interjections are always disorderly. It helps if ministers are not interjected upon so that they are not tempted to respond to them. Uh, you reminded the minister of the question. I urge senators to remain silent and allow the minister to answer it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, before, uh, before I was interrupted by those opposite, I was pointing out, Mr. President, that the Reserve Bank and the Treasury had indeed provided updated information in relation to the Nauru, the effective Order. rate of full employment at which you expect to see wages pressure increase in the economy. And their updates that they had released and provided indicated that it was necessary to get unemployment sustainably below 5 per cent, indeed closer to 4.5 per cent, to see that type of pressure build, particularly in what is a low interest rate and low inflation environment. Uh, that we face at present. And so, Mr. President, what this government has outlined in our economic plan, in our budget, is a very clear plan to deliver stronger employment growth that achieves lower unemployment outcomes, that meets those types of provisions and expectations that the Reserve Bank and the Treasury have outlined, to drive unemployment below 5 per cent and to achieve that in sustainable terms. That's something that hasn't been achieved in this country for a very long time, Mr. President. But we are well placed order. to achieve Senator that now. Birmingham. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, the cut to real wages in the budget. That's what the question was yeah, about. Um, about Sen Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate part of the question. I'm reluctant to get so. I I'm reluctant to get so specific in determining direct relevance that a minister, when asked a question of this nature, cannot be talking about employment and its impact upon the economy. I, I think the minister, with respect, is being directly relevant. I can't instruct him how to in answer a question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. So, as I was outlining, and we're following not, not the views of the Labor Party there, but indeed the advice, of, the advice of economic experts at the Reserve Bank and the Treasury about how best to achieve the jobs growth Order. that will then lead to the unemployment outcomes Order. that Senator can drive Birmingham. the wages Time for growth. The answer has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. How much longer will Australians have, have to wait to see an increase in their real wages? Senator Birmingham. No, Mr. President, Mr. President, we have been seeing real wages growth. Let's not accept the premise of that question that somehow wages have not been growing. They've been growing. They've been growing, of course, in a record low inflation environment, a record low interest rate environment. 
Order. We also have seen Australians, though, live through a global pandemic. Australians Order. living through the biggest disruption Order to the global economy left. since World War II. But fortunately for Australians, unlike those across much of the rest of the world, they've enjoyed policy settings and success right across this country that's kept their jobs safe, that's kept their jobs safe and secure. It has actually achieved an outcome of seeing more Australians in work today than was the case when we went into the pandemic. Twelve months ago, nobody would have thought that was an achievable outcome to have more Australians in work today than at the time the nation was slipping into recession. But there is absolutely still more to be done, and that's what our budget plans Order, outline Senator Birmingham, to keep growing jobs, which expired. we can help to achieve. Order. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. How is it that you as Finance Minister and this Prime Minister have delivered a trillion dollars in debt but a budget which ensures that real wages go backwards? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr President, we are absolutely proud as a government to have delivered successive budgets that have kept Australians safe and secure. Our budgets, our plans, our policies have saved the jobs of Australians, have saved businesses across Australia, have created an environment for which Australians enjoy far greater economic security than nearly anywhere else around the world. I know those opposite want to pretend that we live in some sort of alternate reality world, but you need only go and look. Go and look at the European Union and see a double-dip recession occurring in that part of the world. Go and look elsewhere around the world and try to find another country, another developed economy, where jobs have recovered to the extent at which they have in Australia. Go and find another country where businesses have survived at the rate they have in Australia. We have much to be proud of in this country. Our government won't let those opposite talk it down. We are determined to keep backing Australian businesses to drive the jobs growth Order, for Senator all Australians. Birmingham. Senator Chandler. Order. Senator Chandler is on her feet. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government's 2021-2022 budget sets out a comprehensive plan to secure Australia's economic recovery and build for the future? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, last night we did deliver a budget that sets out the next stages in Australia's recovery plan. The next stages in our plan to make sure we keep Australians safe, safe from the threats of COVID-19 to their health safe from the threats of COVID-19 to their jobs and their economic security. Equally, a plan that lays out how we will continue to grow the economy over the long term and drive further economic growth, productivity growth and jobs creation for Australians, and of course how we will deliver on our promises to fund the essential services that Australians rely on. Even in the face of an economy of a pandemic, Mr President, that has knocked our economy and parts of the world for six we're seeing remarkable resilience across Australia. We're seeing consumer sentiment at its highest in 11 years, business conditions reaching record highs. All of that after the first recession that Australia had faced in 30 years caused by the COVID pandemic. Most countries, Mr President, are simply still struggling to get back to the starting points they had at the pandemic. But we've managed to get Australia back to the point of having more people in work than had been the case. And that gives us the opportunity to deliver on our commitments to invest in, in essential services. $18 billion for aged care services, more than $2 billion for mental health services and over $13 billion honouring our promises to fully fund the National Disability Insurance Scheme. This budget delivers key measures that will turbocharge the economy further, continue to drive economic growth, investment and create jobs into the future, including extra tax relief for low- and middle-income earners as part of, of course, our sweeping tax reforms delivering lower income tax across the board, extension of the temporary full expensing measures to make sure we get business investment going, new apprenticeship places—100,000 of them being supported by additional government support programs and $110 billion Order, of infrastructure to build Senator the country Chandler, stronger. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline some of the major job-creating measures in the 2021-2022 budget? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our measures will help to create some 250,000 further jobs over the next two years. Having taken, taken employment in Australia to a record level now, 
we're going to see under this budget settings a further 250,000 additional jobs created. Since the last budget, almost half a million have already been created, and this will see 750,000 jobs growth across Australia. We're investing, Mr. President, a record $6.4 billion this year in skills and training support to make sure that Australians get the skills they need to secure the jobs of the future, doubling our commitment to the Job Trainer Fund, supporting more than 450,000 new training places to upskill job seekers and young people, and importantly, an additional $2.7 billion to extend the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Program. Boosting apprenticeships will support more than 170,000 new apprenticeships Order. and traineeships Senator Birmingham, across Australia. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Order. <laughs> Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Can Order. the minister outline how tax relief and other measures will support families and businesses and drive investment in our economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, the Liberal and National Parties will always be the parties of lower taxes. Lower taxes that we are delivering. Order. Lower taxes that we are delivering Order through our income left. tax cuts. Lower taxes Order. that we are delivering through an extension of the low and middle income tax offset for another year, supporting 720,000 hard-working individuals across my own state of South Australia and many more, 10 million across Australia altogether. We're the party that's making sure we back Australian business to bring forward their investment decisions through, through the full uh, expensing measures and the temporary loss carryback measures that are in place. And by bringing forward those expenses and those investment decisions, Australian businesses will be creating more jobs. Australian businesses will be investing in their productivity and their competitiveness which will make sure, and it's been working, Senator Ayres. I'm happy to say Australian businesses have been doing that, which is why Order. we've extended this program. We've extended it because Order, it's helping to deliver Time the jobs for, the for Australians. Has expired. Order. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that last night's budget reveals that gross debt will reach $1.2 trillion in 2024-25, and can the minister confirm that he will be responsible for the highest level of debt in Australia's history? Wow. Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. So, uh, so, so thanks, Mr President. Indeed, the debt figures are published transparently in the budget papers. The debt figures are there for all to see. Importantly, importantly, Mr. President, importantly, Mr. President, under this budget, net debt across each of the 10 years of the medium term comes in lower than had been forecast in last year's budget. Mr. President, what we're able to deliver across this budget is investment in essential services for Australians, whilst ensuring that we keep debt at levels below what had been forecast in last year's budget. That's a dividend from sound economic management. That's a dividend from being able to create more jobs across the Australian economy. That, Mr President, is a dividend from having created the environment through tax incentives, through incentives for Australian business, through incentives for Australian households Order, and Senator through sound Pratt. management that creates the right environment to be able to see, to be able to see recovery across our economy. I hear Senator Wong talking about the iron ore price. Well, of course, this budget, like all our preceding coalition budgets, takes a conservative approach in relation to things like assumptions around the iron ore price. Once again, if Senator Wong hadn't realised, we project in the budget iron ore prices declining to $55 per tonne. A conservative approach. A conservative approach to give confidence. Order. To give confidence to, to, give confidence Senator, to Senator the Wong. budget papers. Oh, and Senator Wong Order. wants to talk to me about debt now, Senator. Senator Wong wants to talk to me about debt. This is Senator Wong. I was here, I, I, I'm not sure where Senator Wong was last March, when everybody over there was saying we should extend, extend the JobKeeper program, or the sky was going to fall in. This lot were calling for more Order. spending just a few months ago. And when we showed, when we showed the judgment and the Order. strength to Senator phase Birmingham out of that program, we were proven right. Order. 
Yesterday we managed order. Yesterday we managed to hear the other place. I'm hoping we don't return the favour. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do have a supplementary. What is the dollar figure for peak gross debt, and in what year will it be reached? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, over the forward estimates, gross debt is expected to reach a within-year peak of $1.2 billion, or $50.920 billion, or 50.9 per cent. Order. One, one thousand, yes, one point two two trillion dollars, or fifty point nine per cent of GDP Order. in April 2025. Order. Gross debt, as the budget papers make very clear, is expected to stabilise in the medium term at around fifty one per cent of GDP. Compared, Mr. President, compared, Mr. President, Order. to around fifty five per cent in last point of year's order. budget. Order, Senator Birmingham. I have Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Senator Gallagher. Point of order on um, relevance, um, direct relevance. We didn't ask for the percentage. We asked for the dollar figure for peak gross debt. Um, I, know I, was... I know he's having trouble saying the word trillion, but I've asked what the peak. I've, I've, what dollar figure is, I've not percentage. You, I've allowed you to restate the question, Senator Gallagher. I was listening carefully to the minister's answer, and despite the interjections, I think I heard about half of it. Um, I've allowed you to remind him of the question. He was, I, I, Senator Wong, before you get to your feet, I was struggling to hear the minister and all the answer. There was so much noise in the chamber. I've allowed Senator Gallagher to remind the minister of the question. Um, the minister, in my view, from what I heard, was answering it. I'm not going to instruct him how to answer a question, but I'm going to listen carefully to what he says, and I'll ask senators to remain silent so that I may rule if people raise subsequent points of order. In my view, from what I heard, he was being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, in the, in the first question I faced today, the opposition asked me the question premised on the basis of $1.7 trillion. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. It was a very simple question, point of order direct relevance, for peak gross debt in dollar terms. Um, I, the minister, I think, spoke for seven seconds then. I don't think I, I cannot go. I cannot. If a minister, if a minister is talking, it was a, it was a factual question. It does not allow. We'll waste time. Order on my right, order on my left. Order. Now, the first principle I have is that I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question. The second principle is this was a straight factual question, so it does not allow for commentary. And I do not believe the minister was providing any commentary. I believe he was addressing the issue of gross debt. I am reluctant to instruct a minister if they are being very specific to the question, in my view, to get to the point of how to answer a question. I cannot instruct the minister to provide a particular number, fact, statement or observation to the chamber. There is an opportunity to debate the merits of answers afterwards. I believe the minister was constraining himself to directly relevant issue raised by the question. I can't instruct him any further than that. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, as I was indicating before, the opposition, in their first question that they asked today, referenced $1.7 trillion in relation to gross debt figures. Now, Mr. President, what we see in relation to the medium-term projections is that gross debt Order. is projected to stabilise. Time for the answer lower. has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. In the first question, we used the figure $1.2 trillion, so I'm not sure where $1.7 is. But this uh, supplementary um, is: uh, Can the minister confirm? If Senator Canavan is correct when he says, and I quote, we have a higher debt to GDP than we have ever had since the end of World War II. Is right Senator Canavan correct? Right Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, th thanks, Mr. President. And indeed, indeed, Mr. President, we do face globally the biggest economic disruption since World War II. So it is not surprising, Mr. President, that in responding to the first global pandemic in a century, in responding to the biggest economic disruption to the world since World War II, in responding through programs like JobKeeper, 
which those opposite argued should have been bigger and lasted for longer, yet now they come in here with great hypocrisy and seek to criticise, seek to criticise uh, the level of debt, it's not surprising that we, would face, that we would face those circumstances. I am addressing specifically Order. the question that was asked Order and the quote left. that was there. And Mr. President, Mr. President, it is clear, it is clear that across the world there has been a significant increase in government debt. Australia has managed to deliver a budget now that sees a reduction in Order, what was projected Senator of Birmingham, government debt for the than was expected has last expired. Year. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government's 21-22 budget is securing Australia's recovery by supporting women to further participate in the workforce? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hughes for her question. Her enduring commitment to women's economic security. Mr. President, the Morrison government is proud to be making a record investment of $1.9 billion towards the economic security of Australia's women in this year's budget. As this, part, this is part of a broader package, $3.4 billion package of targeted measures that will also improve women's safety and their health and well-being. Our measures have been designed to give more women more choices and more chances to participate in the workforce and secure their economic security while they are working and also into retirement. We know that a comprehensive system of childcare is the key to helping women return to the workforce and participate in the workforce, which is one of the best ways to ensure that women are economically secure. When you remove barriers to women's workforce participations, all Australians reap the benefits. It's estimated that increasing women's workforce participation by just 5 per cent will increase Australia's real GDP by $20 billion over five years, and all Australians will benefit from a more prosperous Australia. And it's not just women with children that benefit. Around two-thirds of women with children in the workforce with children under two uh, use their grandparents for informal support, and around a third of women use grandparents as their only support. By making childcare more affordable and more accessible, we're actually freeing up older women to also return to the workforce to increase their lifetime earnings and to secure their economic future. So women's workforce participation hit a record high of 61.8 per cent as in March, but we know that it can go further. That's why we're investing an additional $1.7 billion in childcare, building on the $10.3 billion that we already provide every year. We're removing the childcare subsidies annual cap and with an increased childcare subsidies available to families with two or more children, benefiting around 250,000 families. Order, Senator Hume. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. I do. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the government is supporting women in work, including Indigenous women? Before I call Senator Hume again, I'm going to ask for silence during the question. I would prefer silence at all times, but particularly during the question, I will insist upon it. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government is acutely aware of, of the needs, the very unique needs, needs of Indigenous women. That's why this women's budget statement provides 77.4 million dollars in dedicated funding to improve Indigenous women's economic security. We have committed $13.9 million over four years to establish an early stage social enterprise foundation. Now, this foundation will provide capacity building and financial support dedicated to social enterprises that are on the ground in Indigenous communities right now. We know that partnering with these organisations is one of the very best ways that we can improve the economic security of Indigenous women and support them into work opportunities because of the unique insights that grassroots organisations can provide. Order. Additional funding of $63.5 million over Senator four Thorpe. years will support additional places for Indigenous girls' academies, which support young Indigenous women into their Order. studies, Senator increase their Year 12 the attainment and provide— Senator Thorpe. Senator Hughes. Can the minister advise how the government is supporting women's economic security for their retirement? We're wasting time. Order. Senator Hume. 
Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government knows that women's economic security in their retirement is particularly important. We're focused on improving the retirement outcomes for women by increasing superannuation coverage and making our system fairer. By removing the $450 per month threshold for superannuation eligibility imposed by the Labor Party when superannuation began in 1992, we are ensuring that women who are working part-time or in multiple jobs are accruing superannuation for their futures. We are also extending the access to the downsizer contribution and removing the work test to improve superannuation's flexibility. We know that more women than men make voluntary contributions to their superannuation accounts at all stages of their lives, and this is the key element to the retirement income system working better for women. This government's reforms remove barriers to superannuation system, facilitate those voluntary contributions so that all women can bolster their own super on Order, their own Senator terms Hume. when they're able Time to do the answer so. Has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Minister, the two great economic challenges of our times are the breakdown of our climate and growing wealth inequality. In your government's budget, these great challenges have been either left unaddressed or deliberately made worse. Knowing that climate change will make fires, droughts and floods more frequent and more intense, how can you possibly justify the tens of billions of dollars of public subsidies your government is handing over to billionaires and big fossil fuel corporations to continue polluting our atmosphere with carbon? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, I thank Senator McKim for his question. Um, like those opposite, he must have missed the pandemic that seems to have had a rather profound impact in relation to economic security right across the world. And so, Senator McKim, I would contest the fact that there isn't something else right here, right now, that is indeed creating challenges for economies, including Australia's around the world. And so this budget is framed very much first and foremost on the premise of continuing to keep Australians safe and secure in the management of the pandemic and, of course, in relation to their job security as well. But Mr. President, but Mr. President, I would also suggest that Senator McKim may wish to look a little more thoroughly through the budget papers in terms of the measures that are there when he raises climate change Order. about ensuring we address emissions reduction. $1.2 billion in this year's budget uh, to put, establish Australia at the forefront of low emissions technology, innovation and commercialisation, particularly pursuing international partnerships, a high integrity carbon offset scheme in our Indo-Pacific region, support for four additional clean hydrogen export hubs, bringing our support there to a total of five, support for Australia's hydrogen industry overall, support for the development of carbon capture technologies and hubs, support for the National Soil Carbon Innovation Challenge. Mr President, let me also address Senator McKim's question indeed about inequality. The greatest, path, the greatest path to be able to achieve greater equality is by creating more jobs across our economy, by getting workforce participation to its highest possible levels and by achieving the maximum in terms of workplace participation. And that's what our government has proudly achieved, being able to drive pre-pandemic workforce participation to record highs and now seeing record numbers of Australians Order. in jobs, which is the Senator fastest McKean, way to address No mention of the $51 billion of public subsidies to fossil fuel in this budget. Minister, why are you continuing to hand out billions of dollars to the big corporations and billionaires to allow the continued destruction of our environment? Why does your government's budget continue to favour coal, gas and oil over renewable energy? And how can you possibly justify handing billionaire Andrew Forrest tens of millions of dollars of public subsidies for new gas projects during a climate emergency? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, it, it sounds to me, if I'm taking a wild guess at what Senator McKim is conflating into what he's calling as subsidies, it sounds to me like Senator McKim is wanting us to ensure that Australian farmers are paying higher taxes in relation to the fuels they use. Well, I can tell Senator McKim that's not something that a coalition government will do. A coalition government will not be jacking up 
the taxes that Australian farmers pay in relation to their fuels. We will not be rendering our resources industry less competitive around the rest of the world. These are important parts of our current economic architecture and our future economic architecture as well, providing jobs, providing more opportunities for Australians now and into the future, driving our export earnings potential. We're doing that in an environment where we are also investing in new technology opportunities. We have seen, Mr President, phenomenal growth in relation to the renewables energy sector, and you can see by our measures in this budget we're investing in the next Order. wave of Senator emissions Birmingham reducing time. technologies too. Expired. Senator McKim, a final Thank supplement. Thank you, President. Question. Still no mention of the $51 billion of fossil fuel subsidies in this budget. Minister, according to the budget projections, real wages will go backwards over the next two years, mm -hmm. with housing affordability once again getting worse. Why has your budget ignored social housing yet again? Why are you instead trying to trap single parents into subprime mortgages? Is this budget an admission that the government wants to keep wages low and drive house prices even higher? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, let me completely refute, completely refute the suggestion there by Senator McKim that somehow our government is trying to quote trap single parents into subprime mortgages. Mr President, what our government is proudly trying to do is to give single parents a greater opportunity of home ownership. Of home ownership. That is a proud Liberal value, Mr President. That is something that has stretched through the Liberal and National parties throughout the history of our parties to help encourage home ownership in Australia. And in this budget, Mr. President, we are proud to try to make it easier, make it easier for young Australians Order. to buy their own home, to make it easier for single parents to be able to buy their own home, to make more available more family homes by encouraging Order. older Australians to downsize at the right stage Senator in their Ayers. life to be able to do so. These, Mr. President, far from entrapment, these are opportunities that we are creating for greater, Order. greater financial time for sustainability the for Australian families. Senator Antich. President, Mr. President, my question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, what is the Morrison government doing to secure Australia's recovery by skilling Australians for jobs today and into the future? Through its 2021-22 budget, the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Antic uh, for his question. And Mr. President, uh, the budget that was handed down last night sets out the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan to get Australia and Australians through COVID-19. One of the measures that we are investing in is in terms of businesses being able to take on further apprentices and trainees. We brought down a budget that backs people who want to become an apprentice and trainee, but also provides that mechanism for a business to actually take them on. On this side of the chamber, on the government side, we know that governments themselves don't create jobs. We put in place policy frameworks. And the policy framework that the Morrison government puts in place enables businesses out there to prosper, grow and, in this case, create opportunities for apprenticeships and a traineeships for more Australians. And what we saw in last night's budget was the government committed to extending the Boosting Apprenticeships Commencement Wage Subsidy with an additional $1.5 billion. And colleagues, we are now extending out this incredibly successful program to the 31st of March 2022. Mr President, under this program, what we have seen to date is 140,000 Australians have been able to enter an apprenticeship or traineeship. 140,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships have been created since this program has been created. The further funding, the further funding that we actually announced last night in the budget, an additional $1.5 billion. What we will now see is this program will now deliver an additional approximately 170,000 apprentices. And that is because we understand, the Morrison government understands, that you need to put in place that pipeline of skilled workers and provide businesses and Australians with the opportunity to bring on and to undertake Order. apprenticeships. Senator, you, supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how is the government supporting women in getting apprenticeships in non-traditional trades? 
Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the Morrison government is focused on seeing more women go into apprenticeships and trades. Why? Because we know that once you've actually undertaken an apprenticeship or a traineeship, you have a skill for life. And what we saw with last night's budget was our continued commitment to seeing more women take up an apprenticeship in non-traditional trades, with training support provided for 5,000 places. Mr. President, the Morrison government is also guaranteeing, guaranteeing in-training support for women who take up more apprenticeships in industries such as building and construction. And certainly, as the former skills minister, I've been passionate about seeing more women pursue uh, careers in non-traditional trades, such as working with the building and construction industry, uh, and in particular with great women leaders in the building and construction industry. For example, Donita Warne, uh, who is, of course, leading the Master Builders Association. Senator Antich, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the government supporting digital businesses to take on staff and gain skills needed in a digital economy? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, what we're seeing with the digital economy is it is creating new opportunities for Australians uh, to both upskill and to reskill into roles that just say two decades ago, 20 years ago, did not actually exist or were actually in their infancy. And that is why, again, last night, what you saw uh, in the budget was an investment of around $10.7 million to trial new digital skills cadetships. This is all about helping Australians to develop high-level digital skills in fields such as cybersecurity, advanced manufacturing, data analytics, game design uh, and animation. And what this investment will do is provide four industry-led pilots to develop new and innovative ways to increase the number of Australians with high-level digital skills through cadetships. Again, the Morrison government, we understand the value of apprenticeships, the value of traineeships, the value for creating opportunities for women to enter into non-traditional trades, and uh, we were backing Senator those commitments Cash, in, in the, the budget. Has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. After a two-year FOI battle with the Defence Department, the Information Commissioner granted public access to the total build and sustainment costs for the future submarines as offered by Naval Group in its tender response. The Defence Department has appealed that decision in the AAT and Naval Group have requested and been joined to the proceedings. There are now seven lawyers involved uh, fighting one Rex Patrick. We now find out that the taxpayer is paying uh, the legal cost of Naval Group, a $5.1 billion foreign company. Who approved this? Why was it approved? And are, are there any caps on the legal fees that we pay uh, for foreign entities? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for his question. Uh, Defence tabled a response to a Senator's question from Senator Patrick in relation to this matter. The question, as Senator Patrick has indicated, relates to Defence's application to the AAT against a decision of the Information Commissioner that Defence should provide a certain information. Uh, Defence considers this information as being confidential information under the terms of the contract for the competitive evaluation process and, accordingly, not for public disclosure. Uh, Defence is represented in the by the Australian Government Solicitor in these proceedings and is co-joined by Naval Group in appealing against the Information Commissioner's decision. Naval Group has engaged its own legal representation. Defence and Naval Group have lodged affidavits and statements of facts, issues and contentions. Both have also lodged responses to the statement of facts, issues and contentions lodged by Senator Patrick. I understand the matter is set for hearing by the AAT uh, on the 8th and 9th of June. In regard to the payment of legal costs, Defence has, as uh, indicated in the answer to the question asked by Senator Patrick, assessed that those costs related to these proceedings may be allowable and reasonable under the terms of the strategic partnering agreement between Defence and Naval Group. Naval Group Australia, which should be noted, uh, has been established for the purpose of delivering the future submarine program, which is funded by Defence, and the matter before the AAT uh, relates to information provided by Naval Group uh, for the purposes of that future submarine program. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the question on notice advised that the payment of the legal expenses was agreed to in the strategic partnering agreement. 
Yet the disputed material relates to a contract that played out well before Naval Group were even selected as the partner. On what basis would the Commonwealth grant this retrospective cost indemnity, and how far back does that indemnity go? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. As I just uh, advised from the information provided to me by Defence, Defence has assessed costs relating to these proceedings may be allowable and reasonable under the terms of the strategic partnering agreement. Uh, now, the documents that are being sought uh, relate to the future submarine program for which Naval Group Australia has been established, and which is a program funded by Defence. And, Mr. President, uh, on, those, uh, on those grounds, Defence have assessed that it is consistent with the terms of the SPA. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, with the regards to the government paying Naval Group's legal bills, is it just a contractual arrangement between Naval Group, or is it something that all large uh, defence primes get, the uh, taxpayer paying their legal bills? How many small to medium companies get the benefit of the taxpayer paying their legal bills uh, if a dispute arises? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I give Senator Patrick the assurance that, uh, that in equivalent circumstances, under consistent contractual terms, they'd be consistently applied. Senator Muriel Smith. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. When asked this morning whether references in the budget papers to vaccinating the entire population by the end of the year mean all Australians will be vaccinated by 31 December, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, no, there are assumptions that go into the rollout. They are not policy settings. What assumptions underpin the budget? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Well, many assumptions underpin the budget, Mr. President. Assumptions order. underpin the budget in order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. A point of order. Direct relevance. <laughs> order. No. no. Order. I need to hear well, Senator Wong's point of order. Senator Wong. It is about the Prime Minister's statement today on vaccinations and the vaccination assumptions. It is the Prime Minister's own words. I would ask. Would you order. like me to read the question again, Senator Ruston? Order. order. He was asked about vaccinations, and I, 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 I would ask the, min the Minister to be directly relevant to that fact. The minister had been speaking for seven seconds, and I think I had heard more words from some interjectors than I had from the minister in that seven seconds. Um, the preamble to the question was about vaccines. The final words I have, and I am happy to be corrected, are what assumptions underpin the budget. Now, I may be, if I misheard, I am happy to be corrected. I am definitely not going to rule on direct relevance seven seconds in when the minister has referenced part of the question in his opening statement. I will listen to his answer. I've let you remind the minister of the question, Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, budget paper number one, page 36. The key assumptions that underpin the economic forecast are set out below. Outcomes could be substantially different to the forecast, depending upon the extent to which these assumptions hold. Mr. President, the first phase of Australia's vaccination program, commenced in late 2021, as it says with most priority populations having been vaccinated. It is assumed that a population-wide vaccination program is likely to be in place by the end of 2021. Uh, the assumptions indeed go on, Mr President, in relation to the containment Order. of localised outbreaks of COVID-19, in relation to the management of domestic activity restrictions, in relation to the operation of state border restrictions, in relation to uh, temporary or permanent migration movements, in relation to inbound and outbound travel restrictions. Of course, there are many other assumptions, Mr. President, that do inform the budget papers, as I was saying at the outset. Mr. President, in relation to vaccine availability, it is no secret uh, that the world has faced a shock in relation to elements of the vaccine rollout, uh, particularly in relation to the AstraZeneca vaccine. And in Australia, uh, the advice that we've received from health authorities uh, to limit uh, its application uh, to those over 50. That has obviously had a change in relation to the rollout schedule and expectations. Nonetheless, Mr. President, uh, our government has procured around 170 million doses of vaccines that can give Australians confidence 
that throughout the course of this year we will receive the vaccine doses uh, that will enable Australians to have the choice to be vaccinated, and we will urge all Australians to follow the health advice and to be vaccinated Order. in accordance with that advice. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. When Mr Morrison said, and I quote, no, there are assumptions that go into the rollout, they are not policy settings, what are the policy settings related to the vaccine rollout? Senator Birmingham. No. Mr President, the policy settings that relate to the vaccine rollout uh, are the billions of dollars that our government is investing in procuring Order. those vaccines in the contractual arrangements that we have pursued with the states and territories, with primary health networks of GPs across the country that are providing uh, more than 5,000 potential points of vaccination across the country now, that have achieved uh, more than 2.7 million do vaccine doses being administered to date, uh, and that will see continued distribution of vaccines across Australia throughout this year and no doubt into next year as well. We can see around Order. the world uh, that other countries are now taking the steps of assessing vaccine applicability to children. Those are considerations that obviously our health experts and regulators will give, which will no doubt, if they decide to approve that, and necessitate further changes to the vaccine program over time to come, in Order. addition to Senator potential Birmingham. for Senator further booster time doses. Time for the answers expired. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Minister, why are the vaccine rollout assumptions that underpin the budget not consistent with the policy settings related to the vaccine rollout? Senator Birmingham. No, Mr. Mr. President, I reject, I reject that question. That's, that's not, that is not, that is not the case. That is not the case. Senator Wong. That is not the case. Senator and I won't Keneally. accept the verbaling of the Prime Minister from those opposite either, Mr. Order. President. Mr. President, and and Order what is in the budget under the assumptions are indeed just that, assumptions. Those assumptions, though, are consistent with the government policy settings, which have entered into contracts around the world to secure, to secure around 170 million doses of vaccines for Australia, to ensure that we have that supply, that we have the distribution network that can enable as indeed the budget assumptions say, that can enable a population-wide vaccine program to be in place by the end of 2021. Now, Mr President, they are the assumptions on which the budget is built. The policies enable that possibility to be delivered, Order, and our Senator focus Birmingham, is on delivering time it. For the answer has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, can the minister please explain how the biosecurity package contained in this year's budget bolster our commitment to protect Australian agricultural industries and regional communities? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, yeah. Drought and Emergency yeah. Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Davey for her question about this really, really important issue that confronts Australia's farming sector. Um, the government is investing $850 million in this budget as a commitment towards supporting our agricultural sector to get to $100 billion worth of farm gate value. Uh, and as part of the critical um, pillar in this is obviously supporting biosecurity, and 400, over $400 million will be invested in biosecurity measures to make sure that we keep Australia's agricultural sector safe from the incursion of foreign pests and diseases. Because we know that agriculture continues to be one of the economic powerhouses of this country. And despite things like uh, the impacts of drought and floods and bushfires and the COVID pandemic, we still, as a country, rely immensely on our agricultural sector. So keeping Australia free from pests and diseases is one of the most important things that we can do to make sure that we support Australian agricultural producers, because we know that biosecurity matters to them. It matters to them because the hard work they've done to gain market access could be compromised yep. by pests and diseases. Yep. They know that they get a premium price for their products overseas because of our clean, green reputation. Um, and we know 
that even the small outbreaks that have happened in Australia can have devastating impacts, including more recently the over $2 billion that has cost us to deal with, uh, with African swine flu. Um, we know that, for instance, if foot and mouth disease ever came into our country, we're looking at a $50 billion cost to our agricultural sector over the, the, preceding, uh, the succeeding 10 years. So we are absolutely stepping up our resolve, our commitment, our funding to make yeah, sure yeah. that we combat where we can the incursion of pests and diseases into our country because we stand hand uh, side by side with our agricultural yeah, producers. Yeah. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. And can the minister further outline any other investments in biosecurity and export services and their ongoing role in reducing threats to our livestock, crops and our environment? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. We're investing in lots of things, but we believe that technological solutions, such as the groundbreaking trials to screen biosecurity offshore, um, the implementation of uh, you know development of modern innovative detection systems like our 3D X-ray machines and algorithms, that are much much more likely to be able to target where. Um, risks are likely to be higher. Um, and our announcement confirms our long-standing commitment that we will continue to invest record amounts of money to keep Australian agricultural producers doing what they do best, and that's producing fantastic, clean, green Australian produce. Um, we know that on average every year there are 2.5 million shipping containers arrive in Australia, 19,000 commercial vessels arrive, and 60 million mail items. Supply chains are becoming more complex and biosecurity risks are challenging and spreading uh, regionally and globally. That's why we are making the investment in, that delivers for import and export services to ensure the movement of goods yeah, yeah. is safe. Order. Yeah, yeah. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And finally, can the minister please update the Senate on how these investments <clears throat> will assist Australian agriculture and support Australians as we continue to secure Australia's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, our strong biosecurity system enables our agricultural sector, uh, and, but it protects our way of life in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Australia's biosecurity system protects the $53 billion in agriculture's fishery and forestry exports and 1.6 million Australian jobs uh, across the entire um, supply chain. So the suite of biosecurity measures that are contained in this budget are just one of the initiatives that we have putting in place to boost the economic recovery and complement the reforms that we are implementing across our entire biosecurity system to make it the most modern, efficient and effective system and making sure we keep Australia and Australians safe. Recently, modelling from the University of Melbourne said that the net present value of what we are seeking to protect by our biosecurity systems is $314 billion over the coming years. And that means that this is about a $30 return on investment for every dollar that we invest in biosecurity. It makes absolute common sense. Order. Senator Greeley. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. This morning, this minister said, and I quote, I expect some Australians will still be getting vaccinated next year. On what date will Australians be fully vaccinated? And how many doses per week need to be achieved to meet this target? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I didn't make any statements with respect to vaccination this morning, so it's uh, somewhat difficult for me to respond to something that, as that the opposition are alleging order. that I have said, Mr. Order. President. Sorry, I've got but Senator, Senator Colbeck. I've, I've got to take the point of order from Senator Keneally. Order. Uh, order. I've got Sorry. to take. Listen to the point okay. of order, Senator Keneally. My apologies, and that is my fault. I take responsibility here, Mr. President. My question was actually to Minister Birmingham. There was a typo on my paper. I apologise. Um, well, yeah. I'm, I apologise. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that is. Um, I'm afraid that is not something I can resolve. Um, I'm afraid that is not something I can resolve. It was a question to. Um, I, I, uh, Senator Keneally, I um, appreciate you 
accepting the error was on your part, but the question was directed to the minister representing the Minister for Health, so I, I, I must allow him to continue his commence his answer. Um, um, Senator Colbeck, have you concluded your answer? No, Mr. President, I, I'm, I'm very happy to assist the House uh, with um, some, some information with respect to the uh, vaccination rollout, Mr. President, uh, and as of um, close of business yesterday, Mr. President, uh, we have a number of national number of vaccinations of over 2.8 million, Mr. President, uh, 76,379 in the previous uh, 24 hours, Mr. President. In, um, in aged care, Mr. President, we've done 215,000 doses, and that's uh, 126,923 first doses, Mr. President, and 89,040 second doses, uh, and 55,700 doses supporting order. staff Senator, and residents. Order. <coughs> Senator Keneally, on a Thank point of you. order. Thank uh, you. This point of order is relevant. I, I'm, the senator doesn't have to explain Minister Birmingham's comments, but he could answer the question, which was, on what date will Australians be fully vaccinated, and how many doses per week need to be administered okay, allowed, to achieve I've, Senator this Keneally, target? I've allowed you order. Order. Um, Senator Keneally, um, there was a, a, a quotation that you uh, uh, accept erroneously put to the minister in your question. Um, I, I can't rule in this circumstance that talking very specifically about vaccination numbers is not directly relevant, um, but I, this is, a, a, I think, a unique circumstance in addressing direct relevance in a question. Um, the minister is constraining himself to specific numbers. I, I, I believe that to be directly relevant given the circumstances. Senator Colbeck. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, the government will continue to grow and develop the vaccination rollout uh, in accordance with the, the growth in supply, which we all accept has been one of the uh, th things that we've had to manage through the pandemic. We did not expect, Mr. President, that 3.1 million doses of vaccine wouldn't be available. And as more vaccine becomes available, Mr. President, we'll make more vaccines available through the nearly 5,000 outlets that we have available for Australians to achieve their vaccination. And of course, Mr President, it is a voluntary process. It is not compulsory for Australians to be vaccinated. We are Order. offering vaccinations progressively to all Australians uh, based on the approvals of the TGA. And Mr President, it's, at this point in time, we actually don't have globally a vaccine that's approved for use, and what, particularly in Australia, we don't have a vaccine that's approved for the use in, um, in younger Australians, people under the age of 18, Mr. President. So, so, Mr. President, the, the Labor Party clearly don't understand the process of the development of Order. the vaccine Senator rollout. Colbeck, time they for continue the to try has and expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. On what date will Australians be fully vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as I have said, and if the Labor Party had been listening to the last question that I just answered. I have said that Order. vaccination, Mr President, Order. is a voluntary process. We don't have yet in this country a vaccine approved for people under the age of 18, Mr President. So, Mr Order. President, Senator because Watt. the TGA has not approved one Senator yet, Watt. Mr President. So if the Labor Party don't understand Senator those Watt. simple fundamentals about the vaccine process, uh, about the safe application of the vaccine process uh, that we are rolling out, Mr. President. I actually feel quite sorry for them, Mr. President. We will continue to build the vaccine uh, rollout with availability, with the uh, availability of new vaccines uh, that will look after not only uh, Australians at a senior level, those that are over 50 that are available. Uh, that have ac access Order, to the vaccine Senator now. And those in the Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. The Morrison government has broken promise after promise to administer 4 million vaccinations by the end of March, to vaccinate all of 1A by the end of Easter, to vaccinate 6 million Australians by the 10th of May. On what date will all Australians who want to be vaccinated receive their vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The Labor Party seem to live in this parallel universe where they completely forget, Mr. President, where they completely forget 
that we did not receive 3.1 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine that we were expecting. They, they neglect to tell the Australian people that, based on health advice, we had to reset the vaccine rollout to uh, provide uh, AstraZeneca vaccine Order. only to people 50 and over, based on health advice. Mr. President. They live in this parallel universe where they continue to undermine the public confidence in the vaccine rollout when we want to maintain the, vaccine, the, the confidence in the vaccine rollout because it is important that Australians front up, come and get a vaccination as it becomes available to them in the category that's open to them. Mr. President. We will continue to responsibly build and grow the vaccine rollout with vaccine availability and ensure that Australians have access to safe and high quality vaccines. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the Morrison McCormack government's record $110 billion infrastructure rollout announced in this 2021-22 budget and how it will secure Australia's recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President, and indeed I can. And thank you very much to Senator O'Sullivan for the question and for his passionate support for the development of infrastructure right across our great state of Western Australia and indeed nationally. Despite what those opposites say, the Morrison McCormack government is continuing to secure Australia's recovery with a record investment in infrastructure as part of the 21-22 budget. This is continuing to support and secure jobs. It is driving growth and helping rebuild Australia's economy from COVID-19, which is still far from over. So not only does this $110 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline form part of our economic recovery plan, it is helping secure Australia's world-leading economic recovery. This record infrastructure is delivering, is actually delivering nation-building infrastructure projects water security to inland Australia. It's meeting our order. national freight challenge and it's also getting Australians home sooner and safer. Some examples. Uh, this builds on the significant projects that the Morrison government has already delivered for Australia. Order. And let me remind all in this chamber of what some of those projects are that have been delivered. The Pacific Highway, the Wollongong to Ballina extension, $3.7 billion. The Ballarat Wright Lale upgrade in Victoria, half a billion dollars. The North South Corridor Darlington upgrade in South Australia, over $200 million. The Bruce Highway Mackay Ring Road in Queensland, approximately $400 million. And a bit closer to our home, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, the Great Northern Highway, the Muche to Woburn upgrade in Western Australia, $275 million. This $110 billion rollout, I'll say that again, $110 billion rollout includes an additional, an additional $15.2 billion in new commitments. So far from a cut, Order. it is Senator additional Reynolds. spending. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate of the flow and effects of jobs and the result of this $110 billion infrastructure investment? Senator Reynolds. President, and indeed I can, and very proudly so. This government has a very proud record of delivering major infrastructure projects right across our nation. In fact, more than 220 projects, 220 projects are currently under construction right around our great nation. And these projects are supporting over 100,000 Australian jobs. The $15.2 billion in new commitments to infrastructure projects will support an additional, an additional 30,000 jobs across Australia, which has never been more important. So this budget is funding projects including $2 billion for the Great Western Highway upgrade, Katoomba to Lithgow in New South Wales, $2 billion to deliver the, new international, the Melbourne Intermodal Terminal. $400 million for the Bruce Highway, additional funding in Queensland. $237.5 million for Metronet in Western Australia. $161 million for the Truro Bypass in Senator South Australia. O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the $110 billion infrastructure rollout is driving economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And indeed, I can. I still had such a long list of projects that this government is delivering. I didn't quite get through them all. This infrastructure rollout means, above all else, it means local jobs in local communities right across Australia. For example, the new intermodal freight terminal in Melbourne will support both the Victorian and also, importantly, our national freight networks, creating up to 1,350 jobs during peak construction and a further 550 jobs during peak operation. The additional $1 billion for the highly successful $2.5 billion local roads and community infrastructure program is also successfully delivering local projects that matter to local communities right across our nation. And that, again, means local jobs, not just direct construction jobs, but jobs that flow right through local communities. This funding is also supporting around 3,500 jobs taking the total jobs supported by this program to 9,000. This Order. is what Senator good Reynolds, government time looks for the answer like. Has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. See you in half an hour. Yep. To take note of answers, Senator Urquhart. President, I rise to take note of the response by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Wong regarding the wage stagnation the government that he is part of has presided over to, for eight long years. Wage stagnation, which the, this budget predicts, will continue. In fact, the, bu in, uh, the budget that the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, brought down last night rep represents a real wages cut and is an admission of failure by this government, this government. Even after spending $100 billion and racking up a $1 trillion in debt, the wages of Australian working people will still go backwards in this government's budget, which is a pretty extraordinary admission of failure. And everything Australian workers have been through together, and particularly after the last year of struggle, the thanks they get from the Morrison government is a cut in real wages. It's a stunning outcome from the budget and not an outcome which this minister should be proud of in any shape or form. And yet he responded to questions today with the smugness and spin that we've become accustomed to from this government, which is quite happy to make all sorts of announcements and walk away from the consequences for ordinary Australians. That's what this government does. It's announcement, 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 re-announcement, re-announcement, re-announcement. But they walk away from the consequences of what their actions are in budgets that affect the ordinary Australians. We've seen the same shirking of responsibility with the Morrison government, the response in the horrific bushfires. We've seen it with the floods. We've seen it with recovery from natural disasters. We've seen it with the quarantine rollout, the quarantine, the vaccination. We've seen it in aged care, and we've seen it with that litany of failure, the vaccine rollout, that they continue to become a failure to act in the best interests of working Australians, a failure to take any responsibility and a failure to act. Labor has said all along that part of the task at hand is getting unemployment down but also in addressing underemployment. People can't find the hours to work that they need to support their loved ones, and we know that, and this minister knows, until that's addressed, then we won't get wages growth. And the minister knows very well there are other issues which are preventing people from getting good, secure, well-paid jobs. The industrial relations system, the childcare system, skills and training, concentrated disadvantage, a whole range of issues which haven't just been ignored over the last eight long years of this government, but actively made worse. Having racked up all of that debt and spent all of that money, Minister Birmingham and his government is missing a massive opportunity to set the economy up for the future, where working people actually get a slice of the action when it comes to this economic recovery because it's not simply a recovery of Australian workers are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Deloitte Access Economics has forecast that workers could be waiting for up to five years for wages growth to return to 2 per cent. Five years. Two million Australians are either without a job or don't have enough hours and wages are stagnant. 
What is very, very clear is that this government is using the pandemic to continue to lock in low wages and insecure work, and it has every intention, every intention of continuing that mission. What we can look forward to under this government is a patchy recovery that is defined by even weaker wages growth, followed record wa low, low wages growth under the Liberals prior to the pandemic. What we all know is that wages growth has been too slow for too long. And with the current condition of our economy and the policies to repress wages presided over by this government, unemployment may need to go very low before wages growth hits acceptable levels and starts to feed through into inflation. This government has presided over a repression of wages in this country over eight long years. Huge numbers of jobs casualised and pushed into labour hire, relentless attacks on unions, offshoring jobs, constantly arguing for tiny or no increases in the minimum wage, a wages policy to crush the wages of its own employees that just beggars belief. What we need is a real vision, not this pathetic rabble that responds to newspaper headlines and no coherent Thank you, plan Senator for the Earth, country. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. You know, I, I, I just look at you guys over there, and clearly you weren't paying attention in Year 7 economics. I mean, there's a book at the moment that perhaps you should have a look at. Economics for Today. It's a Year 7 textbook, and it might help you understand. There's a little principle in economics called supply and demand. So when you work on reducing unemployment and workers become harder to come by, it actually means employers will pay them more. Now, do we need to have a little talk about inflation as well? Because when last year we were in the midst of a global pandemic and businesses were closing down and shutting their doors and all these states were locking up their borders, that made it harder for people to maintain their jobs. So what the Morrison government did was ensure that people could still put their kids in childcare by making it free. So when we look at inflation figures and all of a sudden lots of costs that families normally endure no longer have a cost, that means there's a thing called lower inflation. So when we get lower inflation and we look at what that means to wages in the year where we get higher inflation, that means it kind of looks like real wages are going down, but in effect they're not. It's just being covered by the return to what we would call a more normal rate of inflation around three, three and a half per cent rather than zero, as was experienced during the 2020 pandemic pretty much across the globe. But, you know, let's talk back a little bit more about job creation, because I know, you know, you guys get your wages primarily from the unions and they're probably on a scale, so they go up indexed every year, you know, more on confidence rather than capability, but let's never let that get in the way of a promotion within the union movement. But for those of us that live in the real world, the 80 per cent of people who are employed by small and medium-sized businesses, their wages are determined by how successful their business is and the business that they work in, how tough it is for their employers to get staff because if it's harder to get a staff member, you normally need to offer more money or an inducement to get them to come and work in your business. Again, let's come back for all of those that didn't pay attention, supply and demand. When the demand for workers is greater and the supply is shorter, wages will go up. So last night in the budget, we saw what the Morrison government is doing to ensure that the Australian economy keeps powering on. We are best place in the world with our recovery. The fact that we have a health situation, that the virus has been suppressed, not the McGowan strategy of you know, completely extinguishing it, but the suppression strategy that was actually what we undertook at the beginning, that that's been successful, and the fact that businesses are thriving and that we're starting to see life in a lot of ways go back to pre-COVID conditions, 
We want to make sure that that economic growth continues. We want to make sure that businesses are able to continue to expand and employ more people. So how are we going to do that? We're going to ensure that things like the instant asset write-off continue into the future so that we continue to see the capital markets, so that we see people investing in machinery for their businesses or the tradie can buy the new ute. We're making childcare more targeted when we talk to low- and middle-income families, so we're going to make it easier and more affordable for people to take on additional days of work. So it's the Morrison government that's focused on seeing businesses grow. It's the Morrison government that's committed to ensuring Australia's economy comes back. And it's the Morrison government that is putting Australia and its workers first. Now, over 99 per cent of these businesses with over, that employ over 11 million workers, when they write off their eligible asset, we have also seen that those businesses that traditionally suffer during times of downturn have in fact thrived. So if you go out to w, WJ Matthews in Moree, there's been a fair few headers and tractors bought that would have normally not happened. That's a significant number of jobs for a country town. Guess what? It's pretty tough to get a mechanic out there. Supply and demand, guys. It's how you keep the wages growing. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Deputy President, and uh, you know it's always good to hear from my, my good friend on the other side of the aisle, Senator Hughes, uh, talking about numbers and economics, because as if the Liberal Party are the only ones that can understand such concepts. Uh, but what they fail to understand, I guess, the, the, the question, the very question that Senator Wong had asked today to Senator Birmingham, who is meant to be the Minister for Finance, on page 37, there were very simple questions. It's very simple questions with respect to um, cuts to real wages. Because when you do look at the numbers and you do look at the figures in the budget paper, budget paper number one, Deputy President, on page 37, it is very clear that there is a cut, a cut from, uh, from 1.8 down to 1.25. Now, that's simple accounting. I don't know what you want to call it, Senator Hughes, but that is very simple maths when it comes to very clear cuts to real wages for Australian workers by this federal government, the Morrison Liberal National Government. So let's not forget that. Black and white, page 37. And yet they couldn't answer that simple question, three simple questions, in fact. The first one that Senator Wong had put to Senator, to Senator Birmingham. And it took a while for the government to finally, finally acknowledge, yes, $1 trillion, $1 trillion of debt. Who would have thought? I remember going to uni, studying economics, and never in my wildest dreams would I ever be in this place imagining that we would be confronted with $1 trillion of debt and growing. I did not miss the pandemic, Minister, but it is just amazing when those opposite try to lecture us on this side that they somehow are better economic managers than us. But quite frankly, the record speaks for itself. So once again, what we've had is, much, is more spin than substance. And we know that this budget has been handed down last night is by no means a budget whose purpose is to support working people. Nor is it a budget that it is what it takes to usher forward the recovery of the Australian economy from the pandemic. And this should hardly be surprising. After eight long years under the Liberal National Government, we've all become rather used to budgets like these. One only has to look at the flop of last year's budget, job maker scheme. You know, the headline be 450,000 new jobs. Well, where are they, Minister? Where are they? Come on, 450,000 jobs. Where are they? But yet the budget is forecasting that we maintain migration levels at 160,000. So this government's priority is bringing about more foreign workers into this country rather than supporting local Australians finding work. Now, unemployment is around that 5 to 6 per cent, and that will fluctuate. It will. It will. And yet this government has no incentives in encouraging those people to find work. You know, there are lots of businesses around the country right now who are screaming murder. They need workers. They need help. Yeah, but what are the incentives of getting those people into a job? 
But it feels like this budget is all about trying to make sure that we can get migrants into this country. Cooks, you know, chefs, we've had people about nursing. Are we really not in a position to train our young people into these jobs? Well, I, don't you worry, Minister. I'll be going through this and I'll be making my contributions in this place and making my, my views well known about where this government's lack of history or hi of um, supporting traineeships. Because what we've seen is a cut, not an increase of support. You've taken out $400 million out of universities. Come on, at a time, at a time, at a time where we need to be upskilling people, upskilling people. Come on, Minister. And in 12 uh, months, 12 months. Yeah. Um, 12 months on, we know the facts. 12 months on, we know that the job maker scheme, originally funded for $4 billion, has actually only delivered $100 million of that amount, and only 2.5 per cent of what was spruiked has actually made it out the door. Now, I don't have much time left, but I did also want to touch on the fact that household debt in Australia is at scary levels. Scary levels. Like we are looking at household debt. Uh, at around 185 per cent when you look at the ratios. I mean, how on earth can people pay off their debt when this government keeps cutting wages of Australian workers? You are, and shame on the government. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I think the Labor Party have jumped ahead just a couple of steps because when we talk about wage growth in Australia, that obviously implies that someone has a job. And thanks to the economic stewardship of the Morrison government through the most calamitous economic event since the Great Depression to beset this nation, more Australians are back in work. In fact, 75,000 more Australians are in work than they were in March 2020. So I think to set the record straight today, it's worth stepping back and cutting through the spin that we hear from those opposite and going back to where this nation was in March last year. And at that time, Treasury uh, feared unemployment would reach 15 per cent and that the economy would contract by an incredible 20 per cent. That would have taken two million Australians out of work, Senator Coney, not in terms of a wage cut but throwing them completely out of employment entirely. In fact, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, we saw almost a million Australians lose their job or be stood down with no hours to work. How far we have come? Now, 13.1 uh, million Australians, or 75,000 more than at the start of the pandemic, are in work. That represents an unemployment rate of 5.6 per cent, which happens to be lower than that bequeathed to us by the Labor Party. Let's not forget their big taxing, big spending agenda had more Australians on the unemployment queues than the economic stewardship of the Morrison government. So what does that actually deliver for Australians? Well, aside from those who uh, enjoy the, the, uh, the benefits of work, the, the connectivity to their communities, the ability to contribute to their families, that 5.6 per cent unemployment rate and a trajectory towards uh, full employment increases the pressure in the labour market that will naturally drive wages growth in this country. So once we see uh, the economy continuing to recover from this global pandemic, and once we see even more Australians in work, which is the fervent hope of everyone over here on the government benches, we will see higher levels of wage growth, higher levels of prosperity, and ultimately it is those healthy and wealthy societies like ours that concentrate on delivering services for the most vulnerable in our communities. At the end of the day, it is the sorts of economic comeback that we see here in Australia today that pays for the increases in NDIS funding, that pays uh, for the increased funding to record levels for our aged care sector. That is the achievement of a strong economy. The Prime Minister, the Treasurer and those in the Morrison government don't talk about a strong economy for the sake of it. We're not obsessing over numbers on uh, you know, page 37 of budget paper number one, trying to find something to quibble over. Instead, we're focused on the lived reality out there in the Australian community and improving it for future generations of Australians. That's the achievement 
that we see here today. Because whilst the economies of the UK, France and Italy contracted by 8 per cent last year, and Japan and Canada contracted by 5 per cent, Australia's economic contraction was limited to just 2.5 per cent, and we are returning to growth in the 21-22 year, financial year. Incredibly, we're talking about GDP growth of 4.25 per cent in the financial year ahead. That is the benefit of the Morrison government's economic stewardship, and that is what will deliver wage growth in Australia going forward. The outcome was driven uh, that we see today uh, by stronger growth in private sector wages, which increased 0.7 per cent to be 1.4 per cent higher than they were a year ago. So the wage price index in Australia has actually increased to be 1.4 per cent higher than it was a year ago. But the Morrison government isn't done yet. No, we're not resting on our laurels after delivering the strongest quarterly outcome in private sector wage growth since March 2014, and in fact the second best quarterly result under this government. We will continue to manage the economy, to promote full employment, to keep Australians in work and to deliver for those uh, most vulnerable Australians who rely on a strong economy to provide the safety net that they depend on. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And we asked a very simple question of Senator Birmingham today, a question that Australians want an answer to. How long will they have to wait for a pay rise under this government? How long? And they are still waiting. They are waiting for an answer to this critical question and they are waiting for some evidence that this government even cares, even cares about their wages. Uh, but we can find some evidence for the Australian people uh, to help answer this critical question that we asked on their behalf, on their behalf today, in the pathetic record of this government already on wages. The pathetic record eight long years of record low wage growth under this government. Eight long years of low wages as a deliberate design feature, a deliberate design feature of their economic plan. And now, today, Australians are expected to believe that Australia is coming back, as the Treasurer said last night, coming back while their wages are falling behind coming back while their wages are, and I repeat, falling behind. There is no recovery from this pandemic that leaves workers behind. There is no recovery that lets Australians' wages go backwards. There is no recovery without good, secure jobs for Australian workers. And this government needed to deliver that plan this week. They needed to deliver, and they failed. They failed. Australians are still waiting for an answer to their question, when will we have good, secure jobs under this government? When will we have a pay rise under this government? When will we even have an answer to the question from this government? Because beneath the gloss of last night's announcements, there was a very clear message to the workers of Australia. And it was that the Liberals love low wages. You love them. You love Australians to have low wages. Low wages, according to you, a deliberate design feature of your economic plan. And under this budget, real wages for Australians go backwards. Under this budget, they go backwards. And it is not good enough. It is not good enough for workers who've been waiting years for a pay rise, but instead have seen wage growth slow to record lows under this government. It is not good enough for the essential workers who carried the nation through this pandemic. And the thanks that they get for that from Scott Morrison, uh, from the Treasurer, is a cut to their real wages. A cut to their real wages. A cut to their real wages. It is not good enough for the low-paid workers of this country and the growing number of people in insecure jobs who find it harder and harder to make ends meet. And Labor knows, and Australians know, 
that there is no recovery when workers are left behind. We know that the Liberals' happy place, though, is attacking wages. They have been doing it for years. They were coming after workers' wages earlier this year with their nasty IR bill, and the budget it speaks for itself on wages. You only have to get to page nine, page nine to see that wages for working people will fall even further behind, not even keeping up with inflation. And after all of this, after announcing spending of $100 billion and racking up a trillion dollars in debt, Australians will not see a pay rise under this government. They will not see a pay rise under this government. So let's be clear what this means. Real wages are continuing to fall and the government will not be getting any more money into the pockets of working Australians. They have no plans to get wages moving. What an admission of failure. And how many times did the Prime Minister try to go out and thank and shake the hands of essential workers during the pandemic? The supermarket workers, the cleaners, the early childhood educators, the delivery drivers, those low-wage workers who prove themselves to be essential day in, day out. Who does the Prime Minister think will suffer the most from wages falling behind even further? Those essential workers, those people who got us through 2020 with with their hard work. This is the thanks that this government gives them. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that motion is moved by Senator Urquhart to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move to take note of the response provided to my questions by Minister Birmingham. And in question time, I asked him repeatedly about the public subsidies to encourage the burning of fossil fuels that are contained in this budget, and uh, he uh, consistently failed to acknowledge that point. He dissembled, he changed the subject, he answered questions that weren't asked. But what he did not ever mention was the $51 billion of direct subsidies, public funds, in this budget allocated to encourage the burning of fossil fuels. <clears throat> now, the state, the absolutely bleedingly obvious, our climate is breaking down around us. It's going to be catastrophic for billions of people. <clears throat> we have mere years to prevent the worst effects of the climate catastrophe and every single day counts in our response. And what do we see in the government's response yesterday? <coughs> Handouts for fossil fuel companies, favourable treatment for billionaires to encourage more environmental destruction and the ongoing burning of coal, oil and gas. I mean, this is a budget put together by climate criminals. And they can't say that they didn't know, because at the same time that they are giving that $50 billion plus of public subsidies to encourage the burning of fossil fuels, they are intervening to insure homes that are becoming uninsurable exactly because of climate change. <coughs> The government is offering a token amount of money for disaster responses, that is, responses to disasters like droughts, fires and floods that we know are going to be made more common and more intense as a result of climate change, driven primarily by the burning of fossil fuels and the destruction of forests and land clearing, all of those things that this government puts public subsidies into. I mean, this is a government that is both the arsonist and is trying to claim that they're, for, they're the fire brigade. And if paying billionaires directly to open up new <coughs> gas fields and uh, to implement the burning of gas wasn't bad enough, they are also refusing to make billionaires pay their fair share of tax. Australia's billionaires increased their wealth 
by $90 billion last year, in the middle of a global pandemic, when so many Australians were doing it so tough, and they have not, not been asked to chip in a single cent of that obscene growth in their wealth to help us fund the services that Australian people want. Better hospitals, better public education, better public transport systems, better disability support, just to name a few. And meanwhile, on the government's own projections, wages will go backwards in real terms for the next two years. Let's think about that. Wages to go backwards in real terms for the next two years. Now, this is not a bug. This is not an unintended consequence of this budget. It is a feature of this budget because the major donors to the LNP want to keep wages low so they can keep making obscene profits and they can keep dodging their responsibilities to fund the essential public services that Australians want and expect from their governments. Wages are going backwards in real terms because that is exactly what this government wants because their major donors in this regime of institutionalised bribery that is called political donations in this country want wages to go backwards. Shrinking wages and uh, the other side of that coin, of course, is house prices spiralling out of control. Again, that's not a bug. That's not an unintended consequence. It's a feature. You're pricing a whole generation of young people out of the housing market and you are deliberately causing wages to go backwards. Shame on you all. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there, any motion, oh, sorry, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Firavanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of 15 legislative instruments as set out in the list I have provided to the clerk. I advise the chamber that the list will be circulated to senators with today's notices. Senator Rustin. Um, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provision of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to various bills allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. I also table statements of reasons justifying the need for the bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated in Hansard. Senator McKim? Oh no, sorry, sorry. sorry. Anyone else seeking the call? Senator Urquhart? Draw a mo no motion listed today. Can I do that here? Yeah, sure. By leave, okay, you can so do I withdraw. Sorry. By leave, you can do anything. Oh, by leave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I seek leave yep. to move a, to withdraw a motion. Um, it's in the name of Senator Pratt, Business of the Senate, number two. Thank you. If leave is granted. I'll take that as given. There being no other people giving notices, senators. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 16th of April 2021 of the Hon. Andrew Sharp Peacock AC, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the division of Kuyong in Victoria from 1966 to 1994. I call the Leader of the Government and the Senate. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former minister and member of the House of Representatives, the Hon. Andrew Sharp Peacock AC. Leave is granted. Mr. President, I move that the Senate expresses its sadness at the death on 16 April 2021 of the Honourable Andrew Sharp Peacock AC, former leader of the Liberal Party and Minister for Foreign Affairs and former member for Kuyong, places on record its admiration and appreciation for his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its deep sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Mr. President, the Honourable Andrew Sharp Peacock, the cult from Kuyong, is a great Australian and a loyal icon and servant of the Liberal Party. A larger-than-life man with the charisma to match, he served his nation devotedly across a lifetime of public service. Born in Melbourne on 13 February 1939, Andrew studied at Scotch College before going on to study law at Melbourne University. He got his start in politics early, joining the Liberal Party as a teenager. In 1965, at the age of 26, Andrew became the youngest ever president of the Victorian Division 
of the Liberal Party of Australia. Just a year later, he was elected to parliament in the 1966 by-election caused by the resignation of the Right Honourable Sir Robert Menzies in the seat of Kuyong. The constituency of Kuyong would return Andrew to the seat at 12 further electorates. All up, Andrew served 28 years, five months and 15 days as the member for Kuyong. About 10 of those years were spent serving as a government minister. Despite his young age upon being elected to parliament, Andrew's rapid ascendancy continued swiftly. After just a few years in the parliament, then Prime Minister Gorton appointed Andrew to his cabinet in 1969 as the minister assisting the Prime Minister and the Minister for Army during the Vietnam War. Andrew was aged just 30 years old at the time. He also held responsibility for a variety of portfolios, serving as Minister for External Territories, Cabinet, Environment, Foreign Affairs, Industrial Relations and Industry and Commerce under Prime Ministers Gorton, McMahon and Fraser. As Minister for Foreign Affairs, he discharged the role with distinction and won the respect of Australia's close allies, especially in the immediate region. Andrew leveraged his strong and sincere relationship with the people of Papua New Guinea to help oversee its transition to full self-government and independence. His role in Papua New Guinea's independence cannot and should not be overstated. The Papua New Guinean government later made him an honorary Grand Companion of the Order of Logahu, their highest honour. Following the defeat of the Fraser government in 1983, Andrew took the reins of the Liberal Party as its leader and leader of the opposition. When then Prime Minister Hawke called an early election in 1984, Andrew Peacock was a clear underdog. However, he was widely credited. Without campaigning Hawke during a long campaign and certainly with reducing the margin of the Hawke government at the time. In his second stint as leader, Andrew led a strong campaign in the 1990 election, narrowly achieving a majority of the vote, but was narrowly defeated overall. At a speech on the occasion of Andrew's 80th birthday in 2019, he reflected back on those battles, the Liberal leadership and particularly the contest for the Prime Ministership. And he said, unlike most of my colleagues, I did not hunger for the job as Prime Minister. I truly was more interested in what we were doing than the post itself. I wanted good posts. I wanted to be the Foreign Minister. But being Prime Minister was not the central orient. It wasn't the central purpose to what I was doing. I mean, it was still important and it was disappointing to lose. I don't want to put it down. But I wasn't sitting there like some plotting to be Prime Minister. It wasn't in my nature. My friend, former Minister and former Senator of South Australia, Amanda Vanstone, tells me in reflecting on Andrew Peacock, she said that he rose above the slings, arrows and disappointments of politics. She said he did not let bitterness infest him. That, Mr President, is an important lesson and legacy that Andrew leads for all of us who pass through this place. Indeed, Mr President Andrew continued to approach politics and public life with dignity and an unmistakable toughness, matched by his sense of humour and typically affable manner. Amanda also told me of a classic story of one night, by then in the new parliament, of how Andrew sat watching other people, recounting that he said if someone pushed the cork into an empty bottle, he was sure he could remove it without breaking the bottle. She said that like a fly fisherman teasing the water, he managed to draw them in. 20 bucks per person was apparently the bet. Amanda credits herself as being lucky not to get sucked in. Others not so lucky. She said that he scooped the pool, collected his cash after managing to extract the cork, one of many party tricks and much amusement forming around the room. She hasn't yet uh, expl explained to me exactly how the trick is managed to be achieved. In similarly fond reflections of Andrew Peacock uh, as someone able to impart a good sense of humour, sometimes even at his own expense, former leader of the government in the Senate, Robert Hill, recounts a memory he had with Andrew. He said he was always fun, 
I remember at a meeting in Athens, someone was giving a rather boring speech. Peacock looked at me, pulled out a set of hotel room keys and dropped them on the table. He then looked at me and said, Shirley's, with a mischievous smile and a wink. Robert, though, went on to say that beyond the charm and style, Andrew Peacock had a substance, focused on sensible, practical public policy outcomes, directed to benefit those who most needed the support of government. Robert said it's why I thought he would make a good Prime Minister. As those personal stories from those who knew Andrew well reveal, he was authentic, humorous, but had his heart in the right place and a head for good policy. He will be remembered fondly by those on both sides of the political aisle as a man who approached politics with dignity and toughness. After his formal political career ended in 1994, Andrew continued his public service as a distinguished and successful Australian ambassador to the United States. As former Prime Minister John Howard said of his appointment of his former political rival as ambassador, I welcomed the opportunity of appointing him as Australia's ambassador to the United States in 1996. He discharged that role with much distinction. His knowledge of American politics enabled him to provide special insights regarding our most important ally. Australia lost a man who brought flair and style as well as high intelligence to his years in public life. Mr President, I know that the current Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, would wish to be here if she could to speak of her dear friend, her former employer and one of her mentors in Andrew Peacock. It's notable that she is out walking in the steps of Andrew as our Foreign Minister today, representing our nation overseas. And I know that Maurice looks forward and will value the opportunity to reflect on Andrew more formally on another occasion. Andrew Peacock was a great man, a great Australian who gave much to our nation and a great Liberal. On behalf of the Australian Government and the Senate, Mr President, I extend our sincerest condolences to Andrew's wife, Penny, his three daughters, Anne, Carolyn and Jane, and the thanks of a grateful nation for the service that he gave. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I rise on behalf of the opposition to express our condolences following the passing of the Hon. Andrew Sharp Peacock AC. And I convey at the outset our sympathy to his family and friends, and particularly acknowledge my counterpart, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, who I know has had a long association with him since her earliest days working in politics. Well, Andrew Peacock combined substance and style, and he advanced liberal causes throughout a three-decade career as a parliamentarian and later as a diplomat. And he was present during important mo moments in our history and in world history, from our engagement in Vietnam and the independence of Papua New Guinea, to leading the Liberal Party to two elections, and of course as Australia's ambassador to the United States. <clears throat> that he never became Prime Minister is for some a great shame, but he accomplished a great deal in his career, both inside and outside the parliament. And on our side, he will always have respect for the stature he gave classical liberal values and for the force with which he advocated them internally and publicly. He put liberalism at the centre of the Liberal Party, even when, there, when that meant having difficult battles with those leading the growing movement towards hardline conservatism. And I hope that reflections on his passing inspire those of more classically liberal persuasions to find their voice and renew his legacy. Andrew Peacock's early life quickly turned to politics. Uh, he went to the University of Melbourne, where he completed a Bachelor of Laws degree, but of course the pull was always towards a different vocation. And his political interests saw him unsuccessfully contest a House seat in 1961, and he became the youngest ever president of the Victorian division of the Liberal Party in 1965. And just a year later, still well before he was 30 years of age, he succeeded in obtaining a seat in Parliament following the retirement of Robert Menzies. And so the parliamentary career of the cult from Kuyong was born, and the cult indeed bolted from the gate. He would attain ministerial office before the decade was out, serving as minister assisting the Prime Minister and Minister for the Army under Prime Minister Gorton and then under Billy McMahon, who added minister assisting the Treasurer. And there are obviously undoubted challenges serving in, 
as Army Minister as the Vietnam War grew in unpopularity. These were probably compounded by serving alongside Malcolm Fraser as Defence Minister, with the debate between them a portent of how the relationship between the two would continue to play out. In 1972, uh, Prime Minister McMahon made Peacock Minister, Mr Peacock Minister for Territories, which included Papua New Guinea, and for his efforts in supporting PNG, he would be later appointed a Chief Grand Companion of the Order of Lagohu. When Mr Fraser became Prime Minister in 1975, he appointed Andrew Peacock as his Minister for Foreign Affairs, and as my colleague Senator Birmingham has said, it is probably for this position that he is perhaps best remembered. And his capacity to move in international circles with a great deal of ease, building alliances and friendships, served him and our nation well. He was a trusted voice for the nation on the world stage. He understood that among the roles of the foreign minister is to both explain the world to Australia and Australia to the world. His liberal values guided his approach and he sought results based on these principles. In his role in supporting the newly independent Papua New Guinea, he continued a strong friendship with Sir Michael Samare, whose passing we also recently marked in this place. Other key foreign policy challenges he confronted in our region, including the developing relationship with China, the fallout from the war in Vietnam, uh, Indonesian incorporation of East Timor, and the rise of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. On Cambodia, Australia's recognition of Pol Pot's regime in what was then known as so-called democratic Kampuchea was a source of division within the Fraser government and of particular disagreement between Mr Fraser and his foreign minister. Mr Peacock was strongly opposed to recognition, a matter he argued in cabinet and in the House of Representatives as well with, as with the prime minister directly. His arguments with Fraser became especially heated when the evidence came to light of the torturing and death of two Australians, David Scott and Ron Dean, at the hands of the Khmer Rouge. Mr Peacock's principled stance stand against a regime that committed atrocities on an abominable scale was both a statement about the monstrous nature of the violations taking place, something he had warned about on previous occasions, but also about the fundamental duties of a national government to its people. He stated, and I quote, our primary duty was to our own bloody citizen. Words still relevant today. Mr Peacock found himself on the outer following his public disagreement with Mr Fraser. And his opposition to recognition of Pol Pot's regime was a matter he highlighted when changing from foreign affairs to the industrial relations portfolio following the 1980 election and when he later resigned from the ministry in 1981. He unsuccessfully challenged for the leadership but would return to cabinet in 1982 for a brief period as Minister for Industry and Commerce. The election of the Hawke Labor government in 1983 and the return of Labor governments to the next four federal polls in an unbroken period of government until 1996 saw Andrew Peacock spend the remainder of his parliamentary career in opposition. It also paved the way for the battle between two adversaries in the same party, Mr Peacock and Mr Howard. This tussle between wet and dry and between two individuals committed to different visions of the Liberal Party and, of the nation, and for the nation became a defining alternative political narrative for nearly a decade and involved a constant tug of war over who was leader. Mr Peacock led the Liberals to losses in 1984 and 1990. During the latter campaign, his capacity to power Prime Minister came under significant attack. But it is worth noting that during that election, the coalition received, to his credit, more than 50 per cent of the vote, and yet he accepted that result with the spirit in which with which our democracy should be conducted. Andrew Peacock resigned from Parliament in September of 1994, and he was appointed to serve as Australia's ambassador to the United States. And he found himself as our representative to our principal ally. As the Clinton administration grappled with the changing dynamics in geopolitics following the end of the Cold War, including the 1998 Kosovo War, and in 1997, he was recognised for service to the parliament, to politics, to the formula for the formulation and implementation of defence and foreign policy when he was appointed as a companion to the Order of Australia. Andrew Peacock had a precocious political life and a prodigious career. He is widely commended for his performance in key posts, including minister and ambassador. And whilst the ultimate political expectation many held for him of the prime ministership was not fulfilled, he nonetheless had a distinguished period of service to our nation. 
He described his greatest defeat, surprisingly perhaps, as the loss in, loss in the 1974 Melbourne Cup. By course he part owned, saying, she came second and she was favourite, but she got caught in the shadows of the post. That was a shattering blow. Unfortunately, this might have been somewhat of an analogy for his own career, although it says something that he thought that was his greatest defeat. John Howard reflected, following Mr Peacock's passing, Australia lost a man who brought flair and style as well as high intelligence to his years in public office. Andrew Peacock set new standards in Australian politics. And I again close by expressing, on behalf of the Labor Party, our condolences and deepest sympathy uh, following his passing to his family, friends and to his party. Well, I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I thank senators. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Smith. Uh, leave of absence. I'm just. Uh, I'll come back if you'd like. Yes, please. Yep. That would be great. Uh, are there any other matters to postpone or rearrange? Okay, well, up oh, the clerk. We'll do the clerk. Call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion 1100 for today to the next day of sitting. General business 1096 for today to the 15th of June. General business notice of motion 1097 for today to the 15th of June. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall move to the, to the discovery of formal business and I'll try and deal with them in a motion conducive to the chamber. Senator Dunham, could I come to government business number one? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business uh, notice of motion number one uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunham, number two. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number two uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll now go to 1098. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I advise that Senators Rice, Keneally, Chacon and Wong have added their names to General Business Notice of Motion number 1098 relating to victims of the Holocaust, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion standing in my name in the names of Senators Abetz, Hughes, McLaughlin, Griff, Kitching, Rice, Keneally, Chacon and Wong. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick, are you in a position to deal with matter 1091? Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1091, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick. I present the bill and move that the bill may proceed uh, without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the Hansard, and to continue my remarks. Leave granted. It is. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Waters, could I come to business of the Senate matter number one, matter number one please? Yes. Thank you, President. I ask that uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number one, uh, referring the. Uh, 
NAIF bill to a committee for inquiry be taken as a formal motion? Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I take leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr. President. The statutory uh, review of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility informs the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Extension and Other Measures Bill 2021. More than 122 face to face meetings were conducted across nine locations in the North. An engagement with over 100 different entities occurred during the review from July 2019 until late 2020. The Select Committee on the Effectiveness of the uh, Northern Australia Agenda then also extensively considered the NAIF reforms and recommended this legislation, which gives effect to the reforms recommended by the review, be passed by the Parliament as a priority. A further committee inquiry is unnecessary. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The opposition will be opposing this motion moved by Senator Waters to send the bill to the committee. The NAIF is due to cease operations on 31 June this year. To delay the passing of this bill would jeopardise the NAIF extension and therefore risk the remaining $2.2 billion in funding, which the NAIF is still to allocate to projects in Northern Australia. To allow this uh, to happen would be reckless. Communities and businesses in Northern Australia deserve the opportunity to put their hand up for those remaining funds, and Labor won't stand in their way. We support the NAIF and we support the extension. Question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawatt, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. I'll be ringing the bells for one minute for a period. Can we go to matter number 1092, Senator Dunningham? President, I advise that Senator Ciccone and Senator Mackenzie have added their names to general business notice of motion number 1092 relating to Victoria's forest industry, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator, there is. Oh, there is. Senator you know, 1094, Senators Seawitt and Faruqi. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1094 um, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawitt. I move the motion. Senator Gallagher. Okay. Um, this is 1094. 1094. I yeah, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. And I think we have tried uh, to work with the Greens to amend this, but unsuccessfully. Um, so, just for the record, if the intent of this motion by the Greens party is to express support for the Indian Australian community, we support that intent. If the intent of the motion is to oppose the jailing of Australian citizens for returning home, then we support that intent. But this motion goes further than that, and that's why Labor cannot support the motion. The motion would see the Senate override the advice of our medical experts. Uh, which is not our role. The only way we can bring home the 40,000 stranded Australians, including those citizens from India, is for Scott Morrison to finally roll out the vaccine here in Australia and accept his responsibility to safely expand Australia's quarantine capacity so that all Australians can again call Australia home. Question. Senator Hanson. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One, uh, well, one Nation will not be supporting this, this notice of motion. I feel very offended that they use the word this is a racist travel ban. It's ba it is based on the fact is that India is a it is under a pandemic pandemic and no one will uh, will disagree with that. The whole fact is decisions have to be made what is in the best in interest of Australia and to bring people back into Australia based on a pandemic. Over the period of time here in Australia we have found that the premise of borders drop at the drop of a hat or one COVID infection close the borders, which affects businesses, people and their jobs and communities. If we allow people into the country that do have the pandemic, we are going to have to deal with that if we can, and we've seen what's happened in hotel accommodation. I know that um, uh, all I want to say is to say this is racist is belittling to the people of Australia, and I think it's disgusting Order. that you've put Senator it to that Hanson without based on fact. The statement has expired. I'm going to put the motion. 
Question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt and Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1094 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator to see what teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. Could we come to matter number 1101 in the name of Senator Canavan and others? Senator Canavan? Senator Canavan? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I uh, ask that Senators Watt and Chisholm be added to general business notice of motion number 1101 relating to the Australian beef industry, and it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion? Order. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. Add that to the list. Can we now go to motion number 1093 in the name of Senator Thorpe? You can do it from wherever, Senator Thorpe. Order, Senator Thorpe. 
Notice of motion number 1093 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. The question is Senator Dunham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr. President. While the Commonwealth is unable to set the individual approaches of states and territories to their criminal justice systems, the Morrison government is committed to engaging with all Australian governments by working in partnership with Indigenous Australians through the National Agreement on Closing the Gap and the Justice Policy Partnership to address the drivers of Indigenous incarceration and improve justice and community safety outcomes for Indigenous Australians. Question is motion. Senator Roberts. Short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Pauline Hanson's One Nation supports this motion. Firstly, honesty is essential, so let's be blunt. This applies to kids of all skin colours. The current catch and release policies are failing. Incarceration fails and can turn juvenile offenders into hardened criminals. The foremost responsibility is community safety, to keep people safe from derailed juveniles. The root cause, though, is, com at a, is at a community level and involves the whole family because the root cause is dysfunctional families abusing kids, neglecting kids, allowing kids to wag school and roam the streets. Elders in white and black communities have lost their influence. Solutions, though, need to be rigorous and not feel-good pandering. We need proper, tough, rigorous programs like boot camps that care and that develop meaning and purpose, such as Three Big Rivers. Hard Yakka, Black Rock, and what they're trying to do now in Townsville at the One Community, One Standard. We support this motion. Question is motion number 1093, moved by Senator Thorpe, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1093 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell off the noes. Senator Thorpe. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for imminent divisions. We will come to matter number 1095 in the name of Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 1095 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is, there any, is leave granted to amend the motion? It is. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I amend the, the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion as amended. The question is that motion be agreed to. Though, oh, sorry, Senator Faruqi. Short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The last thing we need right now is One Nation's reactionary meddling in important and carefully considered proposed changes to the Australian curriculum. We've seen this before on curriculum matters with their paranoid, transphobic ranting about indoctrination in our schools. Last year, it was One Nation's attempt to rewrite the curriculum to teach climate denialism and harmful conservative ideas of gender and sexuality. And now they're worried about the overwhelming whiteness of the curriculum being dialed down just a notch. Australia is a highly multicultural country with a rich history of First Nations custodianship and care. It is entirely appropriate and essential that this is reflected in the Australian curriculum. We should be teaching all students the truth of invasion, genocide and colonialism. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Roberts as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Roberts as, agreed to, as amended 1095 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith, tell of the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Polly, 1099. Do you have the ability to do that, Senator Urquhart? Thank you. Mr. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1099 be taken as formal is motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. So we'll go to the usual routine to recycle business. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to move general business notices of motion numbers 1092 and 1101 together and for the motions to be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Uh, 1092 and 1101, the two that were denied formality earlier. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent uh, general business notices of motion number 1092 and 1101 being moved together immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And just with regard to 1092, adding the names of Senators Ciccone and Mackenzie and tabling statements relating to those motions. The question is that motion to suspend standing orders to allow consideration of those motions without amendment or debate be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I only heard one voice. Senator Patrick. Once the standing order 100, I'd like my name recorded as a no. Recorded as such, so I'll declare the motion carried. I'll now put motions number 1092 and 1101 together, unless um, uh, you can only seek leave, Senator Seward. Um, uh, can I seek leave? We'll be can I ask they be put separately yes, because we're voting differently? I was about to ask that. I will put them separately then. Senator Rice. To make a short statement. Leave is not no, granted. Well, can I table my statement leave then on leave 1092? Granted to table a statement? It is. Senator Roberts. A short statement. Uh, with respect to which motion, Senator one, Roberts? One, uh, 1101. All right. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rice, what number, just for the record, was your motion statement in relation to? 1092. Thank you. I will put them separately in accordance with the request from Senator Seward. With respect to motion number 1092, those in agreement say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1092 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 49, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that motion number 1101 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Is someone in the opposition? Yep, Senator Gallagher. Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to move motion number 1099 from Senator Polly um, and that it be determined without amendment or debate. The question is, that, uh, is leave granted? Senator Gallagher? Uh, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving motion number 1099. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Only one voice, Senator Patrick. <laughs> Senator Patrick. <laughs> In accordance with standing order 100, I'd like to be recorded as a no. So recorded. So the question is that now, now that motion number 1099 be agreed to. Um, no, it's, I'm, I'm, yep. So the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunham. I'll just table our statement related Senator to Dunham that. Senator Dunham tabling the statement. That concludes, as far as I'm looking at the clerk with hopeful eyes, that I have the, it concluded the discovery of formal business. And I'm correct. Senator Smith. You were correct. Uh, at the placing of business, uh, I was required to seek leave to move a motion related to, relating to leave of absence for Senator Henderson. Uh, is leave granted? It is, Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Henderson for today on account of electorate activity. Uh, thank you. We uh, will put those, that question. Those in favour, please say aye. All those against, declare it carried. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with the Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Thorpe. Is the proposal supported? 
I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerk to set the clock accordingly. And we have Senator Walters. You have the call. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the matter of urgency that it is a disgrace that in the 2021-2022 federal budget uh, it fast-tracks climate collapse, pouring more new money into the coal, oil and gas industry. Now that's exactly what last night's budget did, as if the fossil fuel sector wasn't already getting enough public support with fossil fuel subsidies running at almost $9 billion a year. Well, last night that got increased, and then they got a whole new bucket of subsidies to add to that existing, already obscenely large bucket of subsidies. And I'm going to go through the figures with each of the indefensible amounts of public money that have been given not just to these big corporations but to these big corporations and mining billionaires that are wrecking the planet and making life difficult and more difficult for all of us. So not only did last night's budget do absolutely nothing to help the transition to 100 per cent clean renewable energy, which will create more jobs and might help us save what's left of the Great Barrier Reef, not only was there a complete absence of climate action, but this government is actively funding climate collapse. The obscene amounts of billions of dollars of public money um, is just utterly reprehensible. So um, we saw that last night was a, a pre-election sweetener that really failed to make billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of tax whilst fast-tracking climate collapse. Now, of course, instead of uh, taxing the billionaires, we've got uh, stage three tax cuts locked in, um, and instead of making the big corporations pay their fair share, the budget's full of corporate welfare. Instead of investing in planet-saving, nation-building infrastructure, it hands billions to fossil fuel companies, further accelerating the climate crisis. So, to those fossil fuel subsidies that I talked about, there's $1.1 billion in new money to oil, gas and coal. Um, next year, it goes up to $11.4 billion. Um, and over the Fords, there's a total of $51 billion, that's billion with a B, in public money uh, going to fossil fuel corporations. Now, that is one of the biggest handouts to the fossil fuel industry in a federal budget ever. And we are in a climate crisis. Honestly, you, you could not design a worse policy, a worse use of public money than to prop up a polluting industry, one in three of whom already pays no corporate tax um, and who are pocketing uh, all sorts of corporate largesse anyway, that are also making the climate crisis worse. Um, and meanwhile, we have this government who just vetoed giving public money to a wind farm with a battery backup for reasons that remain um, uh, known only to the minister himself. So you've got an active war on giving public support to clean energy, and they are falling over themselves to give more public money uh, to fossil fuels, flying in the face of every single climate scientist on the planet and flying in the face of the desperate calls from the community, in particular from the young for urgent climate action to protect their future, and flying in the face of all of the calls from anyone in a low-lying area uh, where saltwater incursion is making it hard for people to grow food and where natural disasters are increasing in severity, in frequency and in destructiveness. So you just could not design a worse approach. So some of the new, new um, uh, absolute doozies that the government's come up with, it's not enough that they give cheap fuel to the likes of Gina Reinhart. Um, and other big mining billionaires. It's not enough. And can I just put on record, we do not object to uh, the diesel fuel rebate for farmers. That has always been our policy, to not object to that. And I think Minister Birmingham um, uh, tried to make an issue of that earlier today, so I'll just have the opportunity to correct the record there. Uh, but that's only about an eighth of that fossil fuel subsidy, I might add. Um, so we've still got that cheap, cheap diesel to, to the likes of Gina. Uh, we've got various concessional excises on aviation, gas, on alternative fuels. Uh, Gas-fired recovery gets $31 billion. So this government um, is so in bed 
with oil and gas and coal, and they're trying to champion gas as the solution? Like, no. Wrong way. Gas is a fossil fuel. You've often got to wreck farmland to get to it. You've then got to use more energy to liquefy it for export, where it bumps up the prices for domestic gas consumption. There is no saving grace in it whatsoever. And the fact that those gas companies make massive donations to your political party is not enough for you to sacrifice our collective future and a livable climate. For shame. Uh, but no, $31.9 billion for a so-called gas-fired recovery. Um, various other fossil fuel subsidies here, accelerated depreciation, uh, deduction for coal, oil and gas exploration, because you're now paying them to do their job so that they can make squillions in private profits but not pay tax while they wreck the climate. What a great idea, said no one ever except you lot who take their massive donations. Um, advancing gas-fired recovery, something called strategic basin plans, which, when you look at the fine print, is trying to open up the Galilee and the North Bowen to gas. I thought you were trying to open it up for coal, but now you want to open it up for gas as well. Well, the First Nations mobs are not going to be impressed whatsoever because they haven't given their consent to your attempt to extract coal from those regions, let alone your attempt to now speed up gas extraction. Um, so that's just some of the new fossil fuel subsidies, but of course the continuing ones. Uh, no, I, I take it back. They're the old ones. There's, there's a whole, whole new list of new ones that they've added to. There's an additional 1.1 billion in subsidies. They want to accelerate carbon capture and storage, which is like a unicorn. I'm, I'm sorry to my kids who, who still might think they're real. It's, it's just never going to happen. Um, and if private industry want to use their own money to try and make it work, well. Go, go for it, but why on earth should you get public subsidy uh, rather than just reducing your emissions and transitioning to, to clean energy sources? There's money for um, gas roads upgrades in the Northern Territory. Again, I know a few First Nations mobs that are desperately underwhelmed at that suggestion. Um, I've unfortunately run out of time because the list of fossil fuel subsidies is so long, seven minutes has not been enough for me to go through all of them. Um, this government, once again, is just doing the bidding of oil, coal and gas, and they don't give a damn about the climate or the community. Thank you, Senator. Senator Abetz, you have the call. Environmental stewardship is something that we in the coalition believe in and believe in exceptionally strongly. It makes sense, and that is why we are delivering. We are delivering, for example, with our plan, which beats our Kyoto targets, and we're on track to meet and beat our 2030 target in relation to the reduction of CO2 emissions. But something that I won't subscribe to is the scaremongering and the sort of language that we are facing climate collapse. This has been the mantra now for decades on end, with prediction after prediction being made and coming in as false, unsubstantiated. So, for example, Madam De Acting Deputy President, how often have we heard in the media of this country that, for example, the Maldives is about to disappear under the water? Indeed, we have been told that the Maldives, if we were to believe the predictions, had disappeared and the population had no drinking water for the past 28 years. They were the predictions being made. 28 years ago that this was about to happen. Well, they've kept on for those 28 years. But even more interestingly, for those that might be listening and wondering what has happened to the Maldives that is such, under such existential threat of climate change and is sinking under the water, foreign affairs questions on notice provided me with this information. We understand from publicly available information that a number of infrastructure projects have been undertaken in Maldives in recent years, including bridges, airports and tourism-related infrastructure. Who on earth would invest in these things if they believed they were going to disappear under water tomorrow or the next day? And what's more, these include the ongoing expansion of the Valana International Airport. 
the government of the Maldives further announced in 2019 that not one, not two, not three, not four, but five new airports would be built. This in a country that is allegedly going to disappear underwater, and that prediction has now been made year after year after year. And 28 years ago, all that was supposed to be happening, yet people are still confident in investing in the Maldives with not one but five new airports and new hotels. Who on earth would be making such an investment if they honestly believed that their investment would be underwater within the next uh, few years? But we, we as a government believe that it is appropriate to look at the issue of good environmental stewardship not on this sort of hyperventilation and false predictions, but on dealing not with ideology but with technology, asking the question, can we clean up the atmosphere? The answer is yes. Can we do that in a responsible, measured way? Yes. Hence, we've been able to beat our Kyoto targets and we're on track to meet and beat our 2030 target. And how do we continue to do that? by looking at technology, by seeing what can be done to see if we can invest some of our funding for this purpose. So we've got a $20 billion uh, fund called the Technology Investment Roadmap, and that is delivering or that will deliver for us the technology needed so that we can meet our targets without mugging our economy. And at the end of the day, what we have to accept and realise is that if we want to maintain and keep our standard of living, we need reliable, affordable energy. And something that this nation has not done so well over the last two or three decades has been to invest in baseload energy. I, for one, believe that if you're genuinely concerned about the environmental matters of CO2, chances are nuclear energy would be and should be an option for consideration. Nothing more, just consideration. But to say we will not look at a technology for only one reason, ideology, is to sell our fellow Australians short. What we need is to look at all technologies and consider what is the best and most affordable. And indeed, Madam Acting Deputy President, the reason that Australia is a first world economy is not because we have no regulations. Some would argue we are overregulated. It's not because we have cheap wages in comparison to the rest of the world. Some might argue they are relatively high. We are blessed to be able to have those relatively high wages in Australia. Or is it that we are so close to other markets in the world? No, it's not. The thing that has allowed us for so long to be a first world economy has been the ability to have cheap, reliable energy. In the 1990s, we had some of the cheapest energy in the world. Today, we have some of the most expensive energy in the world. And then we wonder why is it that manufacturing has debunked from Australia and gone elsewhere? Well, energy is a vital component in manufacturing, and the market will undoubtedly speak in relation to that. And so when people in the country of my birth in recent times, I understand uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that has been so reliant on renewable energy had a problem with a heavy snowfall. All the solar panels were covered, and when there are heavy snowfalls, there's usually no wind. Guess what? They had to import energy from France made with Australian uranium. And what that teaches us is that renewable energy, nice as it might be, cannot deliver 
the base load energy unless unless you've got the blessing of a whole lot of hydro oh, power like we do in my home state of Tasmania. But of course the Greens that are interjecting, Madam Acting Deputy President, and you will remember this, the Greens wanted to stop hydro dams in the early 1980s. And do you know what their alternate energy supply was going to be? A coal-fired power station in the Fingal Valley. So said Bob Brown, the leader, former leader of the Australian Greens, front page of the Mercury, I think it was sometime in October. And sure, Senator Wish Wilson finds that an inconvenient truth, but that's the reality. And if you keep on believing the nonsense of the Australian Greens, such as that which is incorporated in this motion, you come to the situation where you deny good, reliable, base-load renewable energy such as hydro, and in desperation you grasp at anything and you suggest a coal-fired power station. Thank goodness they did not build a coal-fired power station because Bob Brown would have been and the Greens would have been twixt and between. Could they be demonstrating against the coal-fired power station that they had actually wanted and argued for publicly? And so what I say to the Australian Greens and to my fellow Australians who might be listening into this debate, what we need is good, sound, considered policy. Here we have a government that is investing in my home state of Tasmania with Battery of the Nation, investing in an enhanced Snowy Mountain scheme and seeking to enhance our capacity to harness gas which, of course, is a very important uh, transition fuel as we seek to reduce our CO2 emissions. But this idea that we're in climate collapse, we've heard this now for decade after decade after decade, and every prediction after every prediction has failed. That does not mean that we should not be good stewards of our environment, and we as a government are. And can I remind people in this place that the first minister for the environment was in fact a liberal minister. We are committed to the environment. We can continue to be committed to the environment, but we are also committed to our fellow Australians, their jobs, their livelihoods and the capacity of our nation through our manufacturing and economic base to be able to provide the monies needed for NDIS, for health, for education, for law and order. And you've got to have a complete policy suite, and that is exactly what the Morrison government is delivering. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, you know, it's another day, it's another year of the Morrison government, and we've heard it all before. And it's 2021, and the climate deniers on the back bench of uh, the Morrison government, who were the same climate deniers who were there on the uh, Turnbull government, and they're the same climate deniers who were there with the Abbott government. I mean, when will this debate stop? Whether it's uh, Prime Minister Morrison handing around the lump of coal in the parliament and declaring that coal is his friend, um, whether it was uh, Prime Minister Abbott uh, carrying on and saying that uh, Labor's pricing on carbon would make a leg of lamb $20 $100, um, and whether it's Mr Turnbull who pretended to actually be someone who did support a positive policies on climate change, but the backbench wrote them in again, uh, the Morrison government or the, the Conservatives in this country are never going to deliver the clean energy future that Australians deserve and Australians are calling for. They're never going to do it because that handful of backbenchers have got them well and truly round the neck and refuse to let this country move forward. And that's really what it's come down to, a tiny handful of backbenchers who are holding Australia to ransom, holding Australia to, to ransom. And it's not so much what was in the budget, but what wasn't in the budget. I have gone uh, personally to great lengths to buy an electric vehicle, something those over there won't support at all. I mean, who could remember the, who could forget the last election 
uh, with Senator Cash and the Prime Minister saying to, uh, to tradies that they were going to stand there and uh, uh, not let Labor take their utes away. I mean, electric cars have an enormous capacity, but the choice in Australia is minimal because the federal government is doing absolutely nothing, nothing to promote electric vehicles in this country, and not one word not one sentence, not one dollar in the federal budget committed to electric cars. And yet you look to Europe and uh, we see all sorts of subsidies being offered. Uh, and, the, and the cheapest car, electric car on the Australian market at the moment is the MG. At 44 grand, it's out of the hands of most Australians. And shame on the, the Morrison government for keeping it there. Shame on you. Not only should we be making more electric cars in Australia, if your budget had some vision and some plan, we could be producing electric cars in this country. But no, those Neanderthals on the back bench who just want to deny that there's any change uh, in our climate, that we actually need to do stuff urgently, uh, supported by uh, the Pauline Hanson One Nation Party, a handful of people holding this whole country to ransom. And quite frankly, shame on you. The other thing that the Morrison government won't tell you the truth about is they always parrot on. We're agnostic about power deliver delivery. We just want to ensure supply. What nonsense! What nonsense! You are not agnostic about power delivery. We know where uh, your heart lies, and it's not with renewables, it's not with wind. I remember in this place when we had that, that ridiculous inquiry into wind turbines, because you were once again pandering to your backbench and a handful of independents in this Senate at the time who thought that wind terms, that wind uh, producing wind was somehow the devil's work. I mean, what a nonsense that we spent months doing a trumped-up inquiry just to keep your backbench in line. Um, you're cooking the books on the data because you keep saying Australia will reach the Paris targets. But you know what? The rest of the world and most Australians don't believe you. How embarrassing recently, thank goodness, with the election of um, Mr Biden in the US, you've had to tame your rhetoric a little bit. And uh, we saw the pathetic comments and speeches made by Mr Morrison, trying to pretend that somehow we're world leaders. Most Australians know we are not world leaders, and it wasn't lost uh, on the world leaders in the room that Australia is down the bottom, be again because of a handful of backbenchers who just refuse to see the reality of what's in front of them, who have no interest in leaving a better world for their children and their children's children, who just want to be those backbenchers, the handful of them, with their head in the sand, pretending somehow this is all going to go away. So um, we've seen Australian business get on with it. I was uh, up in Karratha recently um, visiting Yarra, who really are doing a lot of work with hydrogen. Now, in the last week or so, I'll admit, Mr Morrison suddenly discovered hydrogen. Apparently, we're going to have hydrogen hubs all over the place. Uh, but before then, no. Um, you know, I guess it's pretty hard to sit in the parliament with a lump of hydrogen. Much easier to sit there with a lump of coal, because that's what your backbenchers want to see. But at least he's moved a little bit on that. But we are, when I talk to business leaders, when I talk to mining, um, they're quite, they're quite annoyed because it's those on that side, it's those in the government who are holding them back. Now you pretend to be there for business. You're there for the big miners, you're there for big business. And yet, with your antiquated, backward, bottom of the world environmental policies, you are holding back business in this country. They do want to forge ahead. They do want to put electric trucks on the road. They do want to cut their emissions, but where's the incentives from you as a government? Not there. And what was in the budget? Very little. 
And if you've got a plan and a vision for this country and where it's going, it certainly wasn't there last night. No vision, no plan for our future. No clean, green technologies advanced, nothing, just because that backbench just holds you down and holds you back. Um, all we're hearing from Mr Morrison now, who apparently is agnostic about where our power comes from, uh, is a gas-led recovery. Well, if he was truly agnostic, you would be looking at every innovation. You'd be holding your head up. You'd be looking to the world leaders about what they're doing on climate and how they're reducing their energy costs. I remember when Prime Minister Abbott said, by um, repealing uh, Labor's price on carbon, people would save $550 a year on their electricity bills. When are you going to fess up and say that just wasn't true? And we've just seen electricity costs spiralling out of control for many, uh, for many consumers. And I'm thankful in Western Australia we're not part of a grid mess. It's nearly as bad as the Murray-Darling Basin, the mess you've made of electricity in this country. But that's what the Prime Minister said. $550 a year better off. What a nonsense. Simply not true. Like the $100 leg of lamb. Like the towns that were going to disappear off the map, according to the climate skeptics opposite. I mean, come on. It is time that someone in your front bench, one of your ministers, actually stood up to those handful of climate deniers and said, we are not going to allow you any longer to hold Australia back. There's a whole clean energy future out there that I certainly want for my grandchildren. It's a little like marriage equality. It was really young people who led that debate because they were sick and tired of older Australians saying to them it's never going to happen. Well, I can tell you my granddaughter, Charlie, who's 17, and my grandson, who's 22, they can't believe the sort of rhetoric that you come out with, and they're not. You know, they're ordinary, average kids. They're ordinary, average kids, but they're concerned about their future, the future that you are denying them because of your clinging to old-fashioned, outdated uh, ideas. Uh, because a handful of your backbenchers won't move. So it is the young people in Australia who are more and more questioning what on earth you are doing, because it's their future that you're denying. It's their future you're holding back. And they want a clean, green future. And just like marriage equality, they just don't know where you are heading for, with this, and they don't agree with you. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I was reflecting on the fact that it was actually nine years ago this week that I got pre-selected uh, to replace Dr Bob Brown in his place. And I came into parliament uh, as a young senator who had been a campaigner on marine conservation, who had been a campaigner on climate change. I taught uh, the economics of, of uh, tackling climate change at the university. This is something I thought deeply about. But I was reflecting on the fact that if you had told me then what I know now, what I have seen in the last nine years, the changes I have observed that have been put into the scientific literature to this planet, to our oceans, to our coastlines, to our country, if you had told me back then, I wouldn't have believed it. I, I simply wouldn't and couldn't have fathomed the magnitude, how much things have tipped in our climate in the last nine years. James Cook University this week, some of the most respected coral scientists in the world collaborated and said, we've got the briefest of windows to take radical action on climate change. Or by 2050, they estimated 94 per cent of the world's coral reefs would be disappearing. In the last five years alone, we've lost half the coral cover on the world's single biggest organism, the Great Barrier Reef, in the last five years. Scientists didn't predict it was possible to even have back-to-back -back bleachings, mass coral bleachings, until 2050. But we've had three in the last five years. 
six in the last 20 years. They didn't even happen until 1998. There was none recorded in history until 1998. And my home state of Tasmania, Acting Deputy President, your home state, has recorded the biggest marine heat wave in human history, the biggest marine heat wave off our coastlines. We've lost our giant kelp forests. I'm getting sick and tired of talking about it in this place, trying to bring to the attention to the people opposite the chamber and those out there that deny the changes to our climate. It's not just a green problem or an environmental problem. It is an economic problem as much as it is anything else. But first and foremost, it is a political problem because it is a political failure that has allowed this to happen. Now, on the way in in my car ride this morning, I saw Extinction Rebellion, as it turns out, protesting out the front here with a truck. And they had a sign saying, if we do nothing, we risk everything. I can say with 100 per cent, no doubt in my heart, that we do risk everything in our oceans if we don't act now, Acting Deputy President. We risk everything. We risk our fisheries. We risk our coastal communities. We, we will be bringing up our kids in a planet who will not see what we have seen while we've been alive. Funny enough, after I got pre-selected, I wanted to have a holiday before I started in the Senate, and I took my kids snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. In 2012, it's unrecognisable now, and we don't understand the impacts that it's having on our ecosystems. That reef system is connected to the forests, it's connected to the climate and the weather in those areas. Everything is interconnected, and it is changing so rapidly. And yet, in this budget, Reflecting on David Attenborough's comments, we can't be radical enough. Reflecting on his life on this planet, in how we tackle the climate emergency, was there any radical action in this budget? No. Was there any action in this budget on climate change in the face of this evidence, in the face of this mounting evidence? Was there any action at all? Not a thing, except more money for fossil fuel companies more money for oil and gas projects, more money for coal-fired power stations, more subsidies for big polluters. It's got to stop, Acting Deputy President. We have to change and we have to act. I'm getting fed up, and I know so many Australians are getting fed up with this. Where is the action? This is the biggest challenge we face as a nation and as a planet, and there is nothing in this budget at all to tackle it. Nothing. Why? We have to act, Acting Deputy President. And if my party and my colleagues are the only ones in this place that continue to bang the drum, well, so be it. We are not going away, and there is a federal Senator election, and Mr. we'll deal Wilson, with it then. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Acting Madam Deputy President, uh, the great Franklin Roosevelt once said, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so it's good to speak to this uh, 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 urgency, uh, urgency motion. Uh, can I just say for the record, I don't support any subsidies at all to any type of energy. Uh, Twenty years ago we were fed the neoliberal line and if we privatised the energy market, uh, the market would fix itself. Well, I can assure you the market hasn't fixed itself. Uh, basically been shoveling uh, subsidies into all sorts of energy. I'll just quote, we've heard a lot about the fossil fuel subsidies, which I don't think are all that high at all. Uh, but I'll go into the renewable subsidies. There's $10 billion for a CFE, CE Clean Energy Finance Corporation, uh, $5 billion for the Snowy Hydro, which purely exists just so you can have a big battery for the solar and wind. Uh, there's $3.5 billion for a climate solutions package, $2.5 billion for the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, uh, another $1.5 billion for a grid reliability fund that got pulled. Uh, and has now been used for gas and things like that. So, long story short, just at a federal level, there's been $20 billion in subsidies for renewable energy. And then we've got the state subsidies, whereby we've got the ridiculous um, proposition that the Queensland state government, for example, is paying foreign renewable providers uh, for their energy, undermining our own homegrown coal, uh, which is basically free and owned by the Queensland people. Cogan Creek coal mine actually sits on the coal mine, just gets uh, funneled straight up the, uh, 
conveyor belt, uh, and it's all free because it's owned by the Queensland people. Uh, that used to generate about one to two billion dollars in profits for the state government every year, and now last year it lost a billion dollars because it keeps get, getting turned on and off. Uh, so, look, there's lots of things uh, I think that we, we should address. Um, you know, I think we've got ten energy agencies just at the federal level. Uh, so, you know, the whole energy market is completely ruined, and you know there needs to be a discussion about whether or not we nationalise all the base energy and start again because it's out of control. But can I say? But can I say? I just want to jump on to this uh, other point in the um, point here. There is no climate collapse. There is no climate science. Okay, the field of science that we are dealing with is called thermodynamics, and it's existed for about 200 years. And it was actually yes, it was actually started by a brilliant young French engineer. Or was created. His first theories were created, uh, Nicolas Leo Carnot, uh, and he came up actually, believe it or not, with the second law of thermodynamics, which was that the entropy of a system uh, always increases. Uh, now, unfortunately, he died at an early age uh, from cholera, so we don't have his papers. But if we move on to the uh, English scientists that took his work up, which of course was Robert Joule. Uh, and William Thompson, who later became Lord Kelvin uh, and was the first uh, scientist point appointed to the British House of Lords. Now, they came up with the first law of thermodynamics, which is that energy is neither created or destroyed, it's just transformed or, uh, transformed or transferred. Now, these laws matter because heat is basically uh, transferred in three forms. It's either radiation, which is what we're dealing with when we talk about climate science, convection and conduction. <clears throat> Now, I want to talk about conduction first, because conduction is the main form of heat transfer in the atmosphere. Uh, and effectively, that rule applies. So the rule that applies to that is the second law of thermodynamics, and I'll explain it to you. If we have a glass of water, half a glass of water at 10 degrees and half a glass of water at 20 degrees, and we pour one into the other, we know if there's no heat loss, it'll average out at 15 degrees Celsius. Now, what I want you to do is to turn those cups upside down or on their side. And effectively, that's the way the atmosphere works. So the atmosphere is basically one big pressure gradient driven by temperature differentials. So the greater the temperature differential, the faster the convection will be. Um, so we see convection in many forms. We see it in the wind. Uh, and the other major uh, form of convection is what's known as evaporative cooling. And that's where we have a change in temperature from a phase change. So, for example, the heat will hit an ocean, uh, the water will evaporate, uh, and it will go up as water vapour. And then when it gets to a point in the atmosphere where it cools, it gets to its conden condensation point, it will then uh, basically condense again and fall to the ocean. And that's effectively a cooling point, uh, a cooling process, uh, hence why it's called evaporative cooling. And, and it ha doesn't just happen in the ocean. If we go and exercise, for example, you might sweat. That's also known as evaporative cooling. And that is the major form of heat transfer on planet Earth. Uh, and what you'll get is you'll get most of that around the equator, where you have these massive uh, convection cells where the heat rises. Now, it has to be said that uh, uh, carbon dioxide does increase radiation uh, in the atmosphere. No one's denying that. But what's very important is to actually understand the degree or the, the quantify that amount of heat uh, and the direction of the heat and how that process works. So, in order to understand that, you need to go back to other laws of physics. So the first one is obviously E equals m c squared, uh, whereby 600 million tonnes of hydrogen are burnt every second and converted into 596 million tonnes of helium and 4 million tonnes of energy. Now that 4 million uh, tonnes of energy, some of that comes to uh, planet Earth here, and depending on where, in the form of a photon. Now, depending on where that photon was created in the sun, if it was created in the inside part of the sun, it'll have low energy and come here as an infrared. Uh, infrared radiation. If it was created at the edge of the sun, it'll come here as ultraviolet uh, radiation. And, and ultraviolet radiation has a lot of energy, uh, and that's why it causes skin cancer because it actually knocks the electron, uh, can hit a molecule, and actually knock an electron straight out of its orbit, and that lionises the atom, and that's when it becomes uh, oxidative uh, and starts causing things like cancer and things like that. But what's important to understand with carbon dioxide? Uh, in terms of radiation, is that it has four vibrational frequencies. The first frequency is found at 2.3, uh, uh, sorry, 2.8 microns, and that actually uh, uh, refracts incoming infrared radiation. So that's not actually adding to the heat at all uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, the second vibrational frequency is at 4.3 microns, 
and that is uh, a, what, they, what has no, that particular frequency has no dipole moment. So that means it's not electromagnetic, and so it uh, neither absorbs or emits. And then we get to the two uh, de 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 degenerate modes at 14.8 microns. Now this is where basically carbon dioxide absorbs and emits heat. And one of the big myths we hear in climate science is that carbon dioxide traps heat. That is an oxymoron. Okay? Kinetic heat is kinetic energy, the energy of motion. So every person, every molecule on this earth will basically absorb and radiate heat. If we were to turn the lights off in the chamber now and put an infrared light on you, we'd all be glowing red. Um, now, what's interesting with the 14.8 micron is that we need to use uh, Wine's law of displacement to determine uh, at what temperature that will radiate. Now, long story short, that'll radiate, the, the formula for that is 2,888 uh, over the frequency uh, of the um, vibration, which is about 15. So, long story short, it'll radiate at 192 degrees Kelvin, which, if you convert back into degrees Celsius, is negative 80 degrees Celsius. So, long story short, carbon dioxide does emit heat at about 80, uh, 80, uh, negative 80 degrees. So you've got to go somewhere up about 10 or 15 kilometres in the atmosphere to actually get carbon dioxide to uh, actually refract heat. So long story short, the amount of heat uh, uh, that will in, uh, increase as a result of increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is very marginal. Because let's not forget that while you might have 430 parts per million of carbon dioxide, it's not the biggest greenhouse gas absorber in the planet. The biggest ga greenhouse gas absorber in the planet just happens to be this thing we call H2O, which is water or water vapour. Now, that at about 75 uh, degrees humidity and 25 degrees Celsius is about 15,000 parts per million. So, if we add you know, another part per million, the, the, the increase in heat is what's described as an, it increases in a negative logarithmic scale. So, if I had 10, uh, for example, uh, patty cakes and I had got another cake, it increased by 10 per cent. If I had 100 patty cakes and I had another patty cake, it increased by 1 per cent. So gradually the rate of change, and those of you who understand your calculus will know what I'm talking about, diminishes. So long story short, the whole thing about radiative heat is overblown, because most of the heat transferred throughout the atmosphere is through conduction, and the other part of, um, and if it isn't through conduction, it'll be through, sorry, convection, and if it isn't through convection, it'll be through conduction. And that is where if one molecule, so it'll absorb a photon, uh, heats up, it'll bang into another molecule, and it passes energy to that other molecule. Now, we'll apply the first law of thermodynamics there. So basically, the energy gained by one molecule will be lost by the other molecule. You cannot increase the overall energy in the system. So long story short, there is nothing to worry about at all. We're not going to have a climate collapse anytime soon. Uh, the first time you'd expect to see a climate collapse is in about three billion years' time. Uh, when the sun starts to burn out and it'll start to blow up into a big red blob and it'll gradually come out and it'll consume Venus and then Mars and then planet Earth. But you haven't got to worry uh, about that because we'll probably, uh, life on Earth will probably come to an end in about a billion years' time when all the hydrogen is slowly evaporated out of the Earth and water will cease to exist. And as you all know, when water ceases to exist, it's kaput for all of us. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I must say, Senator Rennick, that uh, was some uh, speech you gave there of exactly what we're dealing with in this country and it's climate deniers. It's called patty. Uh, so I'll get on with my speech. Uh, and I do rise to speak on this matter of absolute public urgency today because this place cannot ignore that the climate collapse and destruction of country that is happening now on this climate-denying government. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have lived sustainably on this land forever. Not 200 years, not 250 years, forever, Senator Stoker. We have song lines across this country that connect us to each other, to our culture, water, and sky. We are the caretakers of these lands. Protection of country is at the very core of our culture and connection to the land and sea. Our people are not from country. We are country. The First Nations people of this country have always understood a fundamental thing that this government simply 
doesn't understand. Our people understand that when it comes to protection of country, everything is connected. Everything. Our relationship to lands, waters and sky is inseparable from our understanding of what it means to be a First Nations person. Our people have sustainably cared for these lands and waters for thousands and thousands of generations. We did this by learning from our elders, passing down our knowledge, and our people aren't consumers, we're custodians. We didn't treat the land like something to own, we didn't mine our country, and we didn't frack our country. Generations of our people would take care of country and community. They weren't driven by selfish values of wealth and power. That's what the colonisers brought here, to this place, to this very place. It's all about power and money and greed. Instead, while these colonisers have been here for a tiny fraction of time, our peoples have been on these lands for thousands of generations. And we're faced with the biggest challenge we'll ever face and that is the climate crisis. In last night's budget, we found out that they'll be handing over $1.1 billion of taxpayers' money to burn the planet even more, to give money to oil and gas and coal industries, to dirty coal, oil and gas barons that are responsible for the destruction of our climate and our country. The go this government will do whatever their big corporate mates and the mining lobby ask them to do, because reality is both the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Labor Party take dirty donations from developers and mining companies and big corporations. This party does not do that because we have integrity and we make decisions that is based on uh, protecting and connecting with our country and our communities. Last week I was in Borroloola at the MacArthur Mine. That's where I saw with my own eyes what the desecration of country for grubby, easy profit is doing to our lands and our local communities. These resources are pulled up out of the ground by the big mining Corporation, Glencore in this case, one of the dirtiest ones going, who have absolutely no respect for traditional owners. Big miners across this country divert and suck up water. They mine our lands for coal, for gas. Then our climate gets drier, hotter and more extreme. Our lands suffer. Our waters are poisoned. They dry up. So much pain for so little gain. Right now, we are at a turning point in this country. Colonisers came. They've done as much destruction, extraction and damage to our people, the first people of these lands, only two, just over 200 years. That's what they've been able to do. The decisions we make today in this place will have impacts for every single generation to come. Every single. Every single child, their children, their grandchildren. The decisions made here today will Im impact on their lives and their livelihoods. But I'm not sure whether the government actually thinks that far forward. It's about what they can take now. Look after their mates now. Stay in power now. Forget about future generations. But the good news is the solution to the climate crisis is here. They always, it always has been. With First Nations people, we have solutions to heal this country. We can't even get a seat at the table, and we all know what that looks like. We, the original sovereign people of these lands, have known it all along. When we care and protect for country, country cares and protects us. We must protect all the living beings belonging to these lands and waters. 
because we share this country with them too. It's not just an animal or a plant or a tree. We are connected spiritually and physically to these living beings. We can grow in renewable, sustainable energy, clean energy from the wind and the sun. We've got plenty of that. We can protect our ancient, precious cultural heritage instead of desecrating it for a quick buck. And we can enjoy our lives in harmony with our planet and with plenty of energy if we get our energy from clean sources. If only this out-of-touch, climate-denying government get out of the way. We're running out of time. Climate deniers need to face the facts. They need to get with the program. They need to understand why we're having extreme weather events before it's too late. And I know that you have your climate-denying scientists that will back whatever climate-denying words you want to talk about. But the reality is you are putting your children's children in extreme danger. And maybe if you think about that for a moment and think about what that means for your family, but also think about the economic impacts that this is going to have on this nation. You know, start thinking the way you think about looking after yourself and making a quick buck because climate action will help you do that. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'll discuss collapses already underway, and none of them involve a climate collapse. Firstly, the economic collapse. In the name of unsubstantiated climate alarm, the Howard Anderson Liberal Nationals government, starting in 1996, colluded with the states to deceitfully bypass the Constitution to steal farmers' property rights to comply with the UN's Kyoto Protocol. It concocted Australia's first major party emissions trading scheme, a carbon dioxide tax to comply with UN dictates. It introduced a renewable energy target that grew to, to now cost Australians an additional $13 billion each year, every year, above and in addition to their electricity costs, again, to comply with UN dictates. In the name of climate, our electricity prices have risen artificially from the world's lowest to now be the world's highest. Manufacturing has collapsed. We no longer make cars. We make few household appliances. We make no manufacturing tools crucial for our security. Agriculture is being hammered. The Liberal National Energy Minister, Angus Taylor, openly states he has fears for electricity prices, reliability and grid stability. Un under this budget's dreamy forecast, bets on hydrogen and continued subsidy of expensive unreliables like wind and solar, we're enduring a manufacturing collapse and we face economic collapse. The second collapse, the collapse of science. Here are some facts. Firstly, on Monday 26 of September 2016, the CSIRO confirmed that it has never stated that carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger and said it never will. So why do the Greens push policies for economic collapse? Why have Liberal, Nationals and Labor governments enacted policies over the last two and a half decades for economic collapse? Secondly, on Wednesday the 10th of May 2017, in this building, the CSIRO admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. Not unprecedented. That means we didn't cause the current mild cyclical warming that ended around 1995. So why did the Greens push policies for economic collapse? Why have Liberal, National and Labor governments for the last two and a half decades driven economic collapse? According to NASA satellites, global atmospheric temperatures have been essentially flat, with no warming for more than a quarter of a century. Despite China, despite India, despite America, despite Europe, despite Russia producing record quantities of carbon dioxide, higher human production of carbon dioxide has not increased temperatures. So why do the Greens push policies for economic collapse? Why have Liberal, National, Labor governments driven for the last two and a half decades economic collapse? Following the global financial crisis, most nations were in recession during 2009. In 2020, as a result of government COVID restrictions around the world, nations were again in recession. 
In both recession years, the use of hydrocarbon fuels fell and human carbon dioxide production fell. Yet in both recession years, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels continued increasing. Nature alone controls the carbon dioxide levels. So why do the Greens push policies for economic collapse? Why have Liberal, Nationals and Labor governments driven economic collapse for the last two and a half decades? Bureau of Meteorology records data on cyclones in Australia shows no trend in cyclone frequency, severity or duration. There's no climate catastrophe. The most severe drought in the last 120 years was the 1920s, 40s drought. The next worst was the Federation drought in 1901. There's no climate catastrophe. Floods, bushfires, snowfall and every other climate factor shows no change, just natural cyclical variation. There's no climate catastrophe. It's been 601 days since my latest challenge to the Greens to present the data on which they base this nonsense and to debate me on the climate science and the corruption of climate science. So finally, there's no unprecedented global warming, there's no climate change, there's no climate catastrophe, there's no climate collapse. Instead, we have a collapse of science. The collapse of science led to an early collapse, an energy collapse that caused an economic collapse. Welcome to the Greens nightmare that is now the Liberals, Nationals, Labor nightmare. This is what happens when data is ignored and instead governance is based on unfounded opinions, personal and party political agenda, cronies, headlines, fear, emotions, UN policies, party donations and serving vested interests. And who pays for this atrocious governance and climate lies? We, the people, pay. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. The climate crisis, and we are in a climate crisis, sits alongside the continued existence of nuclear weapons on our planet as the two greatest threats to the peace and well-being of our human community. This is the reality of the moment in which we live. This is the reality of 2021. For the nations, and particularly for the island nations of our Asia-Pacific region, climate change is not a far-off abstract. It is a present reality, as it is for the fire-ravaged communities of Australia, as it is for the farmers, as it is for all those whose lives and livelihood depend on the land. It is something observed by people who in their lifetimes have seen changes in their environment around them, in their communities, and it is something that is observed by those who can trace their connection to country back hundreds of generations. This federal budget presented another opportunity for action. Action to create a sustainable and safe and inclusive future for everyone. Action to create safe, sustainable jobs. Action to support those currently working in fossil fuel industries to transition to new, renewable, clean industries. These were all of the potential opportunities on the table which the Morrison government could have taken. And yet what this budget has revealed is a government which is interested in only one thing serving its corporate donors. Serving its corporate donors, who yesterday filled this place like lice, scurrying about, trying to find and identify just exactly what they got for all those donations and all those dinners. Going through the budget line by line, identifying exactly what they got for their time. It was revolting. And a whole bunch of them were grinning 
with the additional $1 billion that this government has decided to give to the fossil fuel industry every single bloody year over the next four years. You know what? I've had so many of these debates in this place over the last four years where the Greens have contributed science and evidence. This movement has spent decades, the community has spent decades putting forward detailed plans, stepping out exactly how we do this and all of the reasons why. Young people have driven ourselves into the ground trying to get the attention of the major parties, get them to act. We have struck, we have disrupted, and we have given our time. Young people so often make the journey to Canberra or to their state parliament and make the case for their own future. The reality is, and it is, it is reminded to me on nights like last night, that the problem isn't that you people don't know that climate change is a thing. The problem is that you don't care. You don't give a damn. You'd rather go to a dinner with a miner or the pokey industry or a gas merchant or the owner of Harvey Norman than take action on climate change and safeguard our future. And that disgraceful disregard is exactly why the young people of this country, come the next election, will vote you out of office. And good riddance to the lot of you. Thank you, Senator Seal John. The uh, time for the discussion has expired. So the question uh, before the chair is the motion that was being moved by Senator Thorpe uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I no. think the noes have it. No. Division required. Division. Ring the bells. Four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. There being uh, nine ayes and 28 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Thank you. That concludes that item. We will now move on to the consideration of documents. A list of documents was circulated in the chamber. Senator Waters. The President, I take note of document one. Um, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. The performance audit monitoring the impact okay. of government school funding. Uh, leave, leave, leave is granted. Thank you. I move on to Senator Walsh. To continue if you, my remarks. Sorry, if Senator Walsh, I don't think your mic was just working there. If you could just start sure. again, please. I take note of document. Two, Aged Care Quality and Safety Royal Commission Final Report, Australian Government Response, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, no objection. Le leave is granted. Document. No one should speak to document three. So we will move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. Uh, Senator Polly. Oops. Acting Deputy President, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee, which is me, for the scrutiny of bills, I present Scrutiny Digest 7 of 2021 and the Committee's Annual Report 2020. Thank you. I'll move to us. Uh, sorry, uh, Senator Ferriberry Wells, and then I'll come to you, Senator Patterson. Senator Ferriberry Wells. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the tabling of the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee delegation legislation monitor 2021. In December last year, I warned the chamber that the Biosecurity Act provided the government with sweeping powers to make laws, including travel bans, on Australian citizens. I advise that these laws are exempt from disallowance. Parliamentarians are prevented from scrutinising and, if necessary, disallowing them. If the significance of the committee's concerns and warnings in this regard was not clear before the events of the last few weeks, it should now be abundantly clear that the committee's position has been truly vindicated. Last year, the committee called on all parliamentarians to carefully consider their responsibilities as lawmakers and representatives of the people to ensure rigorous oversight of delegated legislation made in times of emergency 
particularly where its limits, it limits personal rights and liberties or overrides laws made by the parliament. It is clear to us all in this place that this is more important than ever. As I foreshadowed, this chamber has found itself in the position where it is unable to consider whether it would be appropriate to disallow the determination made by the Minister for Health and Aged Care that prevents people, including Australians, from entering Australia if they have been in India. The power to make these determinations under the Biosecurity Act and the maximum penalty of five years' imprisonment or a fine of $66,600 for breaching them have been features of the Act since it was passed in 2015. This penalty applies to any determination made under, the, under Section 477 of the Act. It applies not only to the ban on Australians returning home from India, but also to other measures such as the ban on Australian citizens and permanent residents travelling overseas and a whole series of other things. This is a piece of legislation that was passed by the Senate without any debate at all on these human biosecurity emergency provisions. Primary re legislation relating to times of emergency should be subject to rigorous parliamentary scrutiny. During these times, governments are more likely to implement extraordinary measures that encroach upon individual rights and liberties, making parliamentary oversight all the more important. It is important for senators to recognise that we provide all governments, not just the current one, with the powers to make these determinations under the biosecurity law. We provided all governments with the power to impose five-year imprisonment for breaching any requirements they see fit to make within the scope of the Act. The India Travel Pause determination shows us that these powers are being used in ways that we did not comprehend when the Act was passed in 2015. The point is not to make a policy comment on this legislation or the actions of the Health Minister or those who were delegated power under the Act. The point is to raise the issue of parliamentary scrutiny. Without the ability to scrutinise, the parliament cannot make policy judgments or even technical judgments on proposed law. The Constitution tasks the Parliament with ultimate lawmaking authority. While the Parliament may delegate some of these powers to the executive, this does not absolve the Parliament of responsibility for those laws. Exempting delegated legislation from disallowance undermines the Parliament's constitutionally mandated role. It has significant consequences for the democratic foundations of our system of government. The committee recommended in its interim re inquiry report in December that such instruments made under the Biosecurity Act should not be exempt from disallowance. I remind the chamber that these determinations can override any provision of any, yes, any other Australian law. It is totally unacceptable that such significant measures can be made during times of emergency with no effective oversight or control by the parliament. This is not an isolated occurrence. Other, our concerns about parliamentary oversight of delegated legislation made during emergencies are not limited to this particular emergency nor the actions of any particular government. For too long, Parliament and governments of all political persuasion have contributed to a system of laws, procedures and practices which diminish Parliament's capacity to oversee executive lawmaking. Delegated legislation made during COVID is just one example of this much broader issue. Parliament cannot perform its democratic role if primary legislation continues to, to leave significant matters to delegated legislation that is exempt from disallowance. There is a concerning increase in the number of laws which are made by the executive via delegated legislation, and even more concerning is that approximately one in five of these laws are not subject to disallowance. In its final inquiry report tabled in March, the committee recommended that the Senate endorse changes to its standing orders to allow the committee to scrutinise instruments that are exempt from disallowance. These proposed changes will come before the Senate on 16 June. The high number of exempt instruments, including especially the India Travel Pause Determination, show why it is imperative that the Senate adopt these changes next month so that in the future the committee can scrutinise such measures if we so choose. 
it is time for the parliament to reassert its constitutionally mandated role. The Senate's agreement to adopt the recommendations of the committee's inquiry will be an important first step in ensuring that we preserve our democratic values. This also brings me to a timely reminder for all senators. We are still in a declared state of human biosecurity emergency. This emergency declaration has been in force since 18 March 2020 and has been renewed every three months since that date. There is no limit on the number of times a human biosecurity emergency period can be extended, nor is there any requirement for the Governor-General or the Health Minister to inform Parliament of an intention to extend the period or provide a justification for the extension. The committee has been clear the government must propose amendments to the Biosecurity Act so that declarations of human biosecurity emergency are subject to disallowance. I would also like to draw the committee's attention to the committee's comments regarding a range of legislative instruments made in the Treasury portfolio, portfolio which modify the operations of provisions of the Corporations Act 2001 and other acts of parliament. As I previously explained, not only do these instruments alter the operation of primary legislation made by this parliament, they are intended to remain in force for substantial periods of time, ranging from five to ten years. This contravenes the committee's long-standing expectation that instruments which modify or exempt persons or entities from the operation of primary legislation should cease to operate no more than three years after they commence. A shorter sunsetting period is essential to ensure that there is a minimum degree of regular parliamentary oversight of such instruments. And since October last year, the committee has been corresponding with the Treasurer to resolve its scrutiny concerns regarding each of these instruments separately. The committee has also given notices of motion to disallow each of the instruments in order to provide it with additional time to resolve its scrutiny concerns. In working to resolve together to resolve these concerns, the Treasurer undertook to engage with the committee on an ongoing basis. The committee thanks the Treasurer for his engagement in relation to this systemic issue. In light of this ongoing good faith engagement between the committee and the Treasurer, the committee has resolved to withdraw the disallowance notices of motion in place on the instruments. However, if this systemic issue is not resolved, the committee will not hesitate to move to disallow Treasury portfolio instruments of concern in the future. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor, 7 of 2021, to the Senate. Senator Craig, you just to formally present the report? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I present delegated legislation monitor 7 of 2021 of the Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation and move that the Senate take note of the report of which I have already taken okay. note. Thank you, Senator Evan Wells. Thank you. The question before the chair is that the Senate take note. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I present the advisory report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, International Production Orders Bill 2020, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Okay. Question before the Chair is that the Senate take note. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I am pleased to present the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security's report, Advisory Report on Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment, International Production Orders Bill 2020. In brief terms, this bill seeks to amend, append a new Schedule I to the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979 to introduce an international production orders regime. The international production orders regime will allow Australia to enter into an agreement with a foreign country to facilitate access to telecommunications data in the investigation and prosecution of serious crimes. The bill has been introduced against a backdrop of growing technological advancement that challenges the ability of our law enforcement and intelligence bodies to combat serious human trafficking, drug crime, child sexual, sexual abuse and terrorism. The current mutual legal assistance process cannot keep pace with our law enforcement agencies' efforts to combat these serious crimes that impacts the safety of all Australians. The committee supports the bill and the overarching outcomes it is trying to achieve. 
However, in consideration of the bill, the committee considered there were opportunities to be more prescriptive in how a designated international agreement may be made and how the International Production Orders Scheme will operate. The committee has recommended that the bill be amended to incorporate conditions that qualify an agreement to be a designated international agreement, including that an agreement must include protections around the data of Australians, including the use, handling and disclosure of information, that production orders must comply with the domestic laws of the relevant foreign country, that production order may be issued if the information could not be reasonably obtained through other less intrusive methods, that information obtained through an international production order cannot be provided to a third party government. To make the agreement with a foreign country, the committee has recommended that the bill require that the foreign country must demonstrate, firstly, a respect for the rule of law, respect for international human rights obligations and commitments, clear legal procedures governing the use of electronic surveillance investigatory powers and, where the country has the death penalty as an available punishment for an offence, the country must provide Australia with assurances about the non-use of its information in such cases. The committee has recommended that the bill clarify designated international agreements will be published and tabled in the regulations, subject to parliamentary scrutiny and subject to a period of disallowance. The committee has also recommended that the bill provide that a designated international agreement may be extended for a period of three years without going through the parliamentary treaty process if renewal or extension is proposed without amendment to the agreement. Noting the potentially intrusive nature of the powers, the committee has recommended that the ability to apply for an international production order should be appropriately limited to senior officers within relevant law enforcement agencies or the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. The committee made additional recommendations to enhance oversight of the use of the powers by the Commonwealth Ombudsman and the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and to facilitate the sharing of information between the Australian designated authority and these oversight bodies. The committee has recommended that it revisit the provisions of the bill, whichever is the earlier of three years following the enactment of the first agreement or five years after the commencement of provisions of the bill. The committee recommends that following the implementation of its recommendations, the bill be passed by the parliament. I commend the report to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Just to clarify matters, uh, the, motion, the question before the chair is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. No. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present a statement on the Committee's review of regulations relisting jaish e mohammed as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Senator Patterson, you speak to, speak to it. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to present a statement on the, of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security for review of regulations relisting jaish e mohammed as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code Act 1995. Regulations that specify an organisation as a terrorist organisation cease to have effect on the third anniversary of the day in which they take effect. Organisations can be relisted, provided the minister is satisfied on reasonable grounds that the organisation continues to directly or indirectly engage in terrorism or advocate the doing of a terrorist act. Jaish e Mohammed was listed in 2018, and the regulations to relist them were tabled in the Parliament on 23 February 2021. Mr. President, the Committee's review examines the Minister's decision to relist this organisation. Section 102.1a of the Criminal Code provides that the Committee may review a regulation which lists or relists an organisation as a terrorist organisation and report its comments and recommendations to each House of the Parliament before the end of the applicable 15-day sitting disallowance period. This statement serves this purpose and is being presented within the required period. In determining whether the regulations relisting this organisation should be supported, the committee reviewed the merits in accordance with the Minister for Home Affairs explanatory statement, ASIO statement of reasons for the organisation and other publicly available information. In its deliberation, the committee determined that Jaish e Mohammed has links to extremist groups and maintains operational links with other groups operating in Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan and has ties to al-Qaeda and the Taliban. JEM is directly engaged in preparing, planning and undertaking terrorist attacks and has publicly advocated terrorist attacks online and through rallies and religious sermons in Kashmir. JEM has historically conducted attacks indiscriminately to achieve its objectives, including targeting foreigners. It would consider Westerners, including Australians, to be legitimate targets for attack. This organisation remains a real threat to Australia. There is strong evidence that it continues to engage in terrorist activities that are targeted at countries with Western values. 
In examining the evidence that has been provided, the committee is satisfied with the relisting processes and considers that they have been followed appropriately for this organisation. The committee therefore supports the relisting of the organisation under Division 102 of the Criminal Code in order to protect Australians and Australia's interests and finds no reason to disallow the regulations. So the, the question is that we take note of that report. All those in favour say aye. Against? So the ayes have it. Senator Davey. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, I present the report of the Committee on Public Communications Campaigns targeting drug and substance abuse, together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Thank you. So the question is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. So, Senator Polly, did you vote? I wish to speak on the report. Which report was that? The public communications campaign targeting drug and Thanks. substance abuse. So, I'll call you, give you the call. Thanks, Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement report, public communications campaigning targeting drug and substance abuse. Drug use in Australia is on the rise. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission reported that over the past decade, while the Australian population increased by 13 per cent, the number of illicit drug seizures increased by 77 per cent, and the weight of the illicit drugs seized nationally increased by 241 per cent. Statistics such as these highlight why illicit drug use in Australia is a growing concern for not only law enforcement but for the broader society. There is ongoing need to reduce the number of people who use drugs in the first place, but to also have robust harm minimisation strategies in place for those people who are drug users. It is important not to stigmatise these people, but to give them the appropriate pathways to seek help. The harm-related economic impacts of the use of alcohol and drugs is significant, in the tens of billions of dollars, and often has wide-reaching impacts throughout the community. From personal health, crime, premature death, road accidents, workplace accidents and productivity, to domestic and child abuse. There are, notwithstanding the harmful impacts uh, caused internationally by drug manufacturing and trafficking. To combat this issue, the committee set up an inquiry to determine the effectiveness of different approaches to drug use campaigns and reducing demand for illicit drugs and for harm minimisation strategies. This included evaluating stock advertising, and the use of campaigns aimed at various audiences. It also looked at research and evaluation methods used to plan, implement and assess the effect of such campaigns. The committee also looked at identifying best practice approaches to designing and implementing campaigns, including social media, digital channels and traditional advertising to guide Australians' approach to drug demand reduction. And finally, it inquired into the efficiency of the current and past national drug strategies in uh, achieving demand reduction through public communications campaigns. What was clear from the submissions and from the public hearings is that there are many different facets to drug problems in Australia. And this uh, requires a layered approach towards minimising the considerable harm that illegal drugs cause for the community. A focus on harm reduction and community-based approaches to drug minimisation will be most effective at curtailing substance abuse in Australia. This report hands down four recommendations which I urge the government to act on. The first recommendation is that the federal government implement a new communications campaign via the national drug strategy that will support law enforcement agencies' efforts to reduce current and future illicit drug de demands. The National Drug Strategy 2017 to 2026 National Drug uh, Strategy is a 10-year framework that aims to reduce and prevent the harmful effects of alcohol, tobacco and other drugs. This is the seventh iteration of this strategy. 
since it was first introduced in 1985. Like previous iterations, this strategy includes targeted communication strategies as a method to achieve its overall aim of reducing drug-related harms. However, the last campaign activities associated with the strategy was in 2018. With the dissolution of the COAG and its subsidiary arms, the new National Cabinet and its various committees do not include a specific council that brings together health and policing bodies to discuss illicit drug issues. This has been highlighted as a concern throughout the inquiry, considering that there are, have been reports of increased problematic drug use during COVID-19. The work of this strategy was found to be effective, but the time is right for us to take further action now. The report also recommends that the government establish a formal mechanism commensurate with the Council under COAG that is able to give federal and state law enforcement bodies a strong, equal voice in developing policies and strategies to reduce illicit drug demand. The report also makes recommendations about future communication campaigns to reduce illicit drug use and drug-related harm. Public communications campaigns have been used in Australia for many years to disseminate information about health and to persuade people to change their behaviour. A prominent example is the Grim Reaper ads, which aired over 30 years ago. This utilised shock advertising to gain attention and as a catalyst for encouraging additional thought and comprehension. Some might argue that it is still is. What was found throughout the inquiry was that the best practical approach to public communications campaigns on drug use will recognise people who use drugs as people first without using images of them or drug use as part of the shock advertising campaigns. A core aim of any public campaign regarding drug use must aim to reduce the stigma around drug use and people who use drugs, encourage harm reduction practices and promote avenues to seek help if desired. What was noted in the hearings and in several submissions is that shock advertising on its own is not effective. There were assertions made that shock advertising has been overused in Australia and potentially has lost its high impact and emotional response. This is not to say that it doesn't work at all, but it has changed. The personalisation of media means that shock advertising needs to take a collective approach and requires a societal shift that is refocusing the message to be one of social harm versus individual harm. Further, an emotional response does not need to be indi indicated in, uh, dictated by shock advertising. There are other means by which we can do that. For example, the social impact of behaviours is something which we can leverage for younger people to pay more attention. I think we can also remember the pinky road safety campaign. The key is getting people to think about how your friends, family or even a potential love interest would look at you if you were speeding. Trying to evoke a similar emotion can be effective at changing behaviours, especially for younger people. This demographic is important when you consider that 80 per cent of first-time illicit drug users are between the ages of 15 and 21. Careful attention must also focus on stigmatisation of drug users in marketing campaigns, as this can have the opposite of the desired effect on the individual and actually prevent them seeking help. However, this requires balance, as a negative, sting, uh, negative stigma can also be an important tool in regulating behaviour, and that is why it's important to advocate for strong law enforcement strategies to be an integral element of any anti-drug campaign. We must also support a comprehensive communication arm which spe specific focus on younger people with specific safety message. It is important for law enforcement to be closely connected to their community and to have a community-focused model to curtail the problem on increasing 
illicit drug use in Australia. There must be a holistic approach towards harm minimisation and reduction strategy. Funding needs to be made on an ongoing basis with multiple arms. The spending on mass media campaigns in its own is a waste if it's not accompanied by community programs, school uh, programs, treatments and other types of drug and alcohol supports. They are focused on reducing harm. There also needs to be ongoing research into the effectiveness, effectiveness of addiction treatment programs in reducing drug-related crime. What we have seen throughout the COVID-19 pandemic is that public health messaging can be effective, especially from a law enforcement perspective but it must focus on authenticity. This comes with messaging, which also having groups and communities on board. You cannot do this in isolation. It has to be a holistic approach if we're going to reduce the harm and the increase in drug use of illicit drugs, alcohol and tobacco in this country. Thank you, Senator Polly. The question is that the, um, the Senate take note of the report. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the 195th report of the committee. Thank you. Um, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. Against? The ayes have it. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Rusty. On behalf of the Acting Minister for Women, Minister, uh, Minister Lee, I table a ministerial statement on the Women's Budget Statement 2021-22. Sorry, Senator Waters. Yes, hello, uh, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short statement in response to that, which I understand I'm able to do for 10 minutes. You can just simply move yep, to take great. note. Okay, I move to take note. Can I just clarify it is, in fact, 10 minutes long? Yes. Great. Thank you very much for your clarification there. Um, I rise to speak to the, uh, the tabling of the uh, women's budget statement, which at least this year is less of the glossy booklet than it was last year when it was belatedly published uh, several hours after the budget. At least this time there's a proper booklet. Um, but unfortunately, it bears no resemblance to a women's budget impact statement, which used to be delivered um, as part of the budget until Tony Abbott axed it in 2014. I believe he was Minister for Women at the time, so really kicking goals there for women um, as he did so well in that role. Uh, so what the Women of Australia actually uh, deserved was a women's uh, budget impact statement to be applied as a gender lens on decisions that were taken prior to they uh, ending up in the budget and a gender lens applied to then assess the impacts for women of the budget. That would have been a true women's budget Im impact statement. That is what we still do not have and have not had since 2014 uh, when Tony Abbott got rid of it. Um, so nonetheless, I want to take the opportunity to respond formally on the record to some of the uh, components of last night's so-called women's budget. Uh, <laughs> Jumping the shark a little bit there, because in fact um, it's been described as all icing and no cake, and many of the uh, budgetary measures, some of which are positive, um, only last uh, a handful of years and then rapidly drop off. Uh, but that's not the worst of it. I want to start firstly with domestic violence funding. Now we know that domestic violence is at an epidemic level. It's one in three women are affected by that. It's one in five for sexual violence. It's horrific, um, and it's everywhere. And we're starting to talk about it more and more. And sadly, more and more people are reporting that that is what they're now facing. And we know it's not just physical violence, it's emotional violence as well. It's something called coercive control. It's getting a good amount of attention. It's a huge problem. And for many, many years, the service uh, responders, the frontline service response uh, sector folk have been crying out for more support so that they don't have to turn women away. And we've heard horrific stories of various different people, whether they be uh, crisis accommodation, women's shelters, whether they be legal advice, whether they be other services to support women when they flee violence. They have said year after year that they don't have enough funding to help everyone and that they are having to turn people away. 
I don't want to, but they simply don't have the resources to do so. So, um, when we heard rumours that there might be an increase in funding for frontline response services, we took some hope from that. But sadly, what we saw last night, you know, at first blush, it might sound good, um, in that the funding has been doubled. But even after that doubling of funding, it is still one quarter of what the sector has asked for, so that they can help everyone uh, that reaches out to seek their help. I don't think that's going to fly. Um, women aren't stupid. Uh, we remember the events of this year, um, and for many, many years we have known that that sector is drastically underfunded and that far more um, attention is needed on the issue. And so uh, one, delivering one quarter of what's required is not good enough. More and more women keep dying. This is deadly serious in every sense of the word. And so for the government to think that they can do a little bit but not actually go the whole way is just not okay. And it's not like they're short of dough because, in fact, there's $62 billion of handouts for big corporates in last night's budget. There's $51 billion in fossil fuel subsidies over four years in last night's budget. They're not short of money. It's about where they're allocating it. And they've chosen to once again underfund frontline domestic violence services. They've chosen to champion that they've doubled a deeply inadequate amount, which is still inadequate. It's a quarter of what's required. So that's our, um, that's our main objection to this budget, that it talked a big game, but it is under-delivering for women. Now, um, there's a little bit more money for childcare, but people are going to have to wait quite a while for that, um, and it's a, a, a very prescribed criteria to get the benefit of that, and it's a pretty marginal benefit at that. The Greens think that early childhood education should be free. It should be available and accessible and free to all kids that desperately need that early childhood education to set them up for a, a great and hopeful life, um, to help aid workforce participation. Um, but it's very interesting that we're told that childcare belongs as part of the women's spend. Well, uh, yes, we bear a disproportionate amount of the care load, but it shouldn't be that way. So it's a bit 1950s, folks, to be pitching it as a women's measure when, in fact, it's a measure for families. So anyway, yet more 1950s rhetoric um, from this government. Um, now, there was a welcome uh, announcement, a very small one, but welcome one, to scrap that threshold of $450 for, um, for superannuation. So if you earned below that amount, your employers didn't have to pay you super. Now, of course, that, was, um, that further compounded the retirement income equality gap. We know that women retire with, on average, just less than half um, of what their male counterparts do, um, and uh, removing that threshold is a small step in the right direction. But where's the superannuation on paid parental leave? There was a budget leak saying that that would be in there. Um, and women take a lot of caring gaps from the workforce. Adding super to PPL was, has been a long-standing ask and would have been um, a, f a very effective addition to, um, to that welcome scrapping of the 450 threshold. There's been no explanation of why that, that leak wasn't followed through on. Um, we don't know. Everyone thinks it's a good idea, and yet this government has not come to the table. The other thing they've not come to the table on is decent funding for respectful relationships um, education. This government wasted $4 million on a milkshake consent video, which was rightfully pilloried for being bizarre, confusing and actively harmful to the message about consent. They managed to waste $4 million on that, but in this budget there's not a single cent for recognised, expert-drafted, respectful relationships education. Our Watch, who are the National Primary Prevention um, Agency, the, the, the peak body, the experts, have designed and piloted and evaluated as successful a respectful relationships program um, that's been rolled out in Victoria and Queensland. It works. That would have been an ideal opportunity for this government to redeem themselves after the horror that was the milkshake video, the abomination of that six minutes of 
pouring $4 million down the drain while actively worsening the issue. But no, there was no funding for respectful relationships in last night's budget. What another missed opportunity. Now, job seeker, which sadly uh, women disproportionately receive, again, it is below the poverty line. And we um, were told that uh, we're supposed to be happy with 57 cents um, increase a day. N no, no, that, that, that's not enough for people to live on. Um, Women are disproportionately relying on job seeker, and this government once again is letting them down. But perhaps the biggest gap in the budget last night for women was a complete absence of investment in housing. Now we're in a housing crisis in this country, and it's not just a crisis, um, a housing crisis of crisis accommodation, but it's a housing crisis for transitional housing, and it's a housing crisis for long-term affordable housing. There is no affordable housing at any of those stages of someone's needs. And you know the fastest growing cohort of homeless people in Australia? It used to be women over 55. After COVID, it's women over 45. And yet this government, not a scintilla of a cent to invest in public housing um, or to seriously boost crisis housing. You want economic stimulus? You want to create jobs? Build people homes. There is no better way to stimulate the economy and generate the jobs that you claim to care about um, and to fix the housing crisis at the same time. But no, this budget simply retains, I think it's $8.5 billion um, for the negative gearing and capital gains perks. In fact, I think that's just the capital gains component. Massive handouts to, the, to, to investors that own five or six homes absolutely nothing on public housing and this weird 2 per cent um, approach to loans for single parents. No single parent I know has got a spare 2 per cent for a home loan deposit. It would be 10 grand if you're lucky if you could find a cheap house. It's not going to happen. This budget um, is an attempt to distract women from this government's appalling track record. They're trying to sell us a pup. It's not enough funding for the things that are needed and the women of Australia deserve better. Senator Hanson Young, are you speaking to this? Oh, I'm not. I'm, I'm seeking leave on another matter. Okay, Senator Waters, did you wish to, to seek leave to continue your, your comments? I do indeed. Thank you thank very you. much. Leave, leave granted. Leave granted. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Madam Acting Deputy President, I just seek leave to put in a notice of motion to uh, deal with an issue of uh, a mix-up and postponement from earlier today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move a motion in relation to Catherine House. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any further ministerial statements? No. Okay. So we'll move on to committee memberships. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of a committee. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you very much. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Health Insurance Amendment Prescribed Fees Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is that this bill be uh, sorry <laughs> be read for the first time. All those in favour say aye. Against? Ayes have it. Clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading incorporated into Hansard. So the question is that the, the, the oh, sorry, is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Against? The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes in the membership of the following joint committees. Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services the Joint Select Committee on Implementation of the National Redress Scheme, the Joint Standing Committee on the National Capital and External Territories, and the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. Clark. 
business orders of a day number five, National Consumer Credit sorry, uh, Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment. <laughs> sorry. Uh, extension and other measures bill twenty twenty one second reading debate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We can't get in the way of Northern Australia no. when it comes to anything, legislation or anything else. Uh, I rise to speak on the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Extension and Other Measures Bill 2021. Yeah. Labor has a long history of supporting development in Northern Australia. In fact, it was Labor that appointed the very first ever Minister for Northern Australia under the Whitlam government. Even before that, the Chifley government, the Curtin government, uh, and since the Whitlam government, the Hawke, Keating, Gillard and Rudd governments have all contributed heavily uh, to the development of Northern Australia. More recently, we supported the Our North, Our Future white paper on developing Northern Australia in 2015 and the initiatives in it, including the star of the show, the $5 billion Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund, better known as the NAIF. It was clear at the time and remains obvious now that the North, which has been neglected for so long, needed a leg up to achieve its full potential. But while Labor supports the Northern Australia agenda and the NAIF, that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at ways to improve it. It is the job of an opposition to scrutinise government policy, hold it to account for its failings and suggest improvements. And when it comes to the NAIF, we have been making many constructive suggestions about how it can be approved for many years. Rarely have we seen a program that has so wholeheartedly failed to deliver what was promised and that is in a government that is notorious for making announcements that it doesn't deliver. The fact is the NAIF is shamefully behind schedule and has woefully under-delivered under on what the Morrison government promised it would do. It must be an embarrassing day for the government to have to come cap in hand admitting that it has wasted five years and now asking for more time to get the NAIF working. It's a bit like a student back at school having to ask for an extension on a class project because they spent too much time talking about what they were going to do and showing off in class rather than just sitting down and getting it done. In fact, the NAIF has been such a flop, it's now widely referred to as the No Actual Infrastructure Fund. And while I know it's a big disappointment to people on the other side of this chamber, it's even more of a disappointment to communities in the North who were once excited by the opportunities it promised. For those who haven't had the pleasure of spending time in Northern Australia, the region is vast and geographically remote, but it's also home to a number of world-class, global-leading businesses and industries. It is bursting in, at the seams with opportunities, whether it be in traditional industries such as agriculture, mining and tourism, or emerging industries, whether it be renewables, hydrogen and tropical science and many other things. As outlined in the government's Northern Australia agenda, the NAIF was supposed to offer loan support to projects across northern Queensland, Western Australia and the Northern Territory as an alternative to traditional bank loans. We know that it can be tough to get business loans in remote regions, and sometimes traditional banks don't appreciate the value of out-of-the-box innovation, the kind we want to see more of in the North. There are organisations from Townsville to Darwin and across to Karratha and everywhere in between that are leading the world with innovations in mining, agriculture, health, education and sustainability. These smaller, unique projects, which have had a hard time getting a bank loan, were hoping to find a partner in the NAIF. But unfortunately for many, to date, this hasn't proven to be the case. That's because in the six years since it was announced, the NAIF has comprehensively failed to deliver what the government promised. Now, if there's one thing this government is good at, as I say, it's making an announcement. Any time there's a headline to be had, there they are, ready to cut a ribbon. But there's a long way between announcement and delivery, and this government seems to drop the ball every time. The NAIF, sadly, has become just another example of this habit of this Morrison government. We see media release after media release about projects the NAIF has approved or how much they say they'll spend from the NAIF. But when you look at how much has actually got out the door and into communities, it's a completely different story. As I mentioned before, the NAIF was so shamefully behind schedule, it has now had to ask for more time to get the job done. When the coalition government established the NAIF, it promised to invest $5 billion in five years. Instead, now it's expected to take double that, or maybe even more. When the NAIF appeared before Senate estimates at the end of March, 
It revealed that of its $5 billion budget, only $314 million has actually been released. That's about 6 per cent of its budget that has been released after five years. In my home state of Queensland, the NAIF has only released $56.7 million. I really think that people in North Queensland and Northern Australia generally really thought they would have seen more come out of the NAIF by now. As I say, that means that at this point in time, only 6 per cent of funding has got out the door in the time that it was supposed to spend 100 per cent of its budget. So there's still 94 per cent of the NAIF's funding to get out the door and into Northern Australia. At this rate, it will take nearly 80 years to release the full $5 billion that was promised to Northern Australia via the NAIF. That money is no good sitting in a Canberra bank account. We need to get those funds out to businesses in Northern Australia so that they can start building infrastructure, employing locals and improving services in the north. It's good the Morrison government will have more time to fix its mistakes, but with its track record it's fair for communities to be sceptical the government will pick up its act. Because even when the NAIF does approve a project for funding, this government's prejudices are blocking it from proceeding. Only last week it was revealed that the Minister for Northern Australia, Minister Pitt, had personally intervened to veto a NAIF loan to a $380 million renewable energy project near Cairns in far north Queensland. The NAIF board had approved this project. They would finally found a project that was worthwhile to invest in, that was going to create jobs and do lots more for North Queensland. But Minister Pitt quietly over overturned it. Now, this is, as I understand it, the very first time a minister has used this power. Minister Pitt told the head of the NAIF via a letter that the approval of this project was inconsistent with the aims of the federal government. Killing a $380 million project and the jobs that it would have brought to far north Queensland is a new low for this government. This project would have delivered 250 jobs in north Queensland, as well as delivering more reliable and affordable power, which would have actually uh, generated more jobs in more industries. Now, far north Queensland economies have been hit particularly hard by the COVID pandemic, especially with the closure of international borders. And now is not the time to be ripping the rug out from under new jobs for locals. This is an embarrassing move by this government. Its own prejudices against renewable power and the jobs that it can create have led to it overturning uh, a loan for a company that was approved by the NAIF. It is embarrassing that we've got a minister who will put his own prejudices ahead of the region that he claims to represent. It's embarrassing that we've got a minister who would rather stick his head in the sand than fund good, clean, cheap energy projects that, were, could, that could deliver jobs to regions who need them. And I might say I look back on the fact that when, when Senator Canavan was the Minister for Northern Australia, he at least allowed funding for solar farms, for other renewable projects to go ahead. In fact, the biggest loan that the NAIF has approved is for a renewables project in North Queensland. But it would seem under Minister Pitt that kind of thing has no future because of his own prejudices against those kind of projects. It is a deep shame, and it's people in far north Queensland who are missing out. When these NAIF powers were introduced to the parliament, it was claimed they would only be used to ensure projects which are contrary to the national interest are not funded. Ripping the rug out of 250 energy jobs in far north Queensland is not in the national interest. This government's prejudice against renewables is costing jobs and lower power prices and holding regional Australia back. The NAIF is plagued by enough problems getting money out the door without having to manage a minister who quietly goes around knocking off projects that he doesn't like. As I mentioned earlier, Labor has been making constructive suggestions about what can be done about the NAIF for a number of years now. While the decision to overhaul the NAIF via this legislation is encouraging, the fact is this government has had to be dragged kicking and screaming to do it. I've said before that it's easy to lose count of how many reviews and rehashes of programs the government has announced for Northern Australia in the last few years. It's taken four reviews in as many years, two Senate inquiries and countless calls from Labor for the government to agree to make any changes to the NAIF operations. All of this inaction has meant people are still waiting to get any real results. That's if they haven't already given up and taken their projects interstate or overseas. Finally, at the end of last year, the Morrison government agreed to come to the table on some long overdue reforms. Labor hopes, when implemented, these reforms will be a step in the right direction. 
However, after the games we saw from Minister Pitt last week, Labor will be putting forward some amendments of our own to safeguard the NAIF from ideological whims of the Minister of the Day. People in Northern Australia can't afford to see the next five years roll by and still be no better off. Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, and Keith Pitt, the Minister, must top, stop talking about it and get, start getting money out the door. Looking at the legislation as it has been proposed by this government, Labor supports the proposed extension of NAIF for another five years, beyond its current expiry of 30 June this year to 30 June 2026. I've, so, so I've spoken with many businesses, community leaders and others in, in the North about this, and many still hold on to the hope that the NAIF can fill an ongoing market gap in accessing finance in the region. There are project, propo project proponents interested in seeking funds through the NAIF. Let's hope the government makes better use of the next five years and gets behind them. Labor also supports the proposal to expand the activities eligible for financial assistance beyond the construction of Northern Australia infrastructure to the development of Northern Australia economic infrastructure. This change is consistent with much of the feedback received by the Senate inquiry into the effectiveness of the Australian government's Northern Australia agenda that the NAIF should support more smaller projects. The inquiry repeatedly heard from stakeholders across the North that the NAIF was not accessible to smaller projects and that while big-ticket infrastructure projects are always important, often smaller projects have the largest impact on communities in the region. This legislation will also allow the NAIF to lend directly to project proponents rather than directing funding through state and territory governments as it currently does. The biggest criticism of the NAIF, both from Labor and from people in the North, is the length of time that it takes to get money out the door to projects. Labor wants to see this money hitting the ground faster and hopefully simplifying the administrative processes will assist this. And I might just say that in, in reaching our position on this bill, uh, we have consulted uh, the Queensland, Northern Territory and Western Australian governments, none of whom have any uh, issue uh, with being taken out of the process of NAIF loans being forwarded. And as I say, we do hope that that move uh, will increase the speed with which the government can get money out the door. Um, it is important to acknowledge the concerns raised by environment groups that these changes would remove the ability of state or territory governments to block a project that may have adverse environmental impacts. However, as I say, the three relevant state governments, uh, as well as many other groups across the North, have given this change the green light. In addition, any project considered by the NAIF <coughs> would still have to meet existing federal, state or territory environmental and other regulatory processes and the NAIF, retains, NAIF Act retains the prohibition on a minister directing the NAIF to fund a particular project. Something Labor has been calling for for years now is for the NAIF to broaden the types of financial assistance available to provide to projects. Currently, the NAIF only provides loans. This bill proposes that, in addition to loans, the NAIF offer letters of credit, purchase of bonds, guarantees and equity investments. These investment options are consistent with other government financing bodies, such as the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. This change could have a massive positive benefit, uh, especially for smaller projects and those led by First Nations communities, which historically have had a much harder time receiving NAIF assistance. As of 25 March this year, only two First Nations projects have reached the investment decision stage with the NAIF, and together these two projects only represent 1 per cent of the NAIF's total funds. This is just not good enough, and it's led to uh, one of the amendments that Labor will be proposing to this bill. I'll just very briefly touch on the amendments that we're proposing, because we'll obviously have an opportunity to talk to them at more length later on. Um, later has been, Labor has been calling on the government and the NAIF to work on having greater engagement with First Nations communities on the development of Northern Australia. Um, the bill attempts to address this by including experience in economic development for Indigenous communities in the list of fields of expertise sought for the NAIF board. Labor supports this change, but we do not believe that this goes far enough. First Nations communities are such an important part of Northern Australia, but are often completely left out of the discussion by this government. To really address the challenges First Nations projects face in accessing the NAIF, Labor would like to see a dedicated position on the NAIF board for a First Nations representative. Both the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation and Indigenous Business Australia require First Nations members on their boards. We don't believe the NAIF should be any different. Uh, Labor would also like to see the Indian Ocean Territories included as part of Northern Australia. My time is running out, running out, so I'll come back to that at a later point. 
And uh, a further amendment that we are proposing, which is particularly important in light of Minister, Pitt, Minister Pitt's actions, is to encourage the NAIF board to support projects that help Australia achieve net zero emissions by 2050, something that will create jobs and help our environment. There are a range of other amendments that we'll be putting forward, but I'll talk to them later. Um, and, and I also want to flag that I'll be moving a second reading amendment in my name, circulated on sheet 1284. Thank you, well Senator done. Watt. Great speech. <laughs> Senator Watt, if you could move, Senator Watt, if you could move that now. Oh, sorry, yeah. I thought I had. Um, I move a second reading amendment in my name, circulated on sheet one two eight four. Thank you, um, Senator Waters. Thank you. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I rise to uh, to speak on this Northern Australia Infrastructure uh, Facility Amendment Extension and Other Measures Bill, um, which for everybody's uh, mercy. I'll just call the NAIF bill in future. The bill, um, people will remember that when this first was set up five years ago, it was at the behest of the National Party, and it was a $5 billion slush fund for coal mines and dams. Canavan, uh, Minister, then Minister Canavan was in charge at the time, and it was pretty obvious that that's what they were seeking. They extracted that commitment from the Liberal, Liberal government, and hey presto, we got the NAIF um, facility. Now, it's been interesting to watch over the subsequent years um, that actually there's been some positive projects that have received funding under NAIF, projects that we would consider um, environmentally sustainable, job creating, generally good for the region. So it's been actually fascinating to watch what was initially set up as um, something to fund dirty projects that would wreck the planet um, but keep the nationals happy. Uh, actually be a, a, a force for some good when it funded those positive projects. So we approach this, um, this amendment bill with some interest. Uh, the bill uh, now wants to extend the, um, the NAIF for a further five years because they actually have had trouble getting the money out the door. Um, maybe it's because those coal mines and dams are in fact uneconomic and a bad idea and the private sector sees that and actually doesn't want to um, uh, go through with those sorts of developments. Uh, but these amendments also they want to put a departmental officer onto the NAIF board. Um, they want to remove the ability of state governments to veto uh, funding going to projects in their states, and they want to expand the types of funding mechanisms to include equity investments and acquisition of derivatives. The amendments have been promoted as a way of achieving flexibility, but the aim is really clear. The government wants to deliver for its mates. It's what it does best, uh, certainly what it did in last night's budget. So, I mean, we raised concerns at the time that this would be a bank for fossil fuels. And with these amendments proposed by the government in this bill that we're debating now, that would be locked in. It would be undeniably a bank for fossil fuels. Now, Minister Pitt, who's the, who's the now minister, didn't even try to hide his desire that the NAIF be used um, as a slush fund for the gas industry when he made his remarks um, uh, last time this was debated, and in fact I think it was in the media last week, he boasted about how these amendments would open up more opportunities for Beedaloo infrastructure financing. Um, now we know the Beedaloo um, is a massive gas basin um, that this government and I think sadly the opposition at the time, I remember an announcement from the then leader Bill Shorten promoting the Beedaloo um, as, a, as a gas extraction uh, boon. Uh, this is exactly the sort of projects that this government now wants the NAIF um, to fund. And it's somewhat ironic, well, frankly, it's hypocritical because um, Minister Pitt just used his veto power as the relevant minister to stop funding going to a wind farm with a battery backup, and yet he wants um, to use public money to go to opening up a new massive gas basin, which would turbocharge the climate crisis. When we have alternatives to gas as energy that don't wreck the climate, um, Minister Pitt wants to use public money um, to stop renewable. He doesn't want to fund renewable projects that would have created 250 jobs in northern Queensland. No, he instead wants to open up a new gas basin. We're kind of used to that from this government. It's fossil fuels or nothing. It's um, a yet another dirty energy fund that is yet another fossil fuel subsidy. And that is on top 
Uh, it's adding insult to injury, really, because we saw in last night's budget, as I've said numerous times since then, um, yet more fossil fuel subsidies in the budget. So this government is handing out public funds to coal, to oil, to gas, to the dirty energy sector, hand over fist. They cannot get the money out the door fast enough when it's public money for dirty projects. And yet they're blocking funding for clean renewable projects. Um, now, Minister Pitt has also boasted that the amendments will allow the Commonwealth to bypass the states, so take away that, um, that veto power. Um, and it's very interesting because the state's veto power was in fact used to block public money going from NAIF to Adani uh, for one of their coal railways. The Queensland government, um, who were a Labor government at the time and, and are still in power in, in my state of Queensland, they felt the force of a really strong public campaign that demanded that they stop public money being funding uh, going to opening up the Galilee Coal Basin, which, if it was opened up, would be um, the equivalent of the, uh, the seventh largest emitter in the world if it was a country. That basin is so big and so much of a carbon bomb. So, uh, full credit to the Queensland Premier at the time, who stopped that funding going to Adani under so much public pressure. So, it is very interesting indeed to hear Senator Watt say that uh, his party has now consulted with the Queensland government and the other relevant governments, who apparently, according to Senator Watt, don't want that veto power anymore. Well, little wonder. Of course, the Queensland government also loves coal loves opening up new coal basins, loves supporting coal and coal fire power. So, of course, they don't want the ability to say no. Um, they want to be able to say their hands are tied. Oh, they can't stand in the way of this public taxpayer money um, going to the fossil fuel industries because actually they think that's a good idea. And I think, frankly, that says all you need to know um, about both of the big parties' approach to spending taxpayer dollars on fossil fuels. We will be moving a series of amendments to try to fix this fund and to try to turn it into a fund for sustainable, job-creating, positive projects um, to service Northern Australia, um, to treat it with the environmental sensitivity and the dignity and the community desires for, um, for good development in the North. Um, there's already been some great projects funded under this NAIF. We want to see more of the good projects funded and less of the projects funded that First Nations mobs have not consented to, that are making the climate crisis worse and that don't generate anywhere near the jobs that they promise, as is always the case with the coal mining sector, who frankly um, want to automate as quickly as possible. Now, we've talked um, and long argued that the NAIF should consider the federal government's policy commitment to the Paris Agreement. Now, our current domestic pledges and the ambition needed to come anywhere close to what the science says is needed um, to meet international goals under that agreement, without question means not funding fossil fuel infrastructure. And yet the Morrison government wants to use NAIF to fund gas pipelines, it wants to um, open up new gas fields. They want to throw public funds to throw more fuel on the climate crisis. $51 billion in fossil fuel subsidies in last night's budget wasn't enough for this government. They want this $5 billion slush fund um, to be able to open up new gas pipelines, roads, new gas facilities. They just want more and more taxpayer dollars for the fossil fuel industries that donate to their re-election campaigns and that often offer them plum jobs when they leave parliament. It's an absolute lark. Uh, we will be moving amendments to say that the NAIF should not be allowed to invest in fossil fuels because we are in a climate crisis and uh, we have other alternatives that can provide clean energy that is more affordable, that creates more jobs um, and that respects the environmental limits of the North. And I, um, I hope that the opposition has a rethink on their position on that because when amendments were moved in the House calling for NAIF to not invest public money in new coal, in, in oil, in gas. Um, they, they didn't want that. They voted for this fund to be able to invest in fossil fuels, and the government, of course, voted as well. I hope they've had a rethink on that position 
um, because I, I actually thought they'd expressed differently at some point. Um, but I'll leave that for them to explain their position. The other amendments that we'll seek to move um, would require the environmental impacts of a project to be assessed as part of the process of deciding whether it's suitable to invest in. Um, and so that would include looking at the principles of ecologically sustainable development, which of course includes the precautionary principle, um, which says if you're not sure you're not going to stuff something up, well, don't do it. If there's a risk of stuffing it up, just hold off. Um, so our amendments would, would codify those. Um, we, of course, moved those same amendments. Um, when this fund was first set up um, five odd years ago, we received absolutely no support for them then, and I hope that the story is different now. Um, now, onto the investment risk, there's a proposal for the government uh, to change the modes of funding that can be made available under this uh, facility. Um, and equity investments, which is what's being proposed, really open NAIF up to more speculative investing, uh, which leaves the government holding significant risk for the benefit of private companies. Um, acquisition of derivatives can leave the government with an open-ended, unquantifiable liability if a project proponent becomes insolvent. And in fact, there's been a few examples um, of projects that NAIF has funded that have then been canned. Um, and I'll be asking in the committee stage of this bill well, what's happened to that money. So this is a live prospect. Um, there are some worthwhile small-scale projects, including those championed by First Nations, um, that would benefit from broader investment opportunities. So that's exactly why we're moving an amendment that's saying only those smaller-scale or First Nations um, operations should be allowed to access this equity funding. Um, without that amendment, we fear that these government amendments would in fact incentivise speculative investment that could simply um, underwrite gas supply and prop up otherwise stranded assets. And given NAIF's poor governance practices and processes for assessing the risk on public lending, especially risk in relation to fossil fuels and climate change, this is an unacceptable risk. Tighter rules around eligibility for equity investment options introduced by the bill are essential to ensure that the government isn't left carrying the can for unsustainable fossil fuel projects, which is exactly why our amendments would restrict the use of equity investments to projects undertaken by small, small businesses and Indigenous corporations. And again, I urge the Chamber to consider supporting those amendments so that we can get the benefit for those uh, small operators um, and Indigenous corporations without um, yet another pathway to be subsidising fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, now, the bill also proposes to remove the mandatory requirement for infrastructure to stimulate population growth in Northern Australia. But removing that requirement will again make it easier for the minister to push NAIF into funding gas infrastructure and pipelines, including pipelines that aren't even located in Northern Australia. In terms of the board, requiring the secretary of the department to be a member of the NAIF board undermines any semblance of independence and makes the NAIF directly susceptible to ministerial influence as if it isn't already enough. Um, the minister has been spruiking fossil fuel projects already and using NAIF to further uh, the government's discredited and, um, and dreamlike state of a gas-fired recovery. When the NAIF was created, the government said, and I quote, that the expert, transparent and arm's-length design of the board lends credibility to financial markets, while ensuring that the Commonwealth invests in projects which are viable, provide public benefit and unlock the potential of Northern Australia." End quote. Well, when it turns out that those investments aren't um, in fossil fuels, the government tries to regain control of the decision-making process. In the Senate inquiry into the operation of the NAIF, we heard evidence from First Nations and regional communities um, in Northern Australia that the board did need to take a more innovative approach to investment and look beyond the traditional and often outdated and unsustainable projects like mines and dams. And yet this bill and this government are stuck in that tired, same 1950s mindset. Um, now, we strongly, just on the veto power, which I touched on earlier, we strongly oppose allowing uh, NAIF to loan directly to entities and bypassing state and territory governments. Previous reviews have in fact raised concerns about the constitutional validity of direct loans, and the government hasn't provided any compelling evidence that those concerns have in fact been addressed. So we're calling for this bill to be referred to the Environment and Communications Legislative Committee to allow this issue and other problems with the bill um, to be examined. And that's an opportune time for me to uh, move the second reading amendment standing in my name. Um, Senator Waters, Senator Waters, I think because we already have. Oh, um, for shadow. 
You'll Thank foreshadow you. it. Thank you. I will foreshadow um, that we will be moving that second reading uh, amendment, standing in my name, but I don't have the sheet number to hand. I apologise. Um, the NAIF's clear function is to grant financial assistance to states and territories for the construction of Northern Australia economic infrastructure. Um, uh, that's from the existing uh, legislation. And previous reviews of NAIF identified the need for it to work more closely with state and territory governments, not to completely um, ignore and go around them. So providing the option of bypassing the states and territories simply increases the federal government's power and takes away a key check and balance. It also puts uh, worthwhile projects at risk where the constitutional validity of the loan uh, arrangement is unresolved. In short, this is yet more public money for fossil fuels, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can amend this facility so that it promotes positive, sustainable development in the north. It's exactly why the Greens will be moving the amendments that I've uh, mentioned. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Extension and Other, men amendments, uh, other Measures Bill 2021. It's interesting. I have come to this place specifically to support legislation and actions such as this. And it is the comments of both the opposition and the Greens that provides resolve and steel in my heart as to why this was the right decision. The fantastical description of Northern Australia and the complete lack of understanding of the outrageous control provided by inner city uh, Greens and uh, people who have no understanding of the potential of Northern Australia and the opportunities it provides, of what they continue to deny to the communities in Northern Australia, uh, both uh, Indigenous and other. It is enough to make me weep. So I support the amendments that have been brought forward by Minister Keith Pitt as practical, as able to continue uh, facilitating the um, uh, financing of critically important uh, projects in Northern Australia. This coalition government is about turbocharging its investment project, a program and agenda for North Australia to make it easier for projects to receive funding and to generate economic development and jobs, not just as the country emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic, but into the future. And as part of the 2020-21 budget, our government announced reforms to the NAIF to provide more flexibility, increase risk appetite and widen the scope of eligible projects. So it does. It sticks in my craw that we have uh, members of the Greens who have left the chamber, of course. They're not prepared to listen to the reality of what's going on. They're not interested in understanding that there was no battery in the proposed infrastructure that was rejected by the minister. There is uh, no reality in their concept that this is a fund that has been established only to fund fossil fuel projects. This is a fund that allows uh, an intervention in the uh, capital crisis that is happening in North Australia uh, because it has been the failure of the market for insurance and, more broadly, the failure of our banking institutions to lend to projects, uh, not just large ones but small ones, like truck stops, like housing and other uh, business um, uh, projects. So the proposed reforms seek to address stakeholder criticism of the NAIF regarding it being risk adverse and not proactive enough and follow recommendations from the statutory review of the NAIF. And I'm going to touch on just a couple of the proposed amendments to the NAIF Act 2016, the first of which is, of course, extending the period of time in which the NAIF can make investment decisions out to 30 June 2026. This is critically important because the government's uh, announcement uh, recently of the reinvestment pool, the $10 billion program over 10 years, will facilitate greater investment in the north that has not been able to happen due to the, the insurance failure, the market failure in northern Australia. It will accelerate lending 
allowing the NAIF to lend directly to proponents under certain circumstances. Now, there's been some com com comment about whether or not the states should have approval processes, uh, approval uh, points in this process. Now, remembering that the state jurisdictions, uh, in addition to not providing any finance in the NAIF approval, not having any skin in the game, there is also an extensive array of approval processes at a local government, a state government and a federal government process. So this suggestion that the NAIF is in any way going to threaten the environmental, cultural uh, or uh, other parts of Northern Australia is fanciful, because this is a nation that's tied up in so much red tape, so much approval, that we could not possibly provide any more opportunity to stop projects than we already have. Uh, Senator Waters referred to the precautionary principle. We in the North are uh, very familiar with the precautionary principle, where projects go for approval and after seven, eight years withdraw their application because there is no way through the approval processes of local, state and sometimes federal governments. These changes then will allow to speed up the approvals process at least for the NAIF funding. On average, state governments are allowing approvals to sit on their desks, remembering that they have already projects have already gone through an approval process and there is no financial skin in the game for the states. On average, projects sit on state government treasurer desks for 283-odd days. 283-odd days. And guess who pays for that? The project proponents who are spending money on consultants, on uh, other sorts of approval processes that is just coming out of money that could be spent on the ground improving uh, businesses and communities in northern Australia. The change in the legislation will also permit the NAIF to, to establish on lending partnerships with local financiers to, approve, to improve access to NAIF finance for smaller project proponents. These partners have the expertise to work with smaller proponents to, to demonstrate their suitability for NAIF finance and will extend the NAIF's reach to those smaller projects that need added assistance in these economically challenging times. This is an incredibly exciting change. I've got projects lining up. We're stacking and racking projects that will bring jobs uh, and econ economic prosperity to Northern Australia, and they're waiting on these changes to go through the Senate. There is absolutely no way that we should be approving, uh, that we should be allowing this bill to be referred to any other committee when it has been the subject to statutory reviews, to Senate inquiries. There, the work has been done. We cannot delay these people getting on with terrific projects uh, that, as I said, will bring real jobs, prosperity and opportunity to our communities in northern Australia. The NAIF was previously restricted to just funding the physical construction works only, and I am delighted that these changes, the practical changes brought by the very practical minister, Minister Pitt, will allow NAIF finance to be available to additional elements of infrastructure construction, such as equipment purchases or leasing, training and the expansion of existing business operations. And these reforms will ensure that the NAIF can take a holistic approach to supporting economic growth and jobs. I mean, it might interest members of the opposition and the Greens that the total NAIF investment is now sitting at $2.9 billion, money that has gone out the door when projects are completed, projects like the Centre of Excellence at the Cowboys Stadium in Townsville, uh, the construction of the accommodation at JCU University, the approval of the hydro project at Kidston. There are projects right across Australia that are going to bring real jobs, real opportunity to the north. And again, it is time that people based in inner city Melbourne, inner city Brisbane, stop lecturing to those of us who live in Northern Australia and are desperate for this opportunity. 
desperate for this kind of capital uh, availability. We've talked also about empowering the NAIF to use equity finance. Again, I'm not sure what part I need to explain uh, to the opposition and the Greens about what risk means. What these changes to the NAIF will do will allow the government to, put, to take a stake in some of these investment opportunities, to, uh, to take a risk and back businesses that will build development, that will build agriculture, irrigation projects, uh, that will build mining projects, that will build the supporting infrastructure that communities need and want. Because the Greens and Labor will talk about risk, but they never talk about opportunity, because they never put their hands in their own pockets and build something, build a job, build a project. Instead, that is always left. To, to real people, real conservatives, and this is what this legislation is going to do. We're also strengthening the governance of the board by adding a greater, a greater mix, adding a government board member, making the Minister for Finance jointly responsible for the investment mandate, and allowing the NAIF board to delegate decision making where appropriate and adding in experience in economic development for Indigenous communities to the list of relevant areas for board expertise. And $83.5 million is being provided from 2021 to 2526 to the NAIF for the five-year extension and, the implementation, uh, and to implement these reforms. As I've said already, there has been a statutory review. It commenced in July 2019. It was released in 2020. It made 28 recommendations. This review was extensive, with over 100 entities consulted and 122 face-to-face -face meetings across the North taking place. Now, I was part of a select committee of the Senate on the effectiveness of the Northern Australia Agenda. It was chaired by the opposition and it recommended that these reforms uh, from the statutory review be passed by the parliament as a priority. Well, here we are. Here we are trying to pass the recommendations of the statutory review and I'm delighted to hear Senator Watt talking about supporting uh, these changes of the NAIF, uh, to the NAIF. But it is embarrassing. It is embarrassing to have a shadow minister who doesn't understand the difference between money approved and money out the door, who doesn't understand the way project funds are drawn down in a project, who doesn't understand that sometimes a project can be completed before the funds are drawn down, and yet continues banging on about this in this Senate chamber. It's becoming tiresome. I think we might need to run some sort of workshop Finance 101. Yep. And while we're at it, we'll do Water 101, because I'm tired of being lectured to by opposition senators who don't understand that water rights sit with the states, that the water resource plans and the water allocations are held by the state governments, and that happens under the federal constitution. And the reason why that works is because as states we are so parochial. We don't want to hand over approvals for water projects to anybody else, and it doesn't matter how much money the federal government throws at water projects. Currently, we're up to $3.5 billion available for water projects in this country. And can we build a dam in Queensland? Of course we can't, because Labor doesn't believe in water projects. They don't believe in developing the north. They don't believe in opportunity and prosperity for people who live north of Brisbane because they don't understand what it's like. But for those of us who do, do live in that part of the country, who know the opportunities, who know the people, the families, the communities, people like Senator Matt Canavan, who lives in Rockhampton, and, and me, who lives in uh, Townsville, we know that the opportunities, we talk about it at every barbecue, at every meeting, and we wring our hands and we say, why can't the South understand? What could happen if you unleash the potential of the North, if you unleash the potential of our people, 
if you unleash the potential of massive rainfall, of suitable soils that has been already demonstrated by the CSIRO in multiple studies? Why is it that we continue to have our hands tied behind our back, that we have our children's opportunities removed by second-class education given by the state, state uh, education departments? by second-class roads when state departments, state, um, departments don't approve or don't spend the maintenance money for roads that they have in their budgets, when state governments continue to treat anybody north in the northern half of Australia as some kind of second-class citizen, possibly a little bit simple, I think they think we are. I think they think we're not smart enough to come in out of the sun, but we know what is possible in the north. These NAIF reforms will help us in part to deliver for Australia, for our families, for our communities, and I recommend these changes and I will be supporting them 1,000 per cent. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the legislation before us is an improvement on what has been a very chequered history for the government under the Northern Australia uh, Infrastructure Fund. Uh, but the improvements we have here do not go nearly far enough, which is why uh, Labor has proposed uh, a series of amendments which we look forward to pursuing in the committee stages of the bill. Uh, we have here a range of significant flaws in the bill which were uh, addressed by the committee report, but also still in many other areas uh, we haven't seen the legislation before us go far enough. It is time for action, time for jobs, and it's time to see that the $5 billion that's been promised to Northern Australia is actually delivering what it's supposed to and what was promised. We can't afford in our country to see yet another episode of the Morrison government over-promising and under-delivering. We need to see the government actually listening to feedback and to be more committed than it has been last time. We have before us a government that simply doesn't take on board feedback. It simply uh, uh, shuts, things, shuts alternate critiques down and puts forward its own position. But that's not the way to get things done in Australia. Labor, on the other hand, wants to see NAIF work. We want to see Northern Australia reach its potential. We have uh, a veto power that the Minister Keith Pitt uh, made use of recently, and Labor believes that is and has been a very dangerous tool. Uh, we've seen uh, that the NAIF board does approve a renewables project like the wind farm in Northern Queensland. That Minister Pitt still took the final say. This is not what good decision-making should represent, where you've got the ideological position of a government and a minister, uh, where you've, on the other hand, got a board, by the fact that it's stacked with a number of Liberals, but it's actually made a good economic decision to support a renewable energy project, and still the minister, Keith Pitt, seeks to use their veto powers to overturn such a decision. So renewable projects like the Kidston Pumped Hydro project near Townsville, uh, we've got Northern Australia, which is absolutely full of potential for hydrogen, particularly in my home state of Western Australia. Hydrogen, solar and wind, and hydrogen projects that are also driven by solar and wind, as well as tidal and other forms of renewable energy, and that hydrogen, as well as other manufacturing uh, and industrial processing, can and should be supported by cheap renewable energy. We should have a national, a northern, an Australian, an infrastructure fund that supports those objectives so that Northern Australia can harness its natural potential on behalf of the nation. We see a timely amendment uh, in 
uh, one that would encourage the NAIF board to support projects that help Australia achieve a net zero emissions by 2050. This is something that Labor very much believes will create jobs and help our environment. And I ask those office opposite to seriously think about where do you honestly think our northern Australia, far from Canberra, where we are now, where do you honestly think northern Australia is going to find its future? Is it going to be only in fossil fuels? No, we know that it's going to be based in its enormous renewable energy power, and yet we seem to be beset over and over by an ideological obsession from the coalition to oppose a renewable energy agenda, to see this kind of interference uh, taking place in organisations like the NAIF. We want to create jobs and help our environment, but more fundamentally, or equally fundamentally, we want a future for Northern Australia and its people. We've seen in the last 18 months a very challenging environment for Northern Australia. We've seen drought, fire, floods in the eastern states, trade embargoes that have certainly affected Western Australia, COVID-19, and in particular we've seen significant skills and housing shortages. And we've seen that right across the north, be that Queensland, the Northern Territory or Western Australia. Everywhere I go in Western Australia, there are people struggling to find rentals, companies struggling to find skilled workers. The thing is, it's been like this for a while, but we find, particularly in places like um, Caratha and Port Hedland, that this problem we've cycled through it many times, and yet this Commonwealth government doesn't want to offer up any solutions. In terms of the amendments that we would like to see and the objective of NAIF, we really want to see NAIF's investments mandate updated. And in this sense, it should include a portfolio benchmark return in line with that of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. NAIF loans and equity investments are in for for-profit projects. And Labor believes that this should be fair and reasonable that we have an expectation that the government has a return on the investment of taxpayer funds in private uh, sector projects. And in this context, again, it sees why we don't actually look to proper commercial arrangements, where we don't have this ridiculous type of veto power, where, frankly, many corporations, given the interest rates uh, globally at the moment, they could choose NAIF, or frankly, they might say to themselves, the risk of pursuing uh, approval through NAIF uh, is simply ridiculous. It's simply not worth it because not only have we got the normal commercial arrangements, we've also got arbitrary and ideologically uh, informed veto powers. And this is absolutely ridiculous. Key points that Labor has pursued uh, relate very much to uh, the Indian Ocean Territories and that they should also be included in having access to the NAIF, but also critically that First Nations communities are embedded in the decision-making process. It's a dire shame and a dire problem that they have so often been left out of consultation and other processes by this government. And we believe that the change that's in the legislation before us doesn't go far enough. It simply doesn't place First Nations people in a decision-making people uh, position over the kinds of projects that they would like to see go forth. For example, we very much believe that First Nations people should have a dedicated person on the NAIF board, a First Nations representative. For example, Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, Indigenous Business Australia, they require First Nations people on their boards. And in, in Labor's view, we don't believe that it should be any different at all. 
Uh, we note. Thank you, Senator Pratt. It, it being 7:20, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I, I, uh, I rise to say thanks, to say thanks and congratulations to the Beef Australia Committee, who last week put on the best beef week ever. Best beef week ever. Uh, a fantastic job uh, from Bryce Cam and his team. Uh, beef Week is hosted in Rockhampton every three years, uh, and it's getting bigger and better with every version. And despite all of the challenges uh, of COVID, of international travel bans, of random state border closures, uh, the Beef Australia team put on an excellent event in Rockhampton last week. It was extremely well intended. In fact, a record 115,000 people through the gate in Rockhampton last week. And I know my colleague, Senator Susan Macdonald, was one of those people who joined many other uh, Liberal or National members of parliament there for the celebrations. I should also recognise that Senator Macdonald has previously been a director of uh, Beef Australia board and helped run Beef Australia's. And, uh, her legacy was on show last week. There were 63 tonnes of beef consumed last week. 63 tonnes of beef. Now, to put that in context, if, say, like, if they were all divided up into a 250-gram rump, that would be 250,000 steaks. 250,000 steaks. And so, remember those figures: 115,000 people through the gate, and 250,000 steaks. Basically, everybody had two steaks while they were there at Beef Week. And I think Susan and I were probably batting above the average uh, during the week, uh, but it was uh, no one went home hungry from Beef Week. Uh, there were 3.6 million cattle sold uh, last week at Beef Week, an enormous number of 5,000 cattle on show. I congratulate all the winners uh, that were showing their cattle. The Carcass Comp, run by Nolans and many other people uh, who won prizes last week, and, and there was an enormous amount of positivity. I'm sure Senator McDonald will agree with me that one of the great things about Beef Week last week wasn't just the the number of people there. I've never seen Rocky busier. We had traffic jams. Uh, my kids got late to school one day because of one. It was amazing to see how many people were around. But it was also not just the people. It was how positive the outlook is uh, for the industry, which is just fantastic to see. Uh, of those 3.6 million cattle sold, the average price of uh, grain and grass-fed cattle was uh, were over $2,000 a head, which you know, from a few years ago, that's up, that's up four or five times, as Senator Macdonald knows, in terms of value, and, and that is obviously playing a big part in terms of the positivity in the industry. There's been challenges there with, uh, with China uh, delisting a number of abattoirs, but there continues to be such strong demand for the high-quality protein that our cattle industry specialises in, uh, and I think there's great confidence that such demand will continue, providing governments here in this country support our great beef industry. I should also reflect that uh, uh, this month, this month of May, uh, when Beef Week was hosted, uh, uh, marks 10 years since the Four Corners live cattle documentary, uh, which uh, ultimately led to, the, uh, to the, the, the disgraceful decision of the then Labor government to cut uh, off at the knees our beef industry across the whole country, Overnight. making a knee-jerk reaction in banning the live cattle trade. It was an absolute stuff up with uh, zero, and we've seen through court documents, almost zero consultation or consideration of the impact of such a decision. It didn't just affect the live cattle industry, it destroyed the entire cattle market across the country. And it's just so great to see that uh, the Labor Party could not kill the cattle industry despite their best efforts 10 years ago. We're back on our feet. Uh, they've recovered from that decision. Uh, and it's great to see the positivity of the industry now. In fact, last year, in positive news, the federal court officially ruled that uh, the Labor Party engaged in misfeasance, public misfeasance, as a result of that decision. They ruled in favour of a class action that was took by live cattle producers and the government, uh, with the, uh, I think, urging from Senators MacDonald and other senators from the Nationalist Party here, did not challenge that result. And eventually, uh, those impacted by Labor's live cattle ban will be compensated for that impact. It's such great news to see Beef Week go well. I'm sure in the next Beef Week, if you missed out last week, don't, don't fear. Uh, there'll be another one in three years' time, uh, hopefully with international borders reopened. So it'll be, it'll be bigger and better again, and because it has become a great, a great event to not just celebrate the Australian beef industry, but to get together with uh, our competitors in other countries like Brazil and the North America, but also our customers in Japan and Korea 
in, in the Middle East. And uh, it's such a great place that Rockhampton becomes the centre of the beef world every three years. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Walsh. Deputy President, well, Scott Morrison's budget speaks for itself, and it says clearly that Scott Morrison has not has not listened to the experts in aged care, the dedicated and hard-working aged care workers. Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg boasted that this was the budget for aged care. Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg boasted that this was the budget for women, but they failed to deliver. If they really wanted to deliver on aged care, they should have put good, secure jobs for the workers at the heart of their budget. If they wanted to show women they care, they should have Senator put Walsh. good, secure jobs Senator for this Walsh. care workforce. Senator Walsh, could I just ask you to address the Prime Minister as the Prime Minister or the member for Cook rather than Scott Morrison? Uh, certainly, <laughs> Acting you. Deputy President. If they wanted to show women they care, they should have put good, secure jobs for this care workforce at the heart of their budget. Instead, this government has decided to try to take advantage of the goodwill of the Australian women who work so hard in our aged care sector. This critical, essential sector needs a pay rise. And I met with amazing aged care workers today, and I want to share their stories. Aged care worker Donna said today, at the end of the day, I don't clock off and say, I'm finished, that's it. I get attached to these people. My heart aches when I see these, pure, these people deteriorating. Donna works full-time hours in her aged care job, and that is not enough. She had to pick up two extra jobs just to make ends meet. How is that fair? Full-time hours should be enough. Does the government see these care roles and think that the reward of caring for another human being is enough for women, that they don't need to be paid a decent living wage because they're helping people? Is this government that out of touch? Because that is exactly what it looks like. Then there's aged care worker Jude. She has been working in aged care for 48 years. Just over $20 an hour is not enough to reward that level of dedication and that level of experience. What does this government have to say to Jude? Does she not deserve a decent living wage? The government has missed the opportunity with this budget to tell these workers they've listened, that these workers are actually worth more. And the government has missed the opportunity to ensure transparency and accountability for where the funding is actually going. And the government has missed this opportunity to really reform the aged care sector for the better, to ensure that the dedicated aged care workers have good, secure jobs so that they can go to work and give the high level of care to their residents that they would like and that the residents deserve. But the Prime Minister missed that opportunity. He missed it completely. Aged care workers have to go back to their facilities, having visited us here in Canberra, knowing that this government has completely failed them. If this government really cared about aged care, if they really cared about aged care workers, they would have done something for them over the last eight years. They wouldn't have sat on the Aged Care Royal Commission interim report for more than a year and a half. They wouldn't have waited until the budget to respond to the Royal Commission final report, and they wouldn't have skirted their responsibility of the aged care sector during the COVID pandemic last year. This government doesn't care. They don't care about Australia's aged care sector and they don't care about doing what is needed to get wages moving. If the government wants to show Australians that they are serious about a national pay rise, they could have and should have started with this essential sector. Labor knows that the love and dedication of these aged care workers to their residents does not pay the bills. And Labor will put good, secure jobs for aged care workers at the heart of our response to the aged care crisis. Because there is no solution to the aged care crisis without good, secure jobs for the workforce. And because we know that Australians have gone far too long without a pay rise under this Liberal government. Thank you very much, Senator Walsh. Senator Faruqi. Deputy President, tonight marks the end of the month of Ramadan, where millions of Muslims across the world fast. 
This is a month of reflection of charity and spiritual connection. And now we celebrate Eid, Eid Mubarak. But as I wish Eid Mubarak, I know that so many Muslims around the world are suffering. In India and the subcontinent, COVID-19 continues to ravage our communities. Elsewhere, Kashmiris, Uyghurs, and Palestinians are suffering under oppression. I rise tonight to express my solidarity with the Palestinian people, who for generations have had to pay the price of settler colonialism taking their land, homes, and lives. My heart goes out to the Palestinian families of Sheikh Jarrah in occupied East Jerusalem who are facing forced expulsions under threat of violence by Israeli authorities. My thoughts are with the 200 Palestinians who were injured on Friday, on Friday evening after Israeli forces stormed Al-Aqsa Mosque during Ramadan, a brazen attack on one of our most significant spiritual places. What is happening in Palestine is part of a broader spectrum of destroying the strength, lives, and livelihoods of the Palestinian people. There are over 200,000 Israelis living in illegal settlements on Palestinian land in East Jerusalem alone. Attacks on cultural sites are war crimes. Israeli authorities continue to act in clear defiance of international law. This never was and never will be okay. We must all speak up against the ongoing violence Israel has been perpetuating against the Palestinian people for decades, including in recent days. Silence in the face of persecution, dispossession, and displacement of Palestinians is not an option. To stay neutral or use weak both sides language language is to choose the side of the oppressor. It's not enough to be shocked by Israel's settler colonial violence against Palestinians. Everyone, particularly politicians, have a responsibility to speak out and demand that we free Palestine. A recent Human Rights Watch report found Israeli authorities have been persecuting Palestinians with oppressive policies that amount to apartheid. The report states that Palestinians have been dispossessed confined, forcibly separated, and subjugated by virtue of their identity. How much longer must Palestinians be subjected to such oppression? For too long, Israel's gross human rights abuses and violations have been ignored by the international community. Palestinians are resilient people who continue to resist the ongoing attempts to remove the memory of Palestine. The decision to violently expel Palestinian families in Sheikh Jarrah have sparked well-justified anger and outrage in the community. They have delayed the evictions, proof that Palestinians will not give up the struggle until they see a free Palestine. Shamefully, the state-sanctioned violence goes on. On Tuesday, the Israeli Air Force renewed its attacks on occupied Gaza. These bombings claimed the lives of at least 25 Palestinians, including nine children, and injuring um, 115 others. As Israel's violence has reached new heights, the freedom movement has been reawakened. Raiding Palestinian homes and sacred places of worship has shown the world yet again how shameless Israel is. Today, all eyes are on Palestine. The Sheikh Jarrah evictions must not go ahead. Israel's state-sanctioned apartheid violence against protesters must end and the occupation with it. The Australian government has proven again and again that it is unwilling to oppose or be critical of Israel's government. We have heard no condemnation of the government of Israel's attacks on Sheikh Jarrah residents and Al-Aqsa Mosque. It is time to speak up. Australia must show solidarity with the Palestinians. This week, we commemorate the Nakba. May 15th marks the day in 1948 when hundreds of Palestinian villages were destroyed and over 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homes and made refugees. refugees. I urge you to join a rally to mark Al-Nakba where, where you live on Saturday. The Greens express our utmost solidarity with the people of Palestine and their struggle. I am unapologetically and ashamedly will always stand for human rights against occupation and in favor of Palestinian rights to self-determination. From the river to the sea, Palestine Order. will Senator be free. Faruqi. Senator Sheldon. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I just want to uh, take the opportunity to extend to Senator Faruqi uh, Eid Mubarak as well, and to all Eid Mubarak, all Australians of, uh, of Muslim, um, Muslims in Australia. The Morrison government has said a lot this week about our supposed economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. But what sort of economic recovery is it when the Morrison government forecasts a real wage cut over the next three years? What sort of economic recovery is it when 60 per cent of jobs created in Australia since the height of the pandemic have been casual jobs? And of course, what sort of recovery is it when Uber is now the second largest employer in Australia, paying its workers as little as $6 an hour? The pandemic of insecure work is spreading across the economy. And as the chair of the Senate Select Committee on Job Security, I have heard time and time again the biggest culprit is in fact our own federal government. The Morrison government is financing the destruction of secure jobs across public funded sectors like aged care and the NDIS, sectors that used to offer secure, unionised, middle class jobs with decent pay, training and career progression are now plagued by insecure work. In the publicly funded NDIS, the Morrison government is promoting the funding of disability gig platforms that treat workers like commodities. Platforms like Mabel, who style themselves as the Uber of the disability sector. This company spruiks its independent disability contractors who are then paid below the minimum wage. They are not provided with sufficient training, and Mabel takes no responsibility for the standard disability care that, it is, that is delivered on behalf of its operations. Of course, that has resulted in a disaster, a disaster which particularly has occurred when the Morrison government paid Mabel to provide additional staffing at an Anglicare facility in Western Sydney at the height of the pandemic. Professor Charles, Sarah Charlesworth of RMIT University, who provided evidence at the job security inquiry last month, told us, and I quote, Mabel's staff were found to have been absolutely hopeless coming into Victorian aged care facilities. They had absolutely no experience. That was an unmitigated disaster. It is the same story in aged care. The job security inquiry heard last month that 90 per cent of the aged care workforce are either casual or part-time con on part-time contracts. Part-time workers are kept on guaranteed weekly hours in some cases as low as three hours per week and a permanent state of uncertainty and experienced submissiveness. Like in the NDIS, this has been proven to be a disaster for elderly Australians. To quote the Aged Care Royal Commission report, Australia's aged care is understaffed and the workforce underpaid and undertrained. The bulk of the aged care workforce does not receive wages and enjoy terms and conditions of employment that adequately reflect the important caring role that they play. Inadequate staffing levels, skill mix and training are principal causes of substandard care in the current system. And again, this is a standard of work that Morrison government is directly publicly funding. The job security inquiry heard from Tracy Colbert who has been an aged care worker for the last 14 years. She said, I work permanent part-time hours. I would love to have permanent hours. I don't know from one week to the next how I am going to afford to pay all for all of my living expenses. The, there are workers that only get five hours a week. They can't live and support their families. I've had a lot of friends that have left the sector because they just can't afford to make a living and some of them had to do two or three jobs. Well, the Australian people have rightly been outraged about the conditions and pay inflicted upon Uber Eats and delivery riders. It's incredibly important that we have secure, well-paid and unionised jobs, and they are middle-class jobs in those circumstances. Workers like Tracy still have a responsibility to have 
a middle class job. Order. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I raise a deeply troubling issue for all Australians. We know that feelings arise and pass, especially through adolescence. No feeling is final. Yet children who present with a felt sense of being born into the wrong body are given license to make irreversible decisions that will affect their brain development and scar and mutilate their bodies. This is the life ahead for too many young people on the transgender highway. There's been an undeniable explosion of young females presenting with gender dysphoria. 100 years of diagnostic history indicates this predominantly impacted males. Yet in just 10 years, we have witnessed a social contagion running rampant through our teenage girls, girls with no childhood history of gender dysphoria. In the United States, females requesting gender surgery in 2016-17 quadrupled. In the UK, females presenting with gender dysphoria over the last decade has risen over 4,000 per cent. And in Australia, the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne has seen referrals rise from one every two years to 104 in 2014. In spite of the horrendous outcomes for many of these children, solid statistics, and I've met some, solid statistics are hard to come by. It seems this area of medical practice would prefer to keep their bad news under wraps. Gender dysphoria, as many eminent medical professionals will agree, overwhelmingly presents with pre-existing mental health conditions. In today's highly politicised environment, when a child shares their distress around comfort with their gender, parents are challenged and even shamed if they attempt to take a comprehensive therapeutic approach to help their child. Instead, parents are labelled abusive and accused of harming their child when they refuse to consent to their child's self-declared transgender identity. Many of us may not remember our own teenage years, but those of us who have raised children through to adulthood will recall our own, childhood, ch own children going through adolescence. Parents walk a very fine line between nurturing their child's emerging independence and supporting their child's fragility. What we do know is that during this time, teens become super sensitive. They hate people looking at them. They often loathe their newly emerging adult bodies, even feel revolted by them. Everything is magnified and they're easily embarrassed. And being part of a tribe is powerful during this time. And that's a perfect con concoction for a social contagion. To make matters worse, the process of neural pruning during this time means their executive function is compromised which is where we make our most effective decisions. It's irresponsible that we're surrendering these life and body altering decisions to our children, putting them on a medical pathway of puberty blockers, sex hormones and irreversible surgery. An adult brain is required to balance the consequences of these life changing decisions. We're charging, charging our children and equally abhorrent our courts with these enormous decisions. And it's our children as young adults that will be left to face the horrendous consequences. The medical pathway for children presenting with gender dysphoria is widely accepted as experimental. There's no evidence that it's safe. This is a call to all parents. Your children are being used in an experiment where there's no evidence it's safe and plenty of evidence it's not. Overnight, Sweden's leading gender clinic stopped routine treatment of minors with hormonal drugs due to safety concerns citing cancer and infertility risks. There are concerns around bone density, memory, development of grey matter and cognitive impairment. These treatments are not proven safe, and yet our children can quite easily be prescribed puberty blockers, then sex hormone treatment, to then land on the operating table for irreversible surgery with grossly inadequate counselling. The counselling instead is left for the parents for them to come to terms with the loss of one gendered child and welcome the emergence of another. There's another sorry day coming. That sorry day will be for all those vulnerable children that struggled through adolescence, as so many do, and we did nothing to protect them. When we start to accept that boys at 10 and a half can take puberty blockers, girls at 14 can have double mastectomies, and parents can be criticised and shamed when they attempted to counsel their children against these life-altering decisions, then lunacy, neglect and savagery are prevailing. These children will have every right as adults to turn to their parents, medical professionals, hospitals and the judicial system and demand compensation for our negligence because we lack the courage, we lack the will to protect these children when they needed it the most. Thank you, Mr. President.
Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, many people come through this place who have made really significant contributions to the lives of many Australians. But my special guest today takes the whole meaning of the word special to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. Today, my special guest was Odie. Odie has dedicated almost all of his life to being Chris's companion. He goes to work with him, he travels with him, he sleeps by his bed. In fact, Odie is Chris's eyes, for Chris is blind and Odie is his seeing eye dog. He was today the headline act in our Pups in Parliament event that showcased the amazing work of Vision Australia. Today, Vision Australia's CEO, Ron Houghton, Chris Edwards, Odie, Olga, Dory and, uh, and Bingo, I think his name was, joined us here in Parliament House. And Chris really kindly let all of us have an opportunity to spend some time with Odie while he explained to us the importance of seeing eye dogs across the country and tried to share with us uh, the process of education around some of the issues that he and Odie have faced about accessibility issues while they've been trying to do their job. Vision Australia supports more than 25,500 people of all ages and circumstances since its inception in 1960. The Seeing Eye Dog Division of Vision Australia has been a client-driven organisation. Their training is entirely one-on-one, -on -one, and they make sure that it's not based on a set training approach, but making sure that they're reflecting the needs of the person, their clients, and matching the right personality of dog to the right personality of person. And the role and mission of Seeing Eye Dogs is to enhance the mobility and the independence of people who are blind or have low vision uh, by providing dogs mobility training and rehabilitation services. But despite the fact, I think absolutely everybody who was delighted to meet Odie today, yep. and they would never have thought that Odie and Chris would have problems in accessibility, um, they do face some really significant barriers, um, as Odie and Chris and many other Australians who live with blindness or low vision and their dogs face as they go about their day-to-day -day lives. Access for seeing eye dogs is enshrined in law in the Domestic Animals and Disability Discrimination Act. But unfortunately, it is all too common to find situations where people, blind people or vision impaired people with their seeing eye dogs, are denied access to public spaces. According to Chris, restaurants and movie theatres are probably the main culprit, um, but taxis and rideshares like Uber are also, uh, they find themselves denied access. That's not to say that all restaurants and theatres or all taxis and Uber rides or ride, um, share rides um, deny access to seeing eye dogs, and we thank every single one of those that do, because that's the right thing to do. In fact, you have to by law. This is a systematic issue, though, unfortunately, but we hope through education and raising awareness, and hopefully when everybody sees the fact that Odie sat in this chamber today in, uh, well, I like to think the highest chamber in the land, I like to think the Senate is the place of uh, the elite space in this parliament, um, it demonstrates that we need to have an inclusive society for everybody, no matter what, whether they live with disability or not. And we need to make sure that we educate the public about making sure life for people who live with blindness is as close as it possibly can be as to the same for as people who don't. And we need to recognise and fully understand the rights of people who live with disability, the rights that are granted to them by law. So we are absolutely committed to an inclusive society where people with disability can fully participate to the level that they want and can. And our role is to make sure that we give Australians the tools that they need to engage in daily life with confidence uh, and also to guarantee that people like or people like Odie, I thought he was so wonderful, I thought he was a person, seeing eye dogs like Odie um, are able to undertake the caring role that they do. So I want to thank Odie and his mates. Um, and, Chris, uh, and Chris particularly for taking the time to come and share their experiences with us here today. I thank you, Mr President, for allowing Odie into the chamber and, uh, and I'll make sure that I, uh, that I give you a little more notice next time. But you know, as an owner of a beautiful black Labrador just like Odie, my Lilla is the most amazing animal. But I didn't realise, I think, until today um, that whilst I love my Lilla and I love going home because she makes me feel fantastic, the, the role that Odie plays in Chris's life and the role that these dogs play in people's lives around Australia just cannot be underestimated. So I thank Vision Australia, I thank Chris and Odie and all the others 
Today was Odie's last day as a seeing um, eye dog, as a, as a um, in active working life. He's now going to take on the role Senator as Chris's Rustin, pet. But Odie, you're always welcome back expired. in the parliament. The Senate stands adjourned, and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9:30 a.m.